Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. Senator Cash. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cash. I move the motion is circulated and I move that the question now be put. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Senator Seward. No. Could you please record the Greens' opposition? So recorded. The ayes have it. Senator, I'll now move the, put the motion as moved. Um, so the question is that the motion moved by Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward, would you like your op the Greens' opposition recorded? Yes, please. <laughs> and Senator Patrick, you would like your opposition to that motion recorded? And yes, please. Senator Lambie, that is you too. Yes. Senator, Senator Patrick and Senator Lambie join with the Greens in having the opposition. I'll now deal with the motions, uh, the legislation. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021 and two related bills for concurrence. Senator Cash. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021. Senator Cash. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. So we'll proceed and I'll call Senator Farrell remotely. Uh, thank you, uh, President. <clears throat> Um, I, I uh, sit to uh, <clears throat> speak on the um, electoral legislation uh, amendment, counting scrutiny and operational efficiencies bills, the, uh, elec the electoral legislation amendment party registration integrity bill, and the electoral legislation amendment electoral offences and preventing multiple voting bill. Labor supports uh, these package of bills. They implement a number of recommendations from the multi-partisan Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. They also make some efficiency and technical amendments as requested by the Australian Electoral Commission. Labor always considers proposals for electoral reform thoughtfully because any changes directly affect our democracy. We have done that with these bills and believe that the amendments will strengthen uh, our electoral system. The electoral legislation Accounting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiency Bill of uh, 2021 makes amendments uh, aimed at streamlining the uh, AEC's processes so that it can deliver a timely election result. 
conducting uh, an election is a massive exercise for the uh, AUC. The Commissioner described it as Australia's largest peacetime logistical event. It's made harder because we don't uh, have fixed terms federally, despite every mainland state having them. So this bill will allow the early opening and sorting of pre-poll House of Representative ballot papers from 4pm on election day. But importantly, counting won't start until 6pm. Declaration votes may also be opened and placed in a secure ballot box up to five days before polling day. These simple changes will save a huge amount of time for the AEC and lessen the uh, time that Australians have to wait to find out the election result, which um, I confidently predict at this stage will be an Albanese Labor government. Scrutineers will be able to view all aspects uh, of this process and increase penalties will apply for anyone disclosing information prior to 6 p.m. on election night. The other big change uh, this bill makes is to the limit of pre-poll period to 12 days. 2019, uh, pre-poll ran for nearly three weeks, increasing costs and staffing challenges for the AEC. This also has an impact on parties and candidates, and it must be said, a significant impact on smaller parties and independents. While it provides flexibility for voters, it means that uh, they're going to the polls before they're armed with all of the policy information needed to make an informed choice. More and more people are voting by pre-poll at each election, but the majority do so in the week before polling day. In fact, in 2019, 50% of pre-poll votes were cast in the last five days. So this change will not affect the majority of pre-poll voters. Labor supports in principle the shortening of the pre-poll period that there must be some flexibility for the AEC while we're uh, grappling with this uh, terrible pandemic. If this government had done its jobs on vaccine and quarantine, uh, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now, with half the country in lockdown and experts predicting in New South Wales uh, could rise to 2,000 cases a day. Only about 25% of the Australian population is fully vaccinated, so there's no way we can safely have an election now. Uh, yet one could be announced at any time. That's why we've sought assurances from the government that there will be further legislation to deal with the JSCAM's recommendation from its inquiry on the future conduct of elections operating uh, during times of emergency situations. The government has advised that the legislation will allow the Commissioner to extend both the period of pre-poll voting and the permissible reasons for voting early. It's important that the Commissioner has the ability to make these changes if that becomes necessary. There are further technical and efficiency measures in the bill that I won't go into, except to say that Labor supports them as they will assist the AEC to do its job in what will be very difficult circumstances. The Party Registration Integrity Bill increases the minimum number of members a non-parliamentary party needs to be federally registered. Currently, the party needs 500 members. This bill will increase that to 1,500. Federal jurisdiction is the easiest in which uh, to register a party and taking into account population. New South Wales, with a population of 8 million, requires uh, 750 members. Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia all require 500 members. In South Australia, it's 200 and Tasmania, 100. In 1984, when party registrations were introduced, a minimum mem membership was set at 500. Our population was then uh, 15 and a half million. We now have 26 million people. So 1,500 is a reasonable number and is intended to ensure a party has real community support. Many minor parties already uh, meet the proposed threshold. The Animal Justice Party, the Shooters, the Fishers and Farmers, Pauline Hanson's One Nation, Sustainable Australia and the Liberal Democratic Party. Other parties will have three months to increase their membership. Party registration uh, brings benefit. A registered party can run candidates in all 151 House of Representatives seats. It can have its name appearing underneath the names of its candidate on the ballot paper. And a registered uh, <coughs> party's name will appear above the line on the Senate ballot paper, increasing its chances of having a candidate elected. It is justifiable that for registration, a party must show that it has national support. Requiring only a small number of members leaves the door open 
for people with deep pockets to run bogus campaigns uh, represented by nothing but their money. No real support, just dollars, influence and privilege. Now, I know Member for Hughes, Craig Kelly, uh, wanted the threshold in, uh, reduced to 1,000. Mr Kelly <clears throat> says that this bill will make it difficult for independent voices to be heard, but there is nothing stopping an independent running for parliament. I suspect Mr Kelly is more worried that he'll lose his seat at the next election and the United Australia Party won't be able to find enough members to retain their registration. Fundamentally, if you can inspire 1,500 people across Australia to join your party, I fail to see how uh, you can inspire the nation to vote for you. Uh, this bill also prevents parties being registered in the name of a party containing the word that is the name of an earlier registered party. It also prevents similar logos from being used. Decision by the AEC under the provisions um, is reviewable by the Administra Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Voters deserve to have a clear choice at the next election and the changes ensure that there is no confusion between different political parties. We know that some parties deliberately try to confuse voters by registering parties with similar sounding names to those already in existence. This bill seeks to address that and limit the influence of big money. The last bill in this package, the Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill, makes clear that the existing offence of interference with political liberty uh, includes uh, conduct such as stalking, harassment, violence, uh, property damage and obscene or discriminatory abuse. Labor deplores any acts of violence, intimidation or abuse in any context. Must never accept behaviour that is designed to intimidate or dis, um, dispute uh, someone exercising their um, um, democratic rights. This amendment will help ensure the safety of participants in the process. This bill also introduces a new category of designated elector to address multiple voting. Uh, multi multiple uh, voting uh, is rare, it must be said. The Electoral Commissioner has described the number of multiple votes received as vanishingly small at something like 0.01%. When it does occur, it's usually older or infirm people who have simply forgotten that they've already voted. Nevertheless, this bill will address this. Designated electors, electors will only be able to vote by declaration vote to ensure that uh, only one vote is counted. To be placed on the register, the Electoral Commissioner must have a reasonable suspicion that the person has voted more than once, a decision that in itself is uh, reviewable by the AAT. The person's status as a designated elector can't be disclosed to anyone, not even polling booth officials. Labor has consistently fought against voter ID laws, requiring people to provide identification discourages some people from voting. Democracy. It's something we'd all be proud of. But because a polling official will be unable to identify a designated voter, they will have no cause for asking someone for ID. We have received assurances from the government and the commissioner uh, that this change will not enable anyone to ask for voter ID. It is on this basis that Labor is supporting this amendment. In closing, uh, I must say that there's more work to be done on electoral reform. Um, the Morrison Joyce government needs to properly fund the AEC so that it can raise enrolment levels in the Northern Territory. And I understand Senator McCarthy has a second reading amendment on that issue. We need real-time disclosure of political donations and a fixed disclosure threshold of $1,000 so that voters know who is donating to political parties, how much and when. We need caps on electoral expenditure to level the playing field so elections aren't run on the basis of who has the deepest pockets. And uh, we need uh, truth in political uh, advertising laws to prevent the dangerous spread of disinformation being spouted by the likes of uh, Clive Palmer, uh, Craig Kelly and George Christensen. Uh, but those changes, I suspect, will have to wait for the next Albanese Labor government. Uh, and I'd like to thank Carol Brown, who uh, has got the carriage of this uh, um, matter in the uh, in anticipation um, uh, for her assistance in this matter and also uh, thank uh, the minister minister morton uh, for his consult consultation throughout this process thank you thank you senator farrell uh, senator waters 
Um, thank you very much, Deputy President. And I rise to speak on not one, not two, but three electoral bills that are being rammed through this parliament um, with a cosy relationship between the two big parties where the provisions of those bills uh, will benefit and help shore up the flailing support for those two big parties. I'm going to make some uh, detailed comments on each of the bills, but I first want to start with the disgusting process that these bills have followed. They only just passed the House yesterday, and here they are. They were exempted from the cutoff, which normally would give private members' bills or any bill the appropriate time for scrutiny, deliberation, consideration, amendment, discussion. They were exempted from the cutoff order yesterday, such that in less than 24 hours, these bills will now be rammed through both houses of parliament. Now, that's, that's not democracy, um, and it's certainly not integrity or transparency. And one has to think that an election is in the offing when the two big parties are ganging up to try to make sure that um, voters have fewer choices on who to vote for, uh, and they're ramming through these three bills in order to achieve that. So the process um, of these bills passing the parliament is an example of how not to do democracy and really proves the point of why we need to break the back of the two-party system so that we have a democracy that's functioning in the interests of the public rather than just a little power play thing uh, for the two big parties. Um, so I want to start by talking briefly about the first bill, um, about counting uh, the counting scrutiny and operational efficiencies bill 2021. Uh, uh, now this bill uh, essentially limits uh, pre-poll to approximately 12 days prior to election day and makes some other administrative changes. Um, well, we won't be opposing this bill. We think these administrative changes are all um, fairly straightforward and sensible. And I note that the vast majority of the pre-poll votes in the 2019 election were cast in the final two weeks. Um, and I want to note that having a longer pre-poll period does present some challenges. Uh, uh, the compressed timetable for organising and printing and distributing how to vote cards, particularly in regional electorates, the strain on volunteer resources, which of course advantages parties um, with larger supporter bases or mm. parties that pay for people to hand out how to vote cards. Parties shall remain nameless, but we all know which party I'm talking about. Um, so that longer pre-poll period can have uh, significant uh, disadvantages. So we think the balance has been struck correctly um, with a two week or more precisely a 12 day pre-poll period Although I do note that in um, legislation that has been foreshadowed by the government for elections in emergencies, and perhaps such as the pandemic that we're currently in, that the length of pre-poll, that there'll be some discretion granted um, to the AEC as to the pre-poll period. And we will look forward to considering uh, that bill once we see its provisions, once it comes forward to the House. Um, so that is the first bill, but I want to say that this first bill is an opportunity to address a concern that was raised uh, before JSCM, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, after both the 2019 and 2016 elections. So it's a long-standing issue about the transparency of the ballot count. Um, and whilst there's no suggestion that there's inaccuracies in the current count, we have seen international examples um, of a lack of transparency and doubt being weaponised undermine confidence in election outcomes. Um, we, don't, we don't want that to happen here, and Australia has an electoral system to be proud of. A greater transparency would protect our system against that criticism. Uh, so I'll be uh, with leave. Uh, the, uh, the time frames for um, these amendments were very, um, very condensed. I believe I need leave uh, to move what I hope will be a committee stage amendment um, which requires a routine statistical audit at the conclusion of each election undertaken by an independent reviewer in the process of scrutiny. So it's essentially just to check that the um, electronic scanned versions of the ballot papers are appropriately reflective of their pa original paper versions. This is raised by numerous experts and um, people in the field as something that would help um, uh, continue people's confidence in the accuracy of our voting systems. 
So, um, uh, with with leave, I will be moving that as a committee stage amendment. I'll note that the recent review of the ACT election recommended a similar audit um, to bolster confidence in the electoral process, and we agree. We, we think that adding this degree of transparency will provide assurances that our electoral processes um, are robust and are best practice. Um, now, I want to move now to the, um, the second bill, which uh, relates to uh, electoral offences. The, um, uh, sorry, the Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill of 2021. Um, now, there's no evidence to suggest that voter fraud is a significant issue in Australia, uh, but I am pleased to see that some of the more outlandish uh, suggestions in the Chair's JSCAM report have not been taken up and have not made themselves into this bill. Um, things like voter ID um, and stronger offences, we are very pleased that have seen the light of day. Um, and so we don't oppose the proposal to allow the AEC to declare a voter that's suspected of multiple voting um, to declare them as designated elector. There are provisions allowing a declaration to be challenged uh, and for designated electors to continue uh, to vote in subsequent elections, provided that the vote is cast by declaration. Um, we think that's a a, um, a fair enough approach there, and we, we are happy to support that. Um, on the proposed increase in the electoral interference offence, the Greens condemn any violence, destruction of political signs, abusive or intimidating behaviour towards candidates, volunteers and electoral staff. There's no evidence to suggest that the current offence provision in the Act or the various offences under state laws failing to deter or penalise bad behaviour. So we query the need for the offence uh, penalty to be increased. We will not be opposing um, that second bill. Now, I want to move to the final bill, which has been cognated with the other two. Um, and of course, it's this one that's the real doozy. It's the um, Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill. Um, now, this, of course, is the bill that means that it's much, much harder for new political parties to put themselves forward to the voting public to be voted for at election times. Um, it increases the number of members that a party needs in order to even be able to federally register as a party that can then put themselves forward for people to vote for. And, um, yeah, it's very convenient that the two big parties who see their vote at record low levels and who see a, a very large crossbench um, and who want to deter competition uh, for votes, it's very convenient for them to bring forward a bill such as this. And uh, this is exactly why the bills have been cognated and ran through the parliament, because these guys don't like a challenge. Well, I would suggest that if you uh, want to be winning more votes from the public, then earn them by listening to the public and by fixing uh, your uh, policy offerings so that you start delivering for the public rather than just delivering for your vested interests and big party donors that seem to be running the show no matter which party we're talking about, whether it's the government or the so-called opposition. So rather than trying to shut out competition from um, smaller parties, from new parties in particular, um, why don't you actually provide a decent offering so that people want to vote for you? Because that's why they're not voting for you. They see that you're putting the interests of your donors ahead of the interests of the voting public um, and nature for that matter. So rather than trying to fix the system to, to um, boost your flailing stock, do better and those votes. Anyway, I, I want to raise the point that when we're talking about elect, this would have been a perfect opportunity to actually fix some of the real flaws in the system rather than just fix the system to help the two big parties in this sort of duopoly of mediocrity that we have here on show every day in the parliament. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many other issues that could have been addressed that actually would have improved the integrity of the electoral um, system. and and improved our democracy, we should have had rules um, coming in about donations and electoral spending caps. As the Greens have long proposed and as we have private members built for and as we routinely uh, move amendments for, 
Um, and as I flag, I will actually be moving a second reading amendment, which is on sheet 1416 um, to the party registration integrity bill, um, which talks about the need to get big money out of politics, which talks about the need to um, end and cap private donations to political parties, because it has not only a corrupting influence on election outcomes, but an unseemly and inappropriate influence on policy positions and on decisions that actually influence um, people's daily lives. So that second reading amendment calls for a cap on donations. It calls for a cap on electoral uh, spending, because um, we've seen uh, many, many millions spent by uh, the likes of Mr Clive Palmer to influence election outcomes um, and to send text messages to every person and their dog. Um, it's Big money is wrecking our democracy. It has no role in our democracy. Um, and shouldn't be allowed to continue. But rather than actually addressing that problem, the government has turned its, um, it's, turned its targets on the smaller and newer political parties, which is very telling. So that second reading amendment goes to donations uh, and spending caps to try to remove the influence of big money on our democracy. Uh, Instead, we see, uh, yeah, the absence of that. We see there's there's no there's no moves to have stronger rules to prevent to prevent Liberal Party uh, campaigning being disguised as government advertising. Um, of course, there's no rules for truth in political advertising in any of these electoral reform bills. Um, there's no rules about stopping grants from being used as election slush funds, as we've seen with sports rights and with the pork and ride. Um, and now, of course, with the Beedaloo, um, uh, which was unfortunately failed to be disallowed yesterday because once again the opposition forgot that they were the opposition and waved through the government's nefarious spending. Uh, incumbents already have huge advantages in elections and um, they get to call when the election is. They have the brand recognition and the staff and the fundraising capacity. Um, and this government seems to think that they also can use public money for their own private party purposes to spread around in marginal electorates to prop up their electoral fortunes. But bills that make it even harder for other voices to be heard and to stop other parties from even having the chance to run weakens our democracy. And I might point out that these bills won't affect the Greens. We have more than enough members to meet these criteria and we have sitting members. So this is not self-interest that we are making these comments because of. We are here to defend the democratic system that should allow anyone that wants to run to put their hand up to run. And the real test of whether there is support for a political party should be in how many votes that they get at the ballot box not in artificial uh, limits that are set by the Liberal and Labor parties to try and lock out competitors. Uh, I mean, that's, it's just a really embarrassing display of your own sense of inadequacy, frankly. Um, if you don't think you can win those votes, you'd rather just stop your competitors from even being in the race. Well, it says an awful lot about what you really think about how much support you deserve to receive from voters. Um, I want to I want to quote from uh, one of the experts in this field, Professor Graham Orr, who um, uh, has made some specific comments about this third party registration bill, um, in particular in relation to the restriction of the use of words like liberal in the names of new uh, rival parties. And no prizes for guessing who um, which new party this bill is aimed at. Professor Orr says, and I quote, "What is going on? Is this about democratic values?" Or is it a power play? People may differ about the bill's justification, but one thing is clear to a lawyer, as drafted the bill is cooked. It overreaches and it is not well drafted. Um, well, this bill is cooked and it is designed to prop up and to entrench the cosy duopoly of the two-party system. The, the, uh, the duopoly of mediocrity, as I said before, and we'll say again, uh, much as it breaks my heart, this is not a system that is delivering for the voters. It's certainly not a system that's delivering for nature or for our climate. Um, at the minute, the two-party system is delivering for the big donors to those two parties, which is exactly why we're moving that amendment to cap political donations, which is why for, for many, many years, the Greens have opposed the influence of big money on politics. I know our amendment will fail because you hooked on the big money from your donors, 
uh, but let the ballot box reflect the wishes of the Australian voters and bring on the election. Thank you, Senator Waters. And I take it you've moved the second reading amendment on the electoral legislation amendment. Yes, thank you very much, Deputy President. Do you move that second reading amendment? Yeah, your microphone was off. Yes. So, um, if you yes, would move you. on behalf so of Senator Waters, the electoral legislation amendment. Yes, of course, I so move. Okay, thank you. So that is the third bill for the sake of clarity, electoral offences and preventing multiple voting bill 2021. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, this bill responds to the recommendations of the Bipartisan Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, JSCAM, as part of their reviews of the 2016 and 2019 federal elections. It also responds to a number of recommendations raised by the Australian Electoral Commission in their submission to the 2019 inquiry. Firstly, in relation to the pre-poll uh, voting period, this bill proposes a statutory limit on the length of pre-poll period from three weeks down to two weeks prior to election day. The government, recognising the bipartisan recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, proposed this change, uh, noting the benefits of a shorter pre-poll period uh, that this will provide to the AEC in allowing additional time to secure the best available uh, pre-poll facilities for disability access, security and voter convenience. Any voter who is unable to vote in person on Election Day has multiple options to be able to cast their ballot. They can request a postal vote, uh, they can cast an absentee vote if they are outside of their home electorate, or they will be able to pre-poll vote at any one of the 12 days prior to the election that a pre-poll voting centre can be open in this area. Now, this is a very uh, important reform. Uh, those, uh, like I am sure everyone in this chamber, who have been involved in elections for a long time and uh, know uh, uh, the, the, uh, the tyranny of, I guess, a three-week uh, voting period. And so I'm uh, very much welcoming this from an organisational uh, point of view uh, for parties to be able to get the volunteers that are necessary. The Liberal Party uh, relies completely on volunteers. We don't have uh, paid-up union members to be able to, uh, uh, be able to pay to uh, send along to, to voting uh, centres to, to, to be there in proxy. Uh, we, we rely very much on volunteers and very grateful for the support that those volunteers provide. Uh, uh, but but the, the feedback that uh, we, we get from volunteers out there on voting booths is that uh, really those first few days, and you'd go up to a week of the, the three-week pre-poll voting period, it, it's, it's, it's very desolate in terms of the number of people that actually come through. And I, 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 that was certainly the, my experience. Uh, that's how, uh, what, what I was experiencing uh, the last election and even the last state election in WA, uh, that those first five days or so, uh, very few people are coming through. And it does tend to the numbers of people that come through. Um, we're, of course, seeing an increased number of people take up that option of pre-polling. Uh, but the, the, that the, the bulk of those people are really coming through towards the end of the pre-poll period heading up to election day. And so I asked a, a question of, um, of the AEC commissioner in last, uh, when we were last in estimates and, and asked them you know, exactly that was, I said that's what I experienced, uh, but can you just see, uh, can you let me know if the stats actually back that up? And I, I've got uh, an answer on, that came back on notice from, uh, from the commissioner, a fantastic commissioner. Uh, indeed, uh, who uh, up to up to the the last five days, so there were you know the, the ten days before that, or voting period days, uh, fifty four percent of people had had voted up to that point. So the balance were so so fifty four percent were over the the two weeks, and then the last forty six percent were in that last uh, last last five days uh, leading up to election day. So it's 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 showing you that really the majority of people are coming in uh, um, at that point and, uh, and there's very few people coming in, at that first, in during that first week. So this, this reform, I think, recognises the, uh, uh, 
really what is just happening anyway. Uh, it's making it simpler for, for parties, and particularly smaller parties. I know there, uh, there are, this is actually providing an opportunity for smaller parties who do struggle to get uh, the volunteers that the major parties uh, can't get, can't get the people out on the ground. So this, this is very fair and it's, and it's a very important and good uh, reform that is happening. Now, the other uh, aspects of this bill uh, that are, uh, I uh, certainly support uh, in relation to the sorting of pre-poll votes, as more Australians choose to uh, vote by pre-poll or by post, uh, the AEC faces very unique challenges in ensuring that the speed of the count on election night meets community expectations. And as more and more people are voting early, uh, be it pre-poll or postal, uh, we're, we're we're wanting to see a result on election night. We, we know that, uh, as, as you know, certainly political tragics, we, 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 we can't wait to see the numbers start to come in. And it can be disappointing when you've got to wait for those pre-poll votes. And, and often, if it's so close, as elections are, tend to be of, of late, uh, except for in my home state of WA, I've got to say, sadly, uh, the, the, uh, the, the result uh, the earlier we can get those, the, that input from uh, voting centres, the, the, the more information, the, the clearer it will be on election night, and that's, a, that's of course, a, a very, very good thing. Now, uh, so what this is proposing is to open up the uh, unfolding and sorting of pre-poll votes between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. on election night. And this will assist the AEC in meeting community expectations by delivering that result in a timely manner. Now, it doesn't mean the votes are going to be counted. In fact, this bill doesn't do anything to change uh, that very important point that the votes will only be counted after, after 6 p.m. Uh, but scrutineers will be allowed, uh, will be invited in to, to watch the opening of, uh, of these envelopes and the sorting of them to just ensure that we have a, a, a secure system and, a, and a, a compliant system and a very robust uh, electoral system. That, that's, of course, very important, and this bill uh, will ensure that scrutineers are, are, are enabled to be able to do that. Uh, that's very important. But having it sorted uh, by 6 p.m. means that those votes can be counted uh, immediately and we can start to see the results come in. Now, we have an excellent electoral voting system, uh, arguably the best in the world. Uh, and, and thank goodness for that, that we have such a good system. We saw the US. Uh, uh, elections. When was it? Last year, last November, last year, and uh, and, and we just know the debacle that surrounded that, uh, the, the allegations of fraud. Uh, uh, we don't see that in Australia because we have an independent uh, commission. We have a, a, an excellent administration uh, that's been run there, independent of government, independent of political interference. Uh, it, it's just a, it's fantastic, and so we can be confident as Australians in our voting system. But these reforms. Are good. They're important. They're helping to uh, to uh, <coughs> ensure a more efficient system and a better system that's clear and transparent. Uh, this bill will address issues around overseas uh, postal voting. Uh, Australia is a country with a proud democratic tradition. Uh, while voting is compulsory when living in our nation's borders, tens of thousands of Australians also take pride in taking up the opportunity to vote while living abroad. And Australians abroad can request a postal vote, uh, just like any Australian at home who is unable to access a polling booth. Uh, being outside of Australia can present uh, unique challenges in being able to vote, and so this uh, bill will expand the options of Australians abroad who cannot find uh, another Australian citizen to act as a witness by expanding the current allowance for voters to provide a self-certified copy of their passport to allow uh, the equivalent online identity check options administered by the AEC. This is uh, 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 an important reform and uh, I'm pleased to see, uh, should this bill pass today, that that uh, will be enabled. Now, uh, the other bill that we're discussing is the electoral offences and preventing multiple voting. Now, uh, this bill, uh, with regard to preventing multiple voting, uh, will introduce a new term, uh, the designator elector. And this will be applied to voters uh, suspected by the Electoral Commission of previously having voted multiple times in the same election. Now, while Australia is fortunate as a democratic nation to experience very few instances of voter fraud, uh, this amendment will help strengthen our electoral system's defences against the rare instances of multiple voting. 
uh, very important, very important, and uh, it was a, a, an issue that came up uh, at some point in estimates. Uh, I'm on the Finance and Public Administration Commission, and I recall the, uh, the commissioner saying that uh, it, the, the, the instances of uh, voter fraud in Australia is thankfully very, very low. Uh, it, it doesn't really have much of a material difference on the outcome, but we've got to make sure that the system is as best as it possibly can be. Uh, that there, there, there's really very limited, if, if not almost impossible, way, number of ways that people can uh, uh, be able to uh, you know, skew a, a result by, by you know, in this case, voting multiple times. So, very important reform that this bill is uh, is addressing, uh, Madam Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, there are a number of safeguards to protect the privacy of uh, designated electors, uh, including the Australian Electoral Commission uh, cannot disclose information about the person's status as a designated elector. So no one's going to be named or shamed in this regard. Uh, it's just going to be a, a, an issue that will be dealt with uh, in a, in a, you know, a, I guess, a discreet way. Uh, those electors will appear on the electoral roll as silent electors for the purpose of elections. So this means that. AEC polling staff will treat designated electors uh, the same as a person who, for privacy reasons, has their address suppressed from the electoral roll. So, uh, when someone walks in, if they're a designated uh, uh, elector, uh, it's not going to be revealed. Uh, the, the, the person uh, that's working there for the AEC uh, won't understand the difference. So they won't know that they're, uh, they're listed as uh, silent. Uh, just the same as someone that's voluntarily elected as, as silent. Uh, there won't be any difference. So there's no reason for that person to be um, you know, named or shamed at all. Now, um, what we want to also see through this bill is uh, limiting the interference with uh, political liberty. Uh, this amendment clarifies the existence, uh, existing offence of interference with political liberty under section 327 of the Electoral Act to note that interference may for example, include violence, obscene or discriminatory abuse, property damage and harassment and stalking. The amendment responds to Recommendation 16 of JSCAN's report to, on the inquiry into the 2009 federal election after hearing submission and testimony from witnesses uh, recommended the Electoral Act be amended to penalise such behaviour arising in the context of an election. Uh, it also increases the penalty for an interference with political Define. liberty from imprisonment for six months or 10 penalty units or both to imprisonment for three years or 100 penalty units or both to bring the offence in line with the existing uh, on offence provisions in the Criminal Code Act 1995 of interference with political rights and duties. Now, in the remaining time that I've got, uh, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, the other element of this bill in relation to party registration integrity. Now, I'm very pleased to see that there's going to be some, uh, through the passing of this legislation, some clarity given in the registration of uh, political party names. Uh, there is uh, often confusion that is had uh, out there on polling booths or uh, even, even through a postal ballot uh, situation where there are parties with similar names. Uh, it provides confusion for those uh, for those electors uh, when deciding. Now, we saw it even at the last state election in Western Australia, where uh, the uh, Liberal Democrat Party uh, even went so far as to get exactly the same colour T-shirt, uh, exactly the same font and logo, the name of their candidate, and, and, were sent, and, and, it, and I saw it with my own eyes and witnessed it uh, on a, on a pre-poll booth. Uh, a volunteer even confused as to which, which organiser they were meant to go to on the day to get the right T-shirt. Now, so this, these changes uh, are important in dealing with the names of political parties, uh, the logos that they're using, uh, and just making sure that it's completely clear uh, for the Australian public as to who they're voting for. Uh, because we, don't, we can't have situations where people are mistakenly voting for one party, thinking they're voting for the party that they wanted to. Now, we, we know that this is uh, statistically backed up because uh, if you look at the history of uh, results uh, dating back uh, elections 
both whether it be state or federal, dating back to 2013. In all six instances that the Liberal Democratic Party has drawn to the left of the Liberals on the upper house ballot paper, whether it's that in the upper house in the state parliament or, or indeed in the Senate, uh, their primary vote in all of those instances has exceeded 2 per cent. In all the other instances, the 11 other times, when they've uh, been randomly drawn to be on the ballot paper to the right of the Liberal Party, their vote has tallied less than 2 per cent. Less than 2 per cent. Now, uh, this you could say, well, that's just random. Well, hang on, hang on. If it was random, it would be like flipping a coin. It would be like flipping a coin, uh, something like uh, it would be like flipping a coin uh, and getting 17 consecutive coin flips, returning the same result, 17 times, getting heads every single time. The right? The odds of that are one in 131,072. Now, this change is very important. Uh, parties need to stand up for what they believe in, their principles. They need to stand up on their own policies and not just ride on the coattails of another party. So this changes it, not just for the Liberal Party, but it registers the important terms, the important words that are used within the Labor Party, within the Greens Party and all other major uh, parties. So it's a very uh, significant, important, sensible reform, Thank and I you, support Senator this bill. O'Sullivan. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'm pleased to speak in this cognate debate for these bills, and in doing so, I foreshadow I'd like to move the second reading amendment standing in Senator McCarthy's name. Labor supports these bills, and as noted, the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiency Bill 2021 introduces a range of measures designed to increase the efficiency of voting and counting. The Party Registration Integrity Bill increases the number of members required for registration of a political party. The bill also prevents parties from being registered if their name replicates a key word of a name of an earlier registered party, unless the earlier registered party consents. And the Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill creates a new category of designated elector in an attempt to address multiple voting and expands the existing offence relating to interference with political liberty. These bills arise in part from the work coming out of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters inquiry into the 2019 federal election. This inquiry process follows every federal election is an important opportunity for the parliament in a cross-party manner to examine all aspects of the conduct of elections and seek to make recommendations to improve their transparency, efficiency and, and maximise the opportunity for all voters to have their say in our essential democratic processes. Of course, there are many areas that that those in this place disagree on when it comes to potential reforms and improvements in our electoral processes. However, where we can find agreement, it is important that we prog progress those changes to continually enhance the efficiency of our national elections. And it is in that spirit that the opposition is prepared to support these three bills before us today. In relation to the first bill, the electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiency Bill 2021, this bill contains welcome measures to streamline the AEC's processes so we can have a smooth running national election and a result as early as possible. We made it clear that we believe, that Labor believes, the Morrison government should be doing much more, but at least this bill will make things somewhat easier for the AEC. Running a national election is much more difficult feat than a state or territory or even local elections, in, even in ordinary times, particularly in, a, in an environment absent, absent of um, fixed terms. However, running a national election during a pandemic and specifically in the situation the nation faces right now would be a very tall order indeed. In fact, as things stand, it could be next to impossible. Thanks to this 
Prime Minister's inability to do his job, his failures on quarantine and on vaccination. This nation is now more fractured than ever before, with vastly different situations on the ground in terms of health orders between jurisdictions. The current situation would make it very difficult indeed, if not impossible, for the AEC to conduct a consistent and, and fair national election, certainly not without substantially increased resources, something this bill does not go near enough or far enough with. However, the bill does do some good things. It contains important saving provisions to reduce the number of wasted postal votes, and it allows greater opportunities for people voting overseas to be able to securely and efficiently participate in our elections. The bill also limits the pre-poll period to 12 days. This is something the opposition supports. Lengthy pre-poll periods are resource-consuming for the AEC and, of course, for political parties. The bill also allows for early sorting of pre-poll votes, something that will enable a timelier result on election night. And amongst other efficiency changes, the bill also removes the requirement for the authorisation on electoral matter to include the name and address of the printer of the material. This amendment will reduce the number of frivolous complaints to the AEC processes. Then we come to the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021. This bill increases the number of members required for registration of a political party. The bill also prevents parties from being registered if their name replicates a key word of the name of an earlier registered party, unless, of course, as I've said previously, the earlier registered party consents. In our dissenting report for the inquiry into the 2019 federal election, Labor members of the Joint Standing Committee on electoral matters recommended that the minimum number of members required for party membership be increased to 1,000. It is currently 500, and two previous JSCEM inquiries into the 2013 and the 2016 ele elections recommended this increase. The government is proposing a slightly higher minimum number of members for a non parliamentary party, 1,500. Party registration does come with privileges. And it is important that registered parties in our nation of more than 25 million people are able to demonstrate a reasonable level of community support. A 1,500 minimum is far from being an unreasonable proposition. The bill also seeks to prevent a party from being registered if its, if its name contains a word that is in the name or the abbreviation of the name of a registered political party. And quite rightly, there are a myriad of exemptions and appeal mechanisms included in, this, uh, in the legislation. This amendment is intended to reduce uh, voter confusion between established parties which have recognised names and parties which are subsequently registered. We know that some parties deliberately use words from the names of recognised parties for mischievous purposes. This amendment will address that issue, and the opposition supports it. The final bill in this package, the Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill, creates a new category of designated elector in an attempt to address multiple voting and expands the existing offence relating to interference with political liberty. The New South Wales Electoral Act contains similar provisions. This will allow a person to cast a declaration vote if there is a reasonable suspicion they may have previously voted in the same election. The drafting of these provisions means that polling officials will be unable to identify a voter as a de designated elector. Importantly, the government and the electoral commissioner have given assurances that these provisions will not be able to be used to require a voter to provide identification. Labor considers this reasonable. It is long-standing and unshakable Labor policy that we oppose so-called voter ID laws, as these types of requirements lead to disenfranchising of vulnerable and disadvantaged electors. The bill also seeks to deal with violence, intimidation and abuse where it is used to interfere with legitimate democratic processes. 
such as the right to cast a ballot in safety and secrecy. It does this by providing clarity in amending pre prescribed offences and penalties. The opposition supports these measures. Briefly, I want to touch on the opposition's second reading amendment. The amendment notes that the Northern Territory's enrolment rate lags behind the rest of the country, with, with only 85.6 per cent of eligible electors enrolled to vote, and it, we, and it calls on the Morrison government to close the gap by providing more resources to the Australian Electoral Commission so that people living in disadvantaged, remote and regional community can exercise their dem democratic right to vote. This is a matter that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters has considered in detail and indeed received many submissions concerning the lack of enfranchisement of voters in the Territory, particularly remote voters, a very high proportion of which are First Nations people. This is something this nation should not tolerate. More must be done in this space, and it is disappointing to say the very least that the Morrison-Joyce government has consistently failed to address this matter. I ask the government to consider this issue for inclusion amongst the next set of issues in attempts it attempts to deal with as part of the much-needed electoral legislation amendments. And I'd also like to put on record my appreciation for the work that has been done by Senator Farrell on behalf of the Labor Party in the negotiations of the bills before us today. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Here we are again with major reform being rushed through the parliament without proper scrutiny or debate. And yet again, Labor is totally complicit. This is such a predictable and shameless exercise of retaining power by the major parties. It is a reform with one simple purpose, and that purpose is to make it harder for the Australian people to elect one of their own to serve in this place, rather than copying the product of some backroom factional deal. The electoral reform we really need in Australia is not restrictions on party names. It is not stricter membership rules. It is not even new rules to prevent multiple voting, which is truly a solution in search of a problem. What we need is transparency, absolute real-time transparency on donations. Every Australian knows money buys access in this place. It buys influence. All big corporations and industry groups know this. I would rather we ban big donations entirely, but if we can't ban them, we should at least make it public. We ought to know who is paying in real time and what they are getting in return. We ought to know who is buying $1,000 seats and $10,000 tables at fundraisers. We ought to know when these donors are getting face time with the minister or dinner with the prime minister. And we ought to know immediately. Real-time transparency, real-time honesty. That is the kind of reform we need in Australia. It's the kind of reform Australians want to see. And it is the kind of reform that scares the major parties. Major parties are afraid of transparency because they are afraid of what it will expose. Instead of giving us transparency, instead of giving us the reform Australians actually want, we get this piffle. I mean, these bills are a series of small tweaks, creating the illusion of reform and giving cover to a bigger change that will perpetrate the dominance of the major parties. Let's be clear about this. It is not for the benefit of democracy. If the Liberal and Labor parties were not just the parties of government, but the parties of good government, they would not need to change the rules and give themselves a head start. In fact, they wouldn't have to worry about minor parties at all, as there would be little need for many. Voters look on and see the games, stories of rorts, cover-ups, 
and they're repulsed. They're repulsed and they want change. So many of them look for other options, other parties, someone who is actually worth voting for. It's no coincidence that every crossbench senator supports greater transparency, every single one of them, in this place and the other place. Every crossbench senator supports good governance. Every crossbench senator supports an end to rorts. That is not because we all have the same ideology or values. Most of us are very different. But it's because that is what the voters want. I'm sure the government knows this, and I'm sure the opposition knows it too. They know it, but they don't want to own it. They don't want to jeopardise their own sinecures, their own comfortable futures. They know the path to pre-selection is by being a team player, not in any way by rocking the boat. So they would rather change the rules and prevent the people having their say, rather than give the people what they want. It is shameful. Thank you. Senator Scar. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The first thing I'd like to do in relation to this contribution on these important bills is to respond to some of the questions, uh, issues Senator Waters, uh, the Green Senator from my home state of Queensland, uh, made during her contribution to the debate. The first is, and I've heard this line so many times in this place from Senator Waters, that supposedly this legislation is being rammed through this place. And I always find that quite ironic when someone makes that claim after they just give a 15-minute speech. Um, in relation to why they oppose the legislation. This bill is going through exactly the right process that you'd expect. Everyone in this chamber um, is, is, are providing views, different thoughts with respect to this bill. We've just heard from Senator Griff, a senator I greatly admire from South Australia, give a crossbench of view. Um, we've heard from Senator Waters. We've heard from Senator Farrell, Senator Brown, um, uh, colleague Senator uh, Sullivan from, uh, uh, Sullivan from uh, Western Australia. Everyone's getting an opportunity to make a contribution on this bill, representing a whole gamut of philosophical views. This legislation is not being rammed through this place. It is simply incorrect. And the second point I want to make is it should be noted that so many of the reforms containing these bills went through the joint parliamentary committee process. And we're now less than 12 months to an election, uh, and we're taking into account the reflections from the last election. So this is entirely appropriate. I'm not sure when Senator Waters would expect us to consider these bills. It would be highly inappropriate to consider it after the next election. We need to get this done, and there is some urgency in relation to it. So I just want to place that on the record. And I do, uh, in that spirit, uh, want to acknowledge the very good contributions I thought, and I sat here and listened to them from Senator Farrell and Senator Brown in relation to in relation to this debate. And I think a lot of good points were made, and I do respect the contributions that others have made, including Senator Griff. The first bill is the Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021, uh, which deals with the party membership number requirement and also party names and logos. I don't think it is unreasonable. I don't think it's unreasonable for a uh, minimum number of members of a party which was first set in 1984 to be adjusted in 2021. I don't think that's unreasonable. And I think people listening to this debate would understand that the Australian population has grown. Therefore, this uh, qualification for party registration, which does give, which does give, as Senator Brown made the point, privileges, privileges to the registered party. That membership qualification should change, should be adjusted. That seems clear and obvious to me. It seems reasonable and proportionate and democratic. So I, I think that is quite a, a reasonable uh, proposition. I would like to say to all everyone listening in this debate: join a political party, get involved in the political process. I'd, I'd love it to be my party. I'd love it to be in my my party, but if you don't agree with my views, join another political party. Get involved in the process. And I say that to everyone. I say that to, to young people, older people, our multicultural community. Get involved in a political party. Do you know last month, 
was the actually it might still be this month. I, I, are we in August, um, Madam Acting Deputy President? We are in August, my birthday month. Uh, this month is the 50th anniversary of Senator Neville Bonner being sworn in as a senator in this place. And Senator Neville Bonner first got involved in the political process when he joined the One Mile branch of the Liberal Party in Ipswich. And then he got elected as a branch office bearer. He then got elected as a delegate to convention. He then ran for pre-selection, was unsuccessful the first time, but then ran again and was successful. And that's what political membership can lead to, party membership can lead to. So everyone out there listening to this debate, get involved in a political party. Fight for your beliefs and values. Let your voice be heard. I'd love it to be mine, but I expect not everyone's going to join my political party. That's why we're a multi-party state. But get involved. Get involved. It's extremely important. The second aspect in that uh, first bill, which I'm discussing, which is the Party Registration Integrity Bill, is this important point about party names and logos. I don't think there can be any reasonable counter to the proposition that there have been clear instances where voters have been confused because key words in party names have been similar or been the same between political parties. So when voters go and cast their vote, they vote for one party, reasonably believing it's another party. And that undermines the efficacy and integrity of our election process. So it is absolutely fair and reasonable that there are checks and balances in the system. And let me flip that over and say, if there wasn't a check and balance in the system, that would be a failure of this House, of this Senate, if we didn't have a check and balance preventing that. I can remember, Madam Acting Deputy President, sitting watching the draw for the ballot paper on the Senate ticket in Queensland in the lead up to the last federal election, hoping and praying, and I'll put this in the public record, hoping and praying that the Liberal National Party got a position on the tablecloth Senate ticket, which was to the left, physically speaking, not philosophically of the Liberal Democratic Party. Why? Not because I wanted to do anything to prevent anyone who in good faith wanted to vote for the Liberal Democratic Party, but because I know and the statistics prove decisively, and Senator I. Salomon, my colleague from Western Australia, spoke to this point, the statistics prove if the Liberal Democratic Party is to the left of the Liberal National Party or the Liberal Party, voters get confused. They see that word liberal and they assume it's referring to my party. And we can understand that. And that issue is escalated, that issue is escalated, especially in our multicultural communities. So this is a question of integrity. So there needs to be a check and balance. If there is a, the same key word, the same key word in the names of two competing political parties and there's been a previously registered party that first uses that key word, it is fair and reasonable. It is fair and reasonable that a subsequent party be prevented from undertaking a course of action which will mislead the Australian voter or, or a goodly number of them, or a goodly number of them. That is fair and reasonable. And again, I'll flip it around and say we would not be discharging our obligation to this place, to the Australian voters, to maintaining the integrity of the election system if we were not to support a proposition like this. If we were not to support a proposition like this. People in this country have a right to vote for whatever party they want. But let's make it sure, let's make, make it clear that they know who they're voting for. They know who they're voting for and they're not misled. And that's what this reform achieves. So I commend that reform to the Senate. The second bill is the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill, and it deals with three issues: the pre-poll voting period, the sorting of pre-poll voting um, ballots, and postal voting. First, I want to talk about the pre-poll voting period. One of my favourite, and I'm going to give a big shout out here, so I'm going to pause. So I can, I can cut this part of my contribution and send it to him. One of the leading 
academics in relation to the study of elections is Dr Paul Williams from Griffith University in my home state of Queensland. He is an outstanding academic and makes a considerable contribution to uh, discussion with respect to election matters. He coined the phrase following the last Queensland election of, we don't have an election day anymore, we have an election period. We have an election period. And if you've got a three-week pre-poll period, that means you've got a three-week election period, which just makes it logistically incredibly hard to actually do all the things you need to do for political parties and voters, including consideration of policies and competing arguments. It makes it incredibly hard to get through and do all the things you need to do before the commencement of that election period. So this, this reform, this proposition, is again, it's reasonable, it's proportionate, it's common sense that that pre-poll period become a 12-day period. I can remember, and Senator Brown probably remembers, the time when you could only vote pre-poll if you couldn't make a polling booth on election day. And they would actually ask you, when you actually went into the polling booth, well, why, why, do, you, why do you need to vote today? Why, why can't you vote on, on election day? But the world's changed. The world's changed. We're not going to change it. People like their convenience, and that's fine. We should maximise the opportunity, maximise the opportunity for people to have an opportunity to vote. And I think a 12-day pre-poll period is an appropriate, uh, appropriate and reasonable balance in terms of providing people with that opportunity. The second reform in this bill is the sorting of pre-poll votes. And I think it should be recognised that some pre-poll voting centres at the last federal election took upwards of 25,000 votes. 25,000 votes. Now, I've never scrutineered at a booth that's taken 25,000 votes. I, don't, I can't imagine what's that, what that is like when they tip out the voting papers and they just about be subsumed under the wave of ballot papers. They need time. The AEC needs time to unfold and sort. And the two-hour period before the closing of polls provides an appropriate time for them to be able to do that. Bear in mind, at the last election, there were 149 pre-poll centres that took upwards of 10,000 votes. So this is an issue. It is an issue which has arisen in recent times, and it's attached to that concept of an election period as opposed to an election date. So again, I think this is a common sense uh, reform, reasonable and proportionate. The last issue dealt with in this bill is the issue of postal voting. Now, following the last Queensland election, I was provided the open quotation marks opportunity, close quotation marks, by the Liberal National Party to do the review of the Queensland state election. And uh, I think it was, to some extent, Madam Acting Deputy President, a situation where they asked for volunteers uh, and everyone else who was asked took one step backwards. But having gone through that process, having gone through that process, one of the issues we identified was that there were upwards of 50,000 postal votes declared invalid at the last Queensland state election. Upwards of 50,000 postal votes. And a lot of people were trying to vote using a postal vote because uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the issues was it was just too complicated for people to work out, I've got to sign this ballot, I've, I've got to fill out my ballot paper, I've got to put it in this envelope, I've got to sign that, I've got to put this envelope in that envelope and make sure I get all that right, get it posted, pray that Australia Post delivers the thing. And it was just too complicated. And if people made a small error, then their vote was discounted. They were disenfranchised for that small administrative error. And that should not be the case. That should not be the case. People should not be disenfranchised for a small administrative error. So again, again I think this is uh, a fair and reasonable reform which will enhance, enhance the opportunity for people to participate in our electoral process. The third bill is the Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021. I want to talk about this issue of intimidation because I think it's a really important one. I've seen the atmosphere on polling booths change in the 34, 35 years I've been involved in the political process, and I've been involved since I was 17, so people can work out how old I am. And 
We are at our best. We are at our best as a nation on election day when people with competing views attend our polling booths to spruik their views, to represent their parties, to represent their values and engage in courteous, polite discourse at the polling booth respecting everyone's rights and liberties. That's when we're at our best and that's what we need to aspire for. We're at our worst. We're at our worst when people attend polling booths and intentionally, intentionally set about intimidating, stalking, uh, using obscenities, interfering with the democratic process. And the people who typically do that are the people who don't have confidence in their own views because they can't win the argument without that intimidation. So we need to protect our voting system, Australia's voting system, from that sort of base intimidation. So I support that part of the bill. And lastly, lastly, the last element in the package, the omnibus package that's being put up, is the issue of uh, the issue of a designated elector. Now this is someone, and these can be sad cases where someone has repeatedly tried to vote more than once, or they have voted more than once, and there's a process there with appropriate rights of appeal for them to be allowed to make a declaration, but they can still participate, but there Thank are checks you, and Senator balances. Senator Starr, time's expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021 introduces a range of measures designed to increase the efficiency of voting and counting. It supports the enormous work of the Australian Electoral Commission in planning and conducting federal elections. In 2019, the AEC employed a temporary workforce of 90,000 people, provided over 500 pre-poll or early voting locations right across Australia, issued more than 1.5 million postal vote packages, had more than 550 mobile polling teams visiting over 3,000 locations and provided 6,571 polling places on election day. On top of that, the AEC deals with nominations and candidate eligibility, complaints about electoral authorisations and election advertising, maintaining an accurate and secure electoral role, the regulation of electoral expenditure and election funding claims from candidates and political parties. This bill contains welcome measures to streamline the AEC's processes so that we can have a smooth running election and a result as early as possible. While an efficient election is a good election, we must ensure that the process of enrolling and voting enfranchises all voters, no matter how remote. The Northern Territory has the lowest rate of voter enrolment in Australia, with estimates of more than 26,000 people from rural and remote areas not enrolled to vote. It's no accident that along with the low numbers of rural and remote enrolment in the Territory, the AEC is woefully understaffed, and that's thanks to cuts from the Morrison government. Under a federal government restructure in 2017, the Australian Electoral Commission office in Darwin was reduced from 16 staff to three, with five jobs axed in enrolment and four in Indigenous participation and voter education. It was an underhanded and effective way of reducing the democratic rights of people who are already some of the most disenfranchised in the country. Before the cuts, the AEC had managed to increase the NT enrolment rate over the two years to 2018 from 79.4% to 84.1%. However, this was still a significantly lower rate than in other states and territories where 96 per cent of people are on the roll. And it's been estimated that up to 40 per cent of First Nations people in the Northern Territory may not be enrolled to vote. The underfunding of the AEC and the resulting denial of voting rights is an absolute scandal. It really is. In 1996, when the Howard government was, were elected, one of the first things they did was to get rid of the Aboriginal Voter Education and Enrolment Service in the Electoral Commission, limiting the capacity 
of the Electoral Commission to go and enrol people and to educate them about their obligations as citizens and their rights as citizens to exercise a vote. I've spoken on numerous occasions in the Senate just about the importance of language and translation into First Nations languages. Here in the Northern Territory, we have around 100 First Nations languages. So that kind of education was so critical. I argue the evidence shows that Conservative governments have continued to passively and actively prevent the enrolment of First Nations people by continuing to cut funding to the AEC, restricting their ability to engage, educate and enrol remote voters. This is why Labor has introduced an amendment to the bill that calls on the Morrison-Joyce government to close the gap by providing more resources to the Australian Electoral Commission so that people living in disadvantaged remote and regional communities can exercise their democratic right to vote. The concern about the effective disenfranchising of thousands of remote and mainly First Nations voters has led to Territorians exploring legal channels to end what they see as discrimination in voting. On the 15th of June 2021, a complaint was made to the Australian Human Rights Commission about the maintenance of the electoral roll and the conduct of the 2019 federal election in respect of remote Aboriginal communities by the Australian Electoral Commission. The complaint was made by Matthew Ryan from Manangrida and Ross Mandy of Gullawinku. These Aboriginal communities in Arnhem Land are the sixth and eighth largest towns in the Northern Territory, with populations of 2,308 and 2,088 in the 2016 census, an increase of over 40% since 2001. These Aboriginal communities in Arnhem Land are the sixth and eighth largest, as I've said, and Manangrida and Gallowinku are part of the federal election, electorate of Lingiari, which has an Indigenous population of 41.7%, the highest in the nation, followed by Jurek at 16.7% in Western Australia. As is common in remote Aboriginal communities, there are no enumerated street addresses or letterboxes and no Australia Post mail service directly to a residence. Instead, residents collect mail from the community post office or may use a private post box. In 2012, the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 was amended to provide for federal direct enrolment and update to address an alarming drop in the number of eligible persons on the electoral roll. 91.63% in 2009 and trending downwards. The amendments empower the AEC to directly enrol eligible persons who are not on the electoral roll or update the details of persons on the roll, such as a change of address using electronic data from trusted agencies as to a person's contact details. These trusted agencies at present include Centrelink, vehicle registration, driver's licences and the Australian Taxation Office. The AEC simply gives written notice to the person that enrolment or an update of an existing enrolment is proposed after 28 days. If there is no response, the AEC actions the enrolment or update. Importantly, the amendments explicitly empower the AEC to give written notice to electors by electronic means, particularly email, and SMS text messages and social media, as well as by ordinary mail and registered mail. Electronic notification is key to the success of the amendments. It resulted in a staggering 97% enrolment for the 2019 federal election, which the Australian Electoral Commissioner Tom Rogers described as the best role since Federation, a genuine piece of unallied good news and a stellar result, a modern miracle of which he was very proud. However, the good news does not extend to the electorates of Lingiari in the Northern Territory and Jurak in Western Australia, which sit in the lowest enrolment rate band of 75% to less than 80%, substantially lower than 97%. Nor does the achievement extend to remote Aboriginal communities in other federal elect electorates or in electorates 
for the Northern Territory elections. And the primary reason why the enrolment rate languishes in remote Aboriginal communities is that, as a matter of policy, the AEC does not apply the most effective tool at its disposal to address that deficiency, namely direct enrolment and update. The AEC claims that direct enrolment update cannot be used because there is no direct post to residences in Aboriginal communities. So there we have it. The AEC has explicit power to give notice solely by electronic means and regularly does so for other Australians and other territories. Exercise of that power is not reliant on the existence of a direct mail service. On the 4th of June 2021, the NT Electoral Commission reported that the AEC's policy disadvantages Aboriginal electors in the Northern Territory and should be reviewed. As of 30th of June 2020, there was an estimated 52,847 voting age Aboriginal electors in the Northern Territory, of which 16,527 were not enrolled to vote. The Northern Territory Electoral Commission said that the majority of Aboriginal Territorians live in regional and remote areas not covered by the Federal Direct Enrolment and Update Program. So the AEC's policy here predominantly affects Aboriginal residents of remote communities, and it is discriminatory. The policy operates in practice as a form of voter suppression or gerrymander, whereby the franchise for Aboriginal residents of remote communities is suppressed or inhibited in federal and NT elections as compared to non-Aboriginal Australians and non-Aboriginal Territorians. Mr Ryan and Mr Mundy also complain that the AEC does not accurately record electors' addresses in Aboriginal communities, which inhibits participation in the electoral process, and that in the 2019 federal election, the AEC did not ensure equal provision of polling booths in Maningrida, Gallowinku, and other sizeable Aboriginal communities as compared to other towns in the Northern Territory. They argue these instances of indirect discrimination also breach section 9.1 and 1A of the Racial Discrimination Act 1975. The Australian Human Rights Commission has been asked to conciliate the complaint and if conciliation is unsuccessful, the argument will go to the federal court for decision. It's not good enough that thousands of Territorians do not get to exercise their basic democratic right. It's a situation that this government could have alleviated with a stroke of a pen, but there is no political will. In fact, there often seems to be an active campaign from the Conservatives to restrict and block First Nations Territorians from voting. We have already successfully fought for the Northern Territory to keep its level of representation in the Federal Parliament. In July 2020, the AEC determined the Northern Territory was entitled to only one seat in the House of Representatives, and dozens of groups across the Northern Territory from the Central Land Council, the Northern Land Council, the Remote Children's Parents Association to the Chinese Literary Association on Christmas Island, supported my call for the Territory to retain two seats, Lingiari and Solomon. We passed legislation that was hailed across all sides of politics that ensured Territorians would be rightly and properly represented here in the National Parliament. Now we need to ensure that all Territorians, no matter where they live, no matter how remote, get to be enrolled and get to have a vote. It is going to be difficult enough in the upcoming election to ensure remote voters are enrolled and enabled to cast their votes. Trying to plan for an election during a pandemic is difficult enough, but the Morrison-Joyce government's failure to do its two jobs during this pandemic makes the AEC's job so much more difficult. And the government should be doing so much more too. But at least this bill will make things hopefully a little easier for the AEC. Oh, sorry. Um, Senator Roberts remotely. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? Yes, all good. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, here we go again. Yet again, the Labor Party is about to sit comfortably in the laps of the Liberals and Nationals to vote through measures that are in both of their own interests. Yesterday, just yesterday, I spoke of this parliament being dysfunctional to the point of being a crime scene. And the very next day, the very next day, here we are watching the proof unfold again before our very eyes. For those watching at home and wondering why One Nation did not use these bills to introduce actual electoral reform, the answer is simple. These bills were written, one per topic, and included a long description that prevents One Nation from introducing amendments that move outside of this very narrow, restrictive scope. If the government and Labor were going to join three bills together and vote in one line, then produce the three bills as an omnibus bill that One Nation and the crossbench could have amended and it badly needs amendment. Senators Wong and Birmingham are once again making a mockery of the democratic process. The dodgy siblings doing another dirty deal done behind closed doors. When are we going to start to writing numbers on those perspex screens so we can distinguish between the Liberal Nationals and Labor? The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters made 27 recommendations more towards more fair and effective elections. The Lib Lab duopoly has again rushed legislation before the Senate to implement a grand total of three of those out recommendations, none of which do anything to ensure the integrity of our electoral process. The Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021, pretends to do something about multiple voting. In the last three elections, the Australian Electoral Commission reviewed thousands of cases of multiple voting and referred a few hundred of those for prosecution to the Australian Federal Police. Who made the decision to prosecute? None. Not one person has been prosecuted as a result of the ordinary operations of the Electoral Act, despite recommendations to do so, and despite that law being on the books for a very long time. That may be why the government has chosen to abandon the legal system and refer multiple voting to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Yesterday, we saw cybercrime warrants being moved from the criminal court system to the administrative court system. Now, today, we have multiple voting moving over as well. One Nation is uncomfortable with the growing power of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and with the whole concept of having two court systems. Criminal courts are founded in biblical and common law. Administrative courts have no such higher purpose to be called on for guidance. The Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 is clearly an attempt by Lib Lab to knock out smaller parties and entrench the power of the status quo. I hear the anger on social media over this measure, yet I have some questions in return. Should a multi-millionaire be allowed to use his wealth to buy political influence to the, through the Austra United Australia Party? 500 supporters is not going to slow down a very wealthy individual, yet 1,500 supporters will unless that party actually has grassroots support. This legislation is saying to Clive Palmer, put your supporters where your mouth is, not where your money is. Now, there is criticism from some new parties who should be more worried about themselves. Perhaps start fact-checking the memes you are spreading and start offering voters evidence-based policy, and 1,500 may be more achievable. Now, I understand Senator Lambie is also in opposition to this bill, and this does raise a good question for the government. Whoops. Sorry, a question for the Lib Labs to answer. Why is it 1,500 voters for a registration in a popular state and 1,500 in Tasmania? Shouldn't this be some percentage of registered voters in that state? Next, the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Counting, Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, makes a number of small changes to voting. These have been mentioned by other speakers and I will not review those here. How will all these changes affect the integrity of our elections? Well, we don't know. We don't know now and we won't know afterward because our elections are not audited. My interest in election integrity started in January of 2021 following the US presidential election. My office was inundated with people asking and believing the election fraud, such as it was in the United States, could be happening in Australia. The problem is not whether election fraud is happening, the problem is what people think it is. 
that people think it's happening. Confidence in the election outcome is essential to democracy. COVID measures, or rather the restrictions around COVID, have people at boiling point. Small business closures, job losses, high-handed bureaucrats and arrogant politicians have reduced many people to desperation. The next election will be a powder keg, and it is essential to ensure that whatever the result, the public can accept the result and move on. Suspicion of the outcome can be easily fueled and turned into violence by those who seek to manipulate the result for their own ends. We cannot let this happen. It's for this reason that New South Wales and Western Australia have provisions in their electoral acts to audit state elections. New South Wales conducts an audit before each election to ensure systems are fit for purpose, and then audits again after each election to ensure integrity and to see what can be improved for next time. Western Australia audits after every election. Now, the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 does not have audit provisions. In February, I started asking questions of the Australian Electoral Commission, the AEC, and to be honest, I expected to hear that auditing was under control given the reputation the Australian Electoral Commission claims it has. That's not what I found. The Australian Electoral Commission told me in Senate estimates that the Australian Signals Directorate had conducted an audit of the Australian Electoral Commission software. The next day in Senate estimates, I asked the Australian Signals Directorate if they had done that audit. And the answer was clear, no. The Australian Electoral Commission tried to conflagrate the security audit conducted by the Australian Signals Directorate with an audit of software and systems to pretend our software was being audited and by extension was fit for purpose. It has not been audited. The election software is not fit for purpose. So why did the Australian Electoral Commission make a false statement or imply a false statement? The Australian Signals Directorate looked at potential intrusions into the system, both electronic and physical. Following the audit, the ASD, the Australian Signals Directorate, proceeded with an uplift program designed to harden the AEC, the Australian Electoral Commission network. I call that a fail. If your systems are audited for cyber security and the outcome was a comprehensive uplift program to improve your security, then clearly the system failed the audit. What else would fail an audit at the Australian Electoral Commission? Well, in the May Senate estimates, I asked the Australian Electoral Commission simple questions. When did the Australian Signals Directed audit happen? The Australian Electoral Commission declined to answer. What was actually audited? The Australian Electoral Commission gave no useful response. What was the result of the audit? The Australian Electoral Commission declined to answer. What changes to Australian Electoral Commission systems have been made in the uplift program? The Australian Electoral Commission declined to answer. Could the Australian Electoral Commission guarantee that the uplift program would render the Australian Electoral Commission computer system fit for purpose? The Australian Electoral Commission responded that nobody could ever guarantee their systems are fit for purpose. Let that sink in. Nobody could ever guarantee their systems are fit for purpose. The Australian Electoral Commission admitting it. It's disturbing that such an audit could happen behind closed doors without direction or without structure. It's more disturbing still that this program has no legal basis in the Australian Electoral Act we should not have to rely on the admirable conscientiousness of the Australian Signals Directorate. We should be able to rely on the completeness of our legislation. We need this fixed. It must be fixed. So then I looked at other issues around election integrity. First up was a simple question. Is the electronic data file containing each vote ever compared back to the paper ballot after the vote has been adjudicated? That answer is no. At no time is the electronic record of a vote checked back against the ballot paper, the paper ballot. Senator Birmingham and the Australian Electoral Commission have assured us that there is a check. Yet when we peer through the veil of language deliberately calculated to obfuscate, no such check is happening. Contrary to the minister's response, the only time this happens is when a ballot is disputed and the paper ballot is pulled out for scrutiny. After the ballot is adjudicated, there is no further check. These votes 
are sitting there for up to a month in a system that failed an Australian Signals Directorate security test. Data integrity requires that a final audit be conducted immediately before declaration of the poll by pulling paper ballots out at random and comparing them back to the electronic record and vice versa. One day's work for all accounting staff as they finish their regular counting. It will not delay the result. It will guarantee that the system has not been compromised accidentally or by a malicious party. My second question is the accuracy of the voter rolls. The Australian Electoral Commission used to check the accuracy of their rolls by conducting residency checks. Before their system was discontinued in 1995, those checks revealed significant numbers of false registrations. People who had left the country, people who had died, people who had moved. Most of the incidences of multiple voting stem from voting in their old location and in their new location. Double voting. This legislation does not address that problem. How can anyone say that the, the voter roll is accurate if they never check it? My third question was to the software algorithm at the Senate Scanning Centre that allocates preferences. The Australian Electoral Commission publishes what is basically a data dump of the raw vote count. Leading cryptographers led by Dr Vanessa Teague from the Australian National University have written a check routine to test the preference flow against the published result. Their finding was that the Senate preference flow was correct. So we know that this aspect of the Australian Electoral Commission software works. Why is it up to the university academics to write complicated software at their own expense on their own time to audit our elections? Since when did the government decide to crowdsource its job? So what next? A GoFundMe page to pay for it? This is why next week I will introduce into the Senate the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Integrity of Elections Bill 2021. This bill requires a pre-audit of the Australian Electoral Commission systems prior to each election to ensure the systems are fit for purpose. It requires an audit after the election, as New South Wales and Western Australia require, and as the ACT proposes. We propose an audit of the electoral roll and voter ID, voter identification. In short, this bill audits the elections and the voter. Then we will, have all, we will all have confidence in the next election result. After decades of the Lib Lab Parliament, this Lib Lab Parliament, people are starting to see how Parliament is face, failing our country. The Lib Lab duopoly, though, is desperate to continue its hold on Parliament that has a record of decades of not serving the people of Australia. We are, though, keen to restore parliamentary democracy. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one nation. Senator Lambie, you have a few minutes before the guillotine. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, what do you know? Here we go. Just been chipping away trying to get rid of these micro parties for years, haven't you? I mean, you'd think you would have learnt your lesson back with the preference deals and how you'd went into a double D and that actually come back to watch a fair on the backside. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. So no more satisfaction of chipping away at trying to get rid of micros and normal people out of the parliament. You're now coming in with a jackhammer. Here comes the jackhammer. How about that? Heavy handed. Here come the major parties trying to take out the little bloke. Here come the heavies. Here come the heavies. Can't stand competition. I can tell you. You people, if you had any idea just how difficult it was out there as an independent in the first place and then putting those, uh, making them get 1,500 signatures, just goes to show how disconnected you really are from politics. I can tell you that right now. What you are doing this morning is absolutely, absolutely disgusting. And then rushing this through, what is there an election coming up? Did I miss something? Did I miss something? Did I? Because I tell you what, it sure as hell does not help normal Australians out there and micro parties to get into Parliament. Every which way we turn, you want to put that brickwork up against us. Well, Australians are waking up to it. I can tell you that right now. Whatever happened to elections is supposed to be about voters choosing their politicians. Instead, no, this bill flips that around. This bill makes elections about politicians choosing their politicians. 
This bill gives every existing party an incredible amount of power and makes it harder for any other party to challenge them. The, just, the justification for this bill is about saying that some parties are using similar names to larger parties and that is confusing voters. Really? You think we're all that stupid? How demeaning! How demeaning! My God, what is wrong with you people? I mean, who says that? Who says that? The Australian Electoral Commission majority checks new parties to make sure they're not designed to confuse voters, doesn't think any registered party is confusing voters. They say voters aren't stupid. The Liberals say that voters obviously are. Labor says that voters are. They say you can't tell the difference between the Liberal Party of Australia and the Liberal Democrats. You know what? You don't own the word Liberal just because it's in your name. You don't own that. You don't have the rights to it. Liberalism is a political philosophy. It describes what you stand for. Other people are allowed to stand for the same thing. Order, you don't Senator own Lambie, it. pursuant to the order adopted earlier today, the time allotted for debate on these bills has concluded. I'll now put the questions on the remaining stages of the bills. The question is that the second reading amendment to the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021, moved by Senator Hanson Young on sheet 1416, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Obviously, I would like it recorded that the Australian Greens support our amendment. Thank you. Senator Seawitt, so recorded. Is there anyone else? No one else on the screen is asking for that. I'll now move to uh, the second. The question is that the second reading amendment to the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, circulated by the opposition on sheet 1408, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. Question is second reading amendment circulated by the opposition on sheet 1408 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 12. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. Senators, I have received a request from Senator Patrick to have his support for the previous question, Greens Amendment Sheet 1416, be recorded in Hansard. So I will just note that. He was not available to be online at the time. The question now is that the bills be now read a second time. The bills being the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 and the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021. Senator Seward. Um, can I ask the bills be put separately? Sure. Okay, so I will first put um, the, 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 the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Oh, sorry, Senator Seward. Could you say that again? I, be, I deeply the question, beg yeah, your pardon. The question is that the second reading, oh, sorry, that the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Could you please record the Greens' opposition uh, to so the recorded. second reading? Thank you. So recorded. I'm looking for anyone else on the screen. Who might be seeking that? No? OK. Um, the question now is that the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting, Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021 be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now deal with the amendments to the— Oh, sorry, I'll call the clerk. No, no. Yep. That's, that's not on this script here yet. Oh. oh, okay. So the question is that the Electoral Legislation Amendment, Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021 be read a second time. I'm looking at the clerk to make sure I've got that correct. That is correct. Uh, be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll call the clerk. Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 and Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021. I will now deal with the amendments to the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021 circulated by the Jackie Lambie Network. The question is that the amendments on sheet 1414 circulated by the Jackie, Jackie Lambie network be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. I will now deal Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Could you please just note that the Australian Greens supported um, Ms. Lambie, uh, Senator Lambie's amendment? Thank you. No worries, and I will assume Senator Lambie supported her own, even though she couldn't vote remotely as well. Uh, Senator Patrick, you'd like your support for those amendments moved by Senator Lambie recorded? So recorded. Yes, please. I will now deal with the amendments from the Australian Greens on sheet 1415, which was circulated after the cut-off time for amendments. Is is leave being sought to deal with these amendments? Senator yes. Seward. Could you uh, go to Senator Waters, please? Uh, so first I'll ask uh, leave, because leave is sought by you here. It can't be sought remotely. I, I beg your pardon. 
Um, you seek leave. It's very confusing because she can actually move her own amendment. Is in committee, is my understanding. So yeah. I seek leave. Yeah. But yes, but uh, so you're seeking leave. We, we don't, yes. She doesn't have to move the amendment after the because the guillotine is okay. cut. I, I seek leave. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Yeah, uh, could you? Uh, you're noted as seeking record leave. our deep concern. <laughs> so recorded, Senator Seaworth. The question is now that the amendments. No, it's not granted. Sorry. The question is now that the remaining stages of the bills be agreed to and the bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator. Ah, oh, you'd like to do them separately again? Sure. Um, so I will then put. The question is that the Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021, that the remaining stages of that bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator Seaworth. Could you please record the Greens' opposition to that? And Senator Patrick, uh, your opposition is recorded as well. Yeah. Can you also please record my opposition to the second reading stage of that bill as well? So recorded, and the third reading as just done then as well. So unless there's a, a, a wish, I'm going to deal with the other two bills together, unless someone's asking them to be separated. So the question is that for the Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021 and the Electoral Legislation so I sort of read the correct title out, and that the Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021, that the remaining stages of those bills be agreed to and the bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Electoral Legislation Amendment Counting Scrutiny and Operational Efficiencies Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Party Registration Integrity Bill 2021, Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Offences and Preventing Multiple Voting Bill 2021. So we shall can move I, on, uh, Senators. Uh, uh, Are there uh, any notices I, of motion uh, to be given for another day? Can I? Uh, hello. Are there any notices? Yes. Sorry, sorry. Senator Hello? Fear of wells and I'll come to you next, yes, Senator Lambie. Senator Fear of wells Mr. President, um, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation. I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for 10 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the bankruptcy regulations 2021. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Sorry, Mr. President, I'd just like to show, uh, put, put my opposition to the last vote, please. Thank okay, you. to the last vote for the two bills? For, so, for yes, all of the electoral you. bills? Yes, so, all right, your opposition to all of the electoral bills is recorded. If Thank there are uh, no other notices of motion, is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I present the 10th report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the report be adopted. Question is the report be adopted. Senator Seaworth. Thank you. On behalf of Senator Thorpe, I move that the end of the motion is added and in respect of the foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, the provisions of the bill be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 19 October 2021. And I think Senator Thorpe would like to speak to this. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise to speak on my referral to the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. I'm calling on the senators in this place to refer this bill to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee to allow for proper scrutiny by the parliament and the people. The way this bill is being rammed through this chamber is remarkable. The Liberal Party always say that they're a broad church, right? So broad, in fact, it seems that they also take in a big chunk of the Labor Party too. This bill was referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, also known as the Lib Lab 
closed shop for a secret review and a final report by Friday 20th of August 2021 by the Minister for Home Affairs, the Honourable Karen Andrews MP. The PJCIS recommended the bill be passed, no surprises there. This would be subject to two amendments requiring reporting to the PJCIS in certain circumstances and review of provisions after five years. The bill and explanatory memorandum were referred to an embargoed basis as the bill had not yet been tabled in Parliament. The committee agreed to the government's request to consider this legislation quickly and in private. The committee held a classified briefing on Monday, the 23rd of August, 2021, with officials from relevant agencies. Again, another closed shop. Good old democracy in Canberra. Now the two old parties want to tell us that the legislation is for our own good and so absolutely important to the running of this country and the alleged protection of the Commonwealth that we are just meant to pass it without reviewing it. You want us to pass something that we can't even review because of your closed shop who think it's all okay. Maybe my colleagues have forgotten that this chamber is a house of review. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is absolutely disgusting. It's a contempt. It's in contempt of democracy and should not be allowed. If you're scared of proper debate and scrutiny of laws, then maybe think about why you are here. Let's take this to a committee so that we can properly scrutinise this bill. And I ask for all of my fellow senators to support this referral so that the people have an opportunity to have real transparency and accountability from the so-called politicians in Canberra who are running this country. Thank you. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator yeah. C Oh, sorry, you wish to speak? Senator Patrick, you wish to speak? Yeah, just yep. very briefly, thank you, Mr President. Um, I will be supporting this uh, referral on the basis that uh, this particular bill has been uh, rushed, as has been described by Senator Thorpe, and it involves some uh, quite extraordinary powers uh, that allow our intelligence agencies to spy on Australians. And uh, that's something that has to be considered very carefully. It may be that uh, there are circumstances in, in which it is justified to do so, However, uh, in my read of the bill, the thresholds aren't well spelt out and this does require some examination. So I would urge the Senate to support Senator Thorpe's bill, uh, uh, referral. Sorry. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. I'd just like to rise uh, briefly to uh, uh, argue the case for a referral of this piece of legislation. And it is just unthinkable that a piece of legislation this serious, uh, apparently this needed, was rushed into the other place only yesterday with no notification of the full parliament, uh, a cosy deal between the Labor and the Liberal parties, uh, the crossbenchers left out of this, the bulk of the parliament left out of it, and we still haven't heard from the government of the day as to why this is important. It seems that every time the government wants to get something rushed through, rammed through this place without scrutiny, they just have to write in crayon national security and the Labor Party roll over. That's what's happened here, and it's happening before our very eyes. And why? Because Mr Morrison is on the brink of wanting to call an election, and he wants every tool in the book. The question is, the motion moved by uh, Senator Seward on behalf of Senator Thorpe be agreed to, to amend the Selection of Bills Committee report. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Senator Seward. You please record the Greens' um, op, uh, support for the amendment that we moved. And Senator Patrick, yours, reflecting your speech. Anyone else wish remotely to have that recorded? No. So I'll now then put the motion to adopt the selection of, bi of bills committee report as moved by Senator Smith. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no.
the eyes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I ask that the question be put separately on the postponement of general business notice of motion 1225. I'll come to that next. Okay. Oh, we, we're not there yet. Senator Rustin, I've got. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown at today's order of business, be considered from 12:15 p.m. today. Government business then be called on and considered till not later than 1:30 p.m. General business order of the day number 17 be considered during general business today, and that the following bills be considered for the time for private senators' bills on Monday, the 30th of August 2021. Fair Work Amendment improving paid parental leave for parents of stillborn babies, Bill 2021, and Defence Amendment parliamentary approval of Overseas Service, Bill 2020. The question is that, that motion moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now call the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr. President, a postponement notification has been lodged in respect of General Business Notice Number 1225, standing in the name of Senator Canavan, to the next day of sitting, and committees have lodged extension notifications, as shown at Item 7 of today's order of business. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask again that the question be put separately on the postponement of General Business Notice of Motion 1225. Is there, there, first, I'll call. Are there any other requests to put any of those matters to a, a vote, as senators have the right to? No. So I'll now put the question on the postponement of general business notice of motion number 1225. Those of the opinion it should be postponed say aye. aye. I appreciate it. All right. Those of the opinion it should be postponed say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The no, the, no, right, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Yes, yeah, sorry, Senator. Patrick's had his hand up. Oh, Senator Patrick, sorry, I, I, Senator Patrick. I'm oh, sorry. I did. This is my fault. He did text me earlier. Um, can we stop the bells with the leave of the chamber? Sorry. This. Is, I'm just dealing with text messages from senators remotely who I can't quite see on the small screen in front of me. Senator Patrick wanted to seek leave to make a one-minute statement on this motion, but this is not the substantive uh, motion, actually, Senator Patrick. It's only the postponement. Yeah, sorry. It was, I, I wanted to do that on the substantive motion, but I do want to indicate my support for, uh, for, uh, with Labor on this, uh, on this particular vote. Right. Ring the bells. I'll, I've got you down to make if we, if we deal with it today, Senator Patrick. Ring the bells. My apologies.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion 1225 be postponed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 12. The votes being equal, the questions resolved in the negative, so the motion remains on today's well, up for consideration today. If there are no other matters, I shall proceed to the discovery of formal business. And the first matter is business of the Senate matter number one in the name of Senator Lambie. Senator Urquhart. Um, on behalf of Senator Lambie, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. I'll, I'll, Senator Rustin. Um, I, I, seek, I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I move that the motion be amended by omitting paragraph A4. Right, the question is that the motion be amended in those terms, deleting the par paragraph A4. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seawitt. Could you please record the Grand's opposition to removal of this term? So recorded. I now have an amendment from Senator, Senator Seawitt. So you do. Um, on behalf of Senator Steele, John, I seek, I seek leave to move an amendment. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator I move the, oh, sorry, Mr President. I move the amendment as circulated in the chamber. Question is that amendment, moved by Senator Seawitt on behalf of Senator Steele, John, as circulated be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Seawood. Obviously, I would like uh, it recorded that we supported our own amendment. Is there anyone remotely who would like? No, there's no one seeking the call. Um, so I'll now go to the motion as amended in the terms moved by Senator Rustin. The question is the amended motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So I'll now come to general business and I'll commence with matter number 1225 in the name of Senator Canavan. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. On behalf of Senator Canavan, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 1225 before seeking to have the motion taken as formal. Is leave granted? Senator Urquhart. We've seen the amendment. No, I, I, I don't have it myself, I don't think. Would you like me to come back to that? I, um, here, I, I amend you, the motion by omitting in paragraph seven independent senators and substituting with quotations any minority party or independent senator, close quotations, and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Leave is not granted. So we return to 1225 as it is. So general business notice of motion number 1225 proposing the establishment of a select committee be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Davey. I move the motion. Senator Patrick, you are seeking the call. Thank you. Uh, I seek leave to make a one minute statement. Leave granted. It is Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to remind senators, as I have in the past, uh, uh, of page 
485 lodges, which says that back in 2009, and I quote, the Procedure Committee re recommended an understanding that there should be no more than three select committees in existence at any time. There are currently seven select committees. This motion will take it to eight. I just point out that there is a stipend that is paid by the public in relation to these committees. Uh, a chair receives $23,240 of additional payment and a deputy chair receives $11,620. So this is a cost to the taxpayer of $34,000. At the time, same time, we're paying stipends to reference committee chairs and deputy chairs and those committees seem mostly unutilised. Uh, I won't support the, the, uh, uh, a select committee here, but I would support it going to a reference committee. Question is, the motion moved by Senator Davies. Mr. Senator President, I seek Roberts. leave to make a yes, sorry, short statement. You there. Senator Roberts, seeking leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? It is for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. A one Nation opposes this motion. Paragraph one in the, is the key paragraph. Within that, in regard to clause A, the answer is already known, but it's not surprising that members of the parliament are not aware. Clause B, uh, the core issue is decades of shoddy governance and lack of parliamentary accountability. Our inquiry into use of taxpayer money on disaster recovery funding would start to address these issues. My dissenting report to the Northern Agenda inquiry itemised many concerns, including the need for comprehensive tax reform for practical industrial relations reform to protect workers and small businesses. Clause D, it's largely known and understood. This would be a waste of money and it is not sincere. Question is the motion moved by Senator Davey for Senator Canavan, number 1225, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required? The noes have it. Senator Rustin. Could I have it recorded that the, the government um, obviously supported that motion? Question. We'll now move to. Oh, sorry, Senator Watt. No, no. Yeah, the no's have it. Um, the question is number. Now, I'll now move to 1226 in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Seward, are you in a position to. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Waters, I ask that General Business. General business notice of motion number 1226 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will be opposing this motion as the Energy Security Board's final report into post-2025 energy market design is publicly available on the Energy Security Board's website. Looking on the screen, no one else. All right. The question is: the motion number one two two six be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. Could you record the government's position as voting against that? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Now, number one two two eight in the name of Senator Chisholm, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Chisholm, I ask that general business notice of motion number one double two eight be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will not be supporting this motion as the document requested does not yet exist. The government refers the Senate to our statements on the previous occasions. These documents were sought for further details. Question is it just checking no one on the screen. The question is that motion number 1228 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. If you don't want to. Oh, so I'm actually, can I put that again? I'm just using my cheat sheet here, so I might be able to avoid a division. Um, the question is that motion number 1228 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1228 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes. Senator Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 12. The votes being equal, the matter is resolved in the negative. The final matter, senators, if I ask you to remain in the chamber, is number 1229 in the name of Senator Watt. Senator. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1229 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Beetaloo Cooperative Drilling Program is designed, its design, guidelines and application processes and approvals are the ministerial responsibility for the Minute of Water Resource, Resources and Water. The government is opposing this motion and it is, is nothing more than a cynical attempt to distract from the Labor Party's internal divisions on supporting Australia's gas industry. The government continues to cooperate with the ongoing Senate inquiry on this matter, having responded to over 20 additional questions to the Senate committee to date. This motion is unnecessary drain on the Senate's time and the resources of the public service in the middle of a pandemic. Question is, motion number 1229 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1229 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes and Senator Smith tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 12. The votes being equal, the question is therefore resolved in the negative. That concludes the discovery of formal business colleagues. I'll now go to committee memberships. I have received letters requesting changes in the memberships of committees. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? 
It is. Senator Ruston. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic rep. This motion includes committee membership changes contingent on the expected vacancy in the representation of Western Australia. Question is the motion moved by Senator Ruston be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Ruston. I move that this bill now proceed without formalities and be read at first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Ayes have it. The clerk. Of an act amending National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013 and for related purposes. Senator Ruston. Move that the bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Ruston. I move that the debate now be adjourned. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I have received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr D J Chester in place of Mr Conaghan to the Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. I have also received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 for concurrence. Senator Ruston. I move that this bill now proceed without formalities and be read at first time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. To an act amend the law relating to foreign intelligence and for related purposes. Uh, Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. So we debate that bill and I call Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I rise to speak to the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 and at the outset indicate that the opposition will be supporting this legislation. This bill responds to recommendations from the Richardson Review of the National Intelligence Community and addresses gaps in foreign intelligence warrant framework that arise from technological change. The bill introduces new safeguards and retains prohibitions on using foreign intelligence warrants for the purpose of collecting domestic communications. This bill has been the subject of an inquiry by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, and the report has been tabled in the Parliament. The Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill amends the Telecommunications Interception and As Access Act and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act to address gaps in Australia's foreign intelligence warrant framework. These gaps, which have arisen from technological change, were considered by the comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community conducted by Dennis Richardson AC. As I've said, these legislative changes address and affix these gaps. Foreign intelligence refers to the intelligence about the capabilities, intentions or activities of people or organizations outside of Australia. Without the proposed changes in the bill, gaps in foreign intelligence collection will continue to grow and Australia will not have visibility of possible threats to Australia and its security. The bill makes no changes to the existing safeguards for foreign communications warrants. These warrants cannot be issued for the purpose of intercepting domestic communications and communications that are identified as domestic must be destroyed. The Richardson Review also recommended reforms to allow foreign intelligence to be collected on Australian citizens and permanent residents in Australia who are acting on behalf of foreign powers. The bill does continue the prohibition of collecting information concerning an Australian unless the ASIO Director General reasonably suspects the Australian is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The proposed changes in this legislation to the Foreign Communications Warrant bring Australia into alignment with other Five Eyes partner countries. However, Australia will retain stronger safeguards than our Five Eyes partners when it comes to the use of foreign intelligence warrants, foreign intelligence communication warrants, including the continuing prohibition on collecting domestic communication. Now, the ability for ASIO to obtain foreign intelligence warrants has a long history and arises out of the Second Hope Royal Commission in 1986. 
Originally, the Foreign Intelligence Warrant Framework contained two warrants, a warrant under the TIA Act, authorizing interception of a single service, such as a single phone number, and a warrant under the ASIO Act, authorizing the use of ASIO's pre-existing special powers. In response to technological change, including the uptake of mobile phones and the development of the Internet, the Telecommunications Warrant was updated in 2000 by introducing an amendment that permitted foreign communications warrants for a more expansive definition of telecommunication technologies and where it was not possible to identify a particular person or individual. That amendment still confined the warrants to foreign communications only. The foreign communication warrants allow intelligence agencies to identify threats to Australia's national security, including malicious cyber activity, terrorist communications and indications of foreign intelligence services threatening Australia's interests. The foreign communications warrant prohibits the interception of domestic communications that both start and end in Australia, even where the interception is inadvertent or unavoidable. Previously, it was rather straightforward to determine if the point of interception of a, foreign, of a communication is foreign or domestic. For example, the use of country codes on a fixed line. The challenge that now arises because of technological change, particularly the use of internet-based communications in mobile applications, is that now it is not always possible to know at the point of interception if a communication is foreign or domestic. And so, to avoid breaching the TIA Act, intelligence, a intelligence agencies do not intercept foreign communications where there is even the smallest risk of incidentally intercepting domes domestic communications. This places a considerable constraint on the collection of foreign intelligence. So the bill amends the TIA Act to overcome the difficulty agencies face in being able to distinguish between a foreign and a domestic communication at the point of interception. The bill allows the ASIO Director General to apply for a warrant authorizing the interception of a communication for the purpose of collecting foreign communication, including where the geographic locations of the sender and the recipient cannot be determined prior to interception. The bill also introduces strict safeguards to protect domestic communication if it's inadvertently collected. These safeguards protect domestic communication in the way the original prohibition intended and include that warrants can only be issued for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence from foreign communications, that the Attorney General must issue a mandatory written procedure to screen for domestic communications that may have been intercepted destroy all records of any domestic communication so identified unless the communication relates to or appears to relate to activities that present a significant risk to a person's life and notify the Inspector General of, of, of Intelligence and Security of any identified domestic communication that relates to or appears to relate to activities that present a significant risk to a person's life. And before issuing or varying the mandatory procedure, the Attorney General must consult with the Minister for Defense, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the IGIS, and ASIO Director General. The Attorney General must review the mandatory procedure as soon as practicable, within one year of it being passed, and then every three years. The existing safeguards for foreign communication warrants will still continue to apply. That is, that the Attorney General must be satisfied on the advice of the Minister for Defence and the Minister for Foreign Affairs that the collection of foreign intelligence is in the interest of Australia's national security, Australia's foreign relations, or Australia's economic well-being. The IGIS will continue to have oversight of agencies' activities under these warrants and will oversee compliance with mandatory procedures issued by the Attorney General. The IGIS has extensive powers akin to those of a standing Royal Commission. The bill also enables the Attorney General to issue foreign intelligence warrants to collect foreign intelligence on Australians in Australia who are acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. Currently, ASIO can collect foreign intelligence offshore on an Australian working for a foreign power, but that same intelligence cannot be collected inside Australia on that Australian under a warrant. The Richardson Review identified this gap in warrant powers and recommended this legislative change, noting, an Australian serving the interests of a foreign government remains the agent of a foreign power, whether they are onshore or offshore. Foreign power is defined under the ASIO Act. A foreign government, 
an entity that is directed or controlled by a foreign government or governments, or a foreign political organization. Safeguards will also accompany this change. The law will continue to prevent the, re the request of a foreign intelligence warrant on Australian persons who are not acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The ASIO Director General must include in the warrant the details about the grounds on which he or she suspect the person is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The Attorney General must not issue the warrants unless he or she is satisfied that the person is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The Attorney General must be satisfied on the advice of the Minister for Defence and the Minister for Foreign Affairs that the collection of foreign intelligence is in the interest of Australia's national security, Australia's foreign relations, or Australia's economic well-being. And the IGES will continue to have oversight of agencies' activities under these warrants. As I said, the IGES has extensive powers akin to those of a standing royal commission. Uh, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, as I stated at the outset, this bill has been the subject of a review by the, by, by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And the report of the, of the PJCIS recommended, in a bipartisan fashion and in the national interest, uh, two changes to the legislation. One, on the point of the mandatory written procedure that must be developed by the Attorney General. The committee has recommended that it is also provided with a briefing on the procedure as soon as practicable once it has been issued. And I note that the government has accepted this recommendation. The committee also made a second recommendation that the bill be amended so that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security may conduct a review of the amendments made by this legislation not less than five years from its royal assent. I also note that the government has accepted this recommendation. These changes recommended by the Richardson Review are necessary. Labor supports these changes, noting that we take seriously the advice of the Richardson Review, and we also take seriously the advice of the ASIO Director General and our national security agencies. When considering changes such as these, Labor applies a principle. Are the powers necessary? Are they proportionate? Do they have appropriate safeguards for Australian citizens? and in particular, the rights of Australian citizens? And do the bill, do the changes, are the changes accompanied by appropriate oversight and review? It is my judgment and the judgment of the opposition that these changes proposed in the foreign uh, intelligence uh, legislation before us today are necessary, are proportionate, do have adequate safeguards and retain the original prohibition in the provided for by the Hope Royal Commission uh, that uh, prohibit ASIO from using these warrants to collect information and communication on Australian citizens in Australia. And that these bills, uh, and that this bill Senator in particular Keneally, due to the... I will have to ask you to resume your sheet. As per the order of business, we now move to non-controversial legislation. We will come back to you for the last few minutes. Uh, you will be in continuation with 3 minutes 30 four seconds on the clock. Uh, Clark. Government business, order of the day number three, Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Amendment, Governance and Other Measures Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Minister. Oh, oh Senator Brown. Thank you. Apologies. My um, thank you. Um, this bill, um, the governance structure of the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation, Transplantation Authority, um, it acts on the advice from Dr. Mao Washer, Chair of the Organ and Tissue Authority Board, the Board, to enable the Board to have a more strategic and advisory focus. The current governance structure, where the Governance Board is the accountable entity, is unusual and has apparently not delivered effective and efficient governance to the authority. That is why the entire board has agreed with the chair's recommendation to return to a more common governance structure, with the CEO being the accountable entity and the board playing a strategic advisory role. It is not clear to Labor why the government chose this government structure in 2017. 
It is not the usual governance structure employed by non-corporate Commonwealth entities like the Organ and Tissue Authority. This decision resulted in the Organ and Tissue Authority becoming the first non-corporate Commonwealth entity to have a governance board as the accountable entity. Again, the reasons for this decision remains unclear to Labor. However, it is good that the government is now choosing to act on the board's view about the governance of the Organ and Tissue Authority as represented by advice provided by the chair. This advice conforms with Labor's view that non-corporate Commonwealth entities like the Organ and Tissue Authority should have a governance structure that allows for the CEO who acts who actually runs the organisation and is accountable for its functioning to be accountable to be the accountable entity in the legal sense, all the while being guided by an advisory board that focuses on the strategic direction of the authority. This conforms to the governance structure of almost all other non-corporate Commonwealth entities. This bill will transition the role of accountable authority from the board back to the CEO and replace the existing governance board with an advisory board under the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Act 2008. These governance changes will revert the Organ and Tissue Authority to the, to the approach first implemented by Labor in 2008. It is, a, it is a sensible change, one that indicates the government has, has unusually acknowledged that Labor got it right and one that Labor supports. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Um, the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority manages the implementation of the government's national reform program on organ and tissue donation and transplantation. In July 2020, the Organ and Tissue Authority Guidance the Governance Board undertook an internal review as required under the Board's charter. The results indicated a clear consensus from Board members of the need for increased time and capacity to contribute to the organisation's strategic direction and to provide advice and support to the Chief Executive Officer. The Board was established on 1 July 2017 following a review of the implementation of the National Reform Agenda on Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation conducted by Ernst & Young in 2016. Following the review, legislative changes established the Board as the accountable authority of the Organ and Tissue Authority under the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013. This resulted in the Organ and Tissue Authority becoming the first non-corporate Commonwealth entity to have a governance board as the accountable authority under the PGPA Act. This bill will transition the role of accountability authority uh, from the board back to the CEO and replace the existing governance board with an advisory board under the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Act 2008. There are no changes to the existing functions of the Organ and Tissue Authority. These governance changes will align the Organ and Tissue Authority with the governance structures of most other non-corporate Commonwealth entities. This bill will amend the functions of the CEO to include all functions of the Accountable Authority under the PGPA Act and establish the advisory board to provide advice and expertise to the CEO on organ and tissue donation and transplantation matters. The advisory board will have skills-based membership harnessing expertise, experience and knowledge from a broad range of areas from within the organ and tissue sector. All advisory board members except the chair will be appointed by the minister responsible for organ and tissue donation and transplantation matters in consultation with the jurisdictions. The chair will be appointed directly by the minister without the requirement to consult. These changes to the governance structure of the Organ and Tissue Authority will allow the board a greater strategic focus to provide expertise and advice to the work of the Organ and Tissue Authority. This will support the Organ and Tissue Authority to set the priorities for the future to improve organ and tissue donation, retrieval and transplantation outcomes which will better support the authority to more effectively achieve its strategic goals, saving lives and improving the quality of lives of more Australians. I thank members for their contribution to the debate on this bill and commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Act 2008 and for related purposes. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. 
I move this bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Australian Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation Authority Act 2008 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 4, Customs Amendment 2022, Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021, and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to contribute to the debate on the Customs Tariff Amendment 2022, Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021, and the Customs Amendment 2022, Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021. I will say from the outset that Labor will support these bills. The purpose of the Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021 is to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995, the, to, uh, uh, the Customs Tariff Act to implement the outcomes of the World Customs Organisation's sixth review of the Harmonised Commodity Description and Coding System the harmonised system, which is scheduled to commence internationally on 1 January 2022. The Parliament is also considering the Customs Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021, which seeks to specifically amend the definition of tobacco products in the Customs Act 1901. This second bill is required because the first bill provides that e-cigarettes and vapes will have their own classification code under the International Harmonised System. Consequently, one of the oldest acts of this Australian Parliament, the Customs Act 1901, must be amended to reflect this change and the emergence of these new types of tobacco products. The amendments will ensure that these products continue to be subject to the existing regulatory requirements such as tax and excise that apply to tobacco products under the Customs Act. Today I will speak primarily on the first bill which deals with the harmonised commodity description and coding system. The harmonised system allocates classifications and descriptions used to identify all tradable goods. The World Customs Organisation maintains this system and the World Customs Organisation members, including Australia, review it on a five-yearly basis. The coding system changes to reflect emerging technologies, changing trade patterns and also seeks to monitor trade in dangerous and lethal components and products. The system plays an important role in helping to monitor goods that can be exploited to the detriment of their country of origin. Essentially, as the world changes and technology advances, so do classifications of the goods we trade. Codes for new goods are added, some goods are reclassified and other goods codes drop off the list altogether. For example, some products have been given a separate code because they are increasingly present in international trade, include 3D printers, smartphones and electric vehicles. The harmonised system is also used in the monitoring of trade patterns to help conservation efforts. For example, in this review, the potential impact of the over-exploitation of the African cherry tree in the wild because of the growing use of its bark in the pharmaceutical industry will be monitored by the application of dedicated code for this produce, product. Many would be unaware that these new codes will also help facilitate the monitoring and control of substance controlled under the Chemical Weapons Convention and goods required for the production and use of improvised explosive devices. Adjustment of the harmonised system also monitor, monitors substances controlled by virtue of the Kingali amendments to the Montreal pro Protocol that deplete the ozone layer. As we can see from these examples, the harmonised system works to do much in international trade. I believe it is important that we recognise the good work done in the global interest by institutions such as the World Customs Organisation and all the nation states that are active in negotiations. The coded harmonised system is an important and wholly undervalued tool in the global effort to curb the development of chemical weapons and improvised explosive devices and re-emergence of products that endanger the ozone layer. And these are just three examples, Acting Deputy President. And so, with this background, Labor will support both of these bills 
and we commend them to the Senate. Minister. Sorry, me. Um, the Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised Systems Changes Bill 2021 and the Customs Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021 will amend the Customs uh, Tariff Act 1995 and the Customs Act 1901, respectively. Together, these two bills will implement the changes agreed to in the sixth review of the Harmonised Commodity Description and Coding System. These measures in the Tariff Amendment Bill will ensure that Australia's customs tariff, which is based on the harmonised system, reflect the changing patterns of international trade, the emergence of new technologies and the international will to regulate certain goods of concern. The World Customs Organisation developed the harmonised system to strengthen and support trade between countries with different trade regulatory arrangements. Australia is one of more than 200 countries and economies that use the harmonised system. The harmonised system is of critical importance to Australian traders and industry. Ensuring that Australia's tariffs, tariff is consistent with the international harmonised system used by our trading partners is an important part of the government's support for our importers and exporters. The Customs Amendment Bill is consequential to the amendments that we made to the Customs Tariff Act 1995 by the Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised Systems Changes Bill 2021. One of the amendments made by the Tariff Amendment Bill creates a new tariff subheading for products such as e-cigarettes. Consequentially, the definition of tobacco products in the Customs Act 1901 needs to be amended to ensure that e-cigarettes remain subject to the same treatment as other important products that contain tobacco. The Customs Amendment Bill will amend this definition. I thank senators for their contribution to the debate, and I commend both the Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised Systems Changes Bill 2021 and the Customs Amendment 2022 Harmonised Systems Changes Bill 2021 to the Senate. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Customs Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021. Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall uh, get the minister to move the third reading. I move this bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Customs Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021. Customs Tariff Amendment 2022 Harmonised System Changes Bill 2021. Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. I was uh, wrapping up my remarks uh, earlier and, and just to uh, conclude by saying that uh, Labor does judge that these, uh, the, the bill presents changes that are necessary, proportionate, that protect the rights of Australian citizens, retain the uh, prohibition in the Hope Royal Commission on using foreign intelligence warrants to collect domestic communication and have uh, appropriate oversight uh, and particularly uh, is improved, this bill is improved by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Securities Review and recommendations. Uh, in closing, I would like to acknowledge uh, the chair of the PJCIS, Senator Patterson, uh, and thank uh, him and uh, Minister for Home Affairs Karen Andrews for the constructive way they have worked with the opposition uh, in a bipartisan fashion and in the national interest to see the changes that were uh, identified uh, by the Richardson Review and the gaps in our foreign intelligence communication warrant that Mr Richardson uh, recommended that this parliament addressed are being addressed to improve the safety and the security of our nation by this legislation, and uh, Labor will support it. Now we'll go to Senator Thorpe remotely. Senator Thorpe, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. This is yet another spectacular example of how the two major parties team up with each other to just ram through legislation in this chamber without respect for due process. 
The Liberal Party always say that they're a broad church. So broad, in fact, it seems they also take a big chunk of the Labor Party too. This bill was referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, also known as the Lib Lab Closed Shop, for a secret review and a final report by Friday 20th of August 2021. The PJCIS recommended the bill be passed. No surprises there. They've locked out every crossbencher and make these decisions on their own as the Labor Party and the Liberal Party do so often uh, without having any regard for anybody else in that place. This would be subject to two amendments requiring port reporting to PJCIS in certain circumstances and review of provisions after five years. The bill and explanatory memorandum were referred on an embargoed basis as the bill had not yet been tabled in Parliament. The committee agreed to the government's request to consider this legislation quickly and in private. Quickly and in private. The government wants to do business quickly and in private. The committee held a classified briefing on Monday the 23rd of August 2021 with officials from relevant agencies. Again, a closed shop. We all have responsibilities as senators in this place to represent the people that have put us there and the two parties, Labor and Liberal, have created this closed shop that disallows other senators to have input on behalf of their constituents. That's great for democracy, great. Closed shops, secrecy and privacy. Now the two old parties want to tell us that this legislation is for our own good and so absolutely important to the running of the country and the alleged protection of the Commonwealth that we are just meant to pass it without review. Like, this is serious legislation. How can we not be reviewing it and allowing other senators to have input and hear about those briefings so that we can make an informed decision and, and be part of the decision-making? But no the closed shop of Labor and Liberal. Maybe my colleagues in there have forgotten that this chamber is a house of review. This is absolutely disgusting and it's a contempt for democracy and should not be allowed. We will not be voting for this bill at this stage until you come back to this house to allow proper debate and scrutiny. That's what we're paid to do, right? We have tried to refer this bill to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee to allow for proper scrutiny by the parliament and the people. It's what we're meant to do. If you're scared of proper debate and scrutiny of laws, which I thought that's what we're meant to be doing, then maybe think about why you're here. If you just forming your own private club, then be open and transparent about that as well. I'm sure the people out there don't want closed shops in this place that doesn't allow us a say. Labor and Liberal, you should be ashamed of yourselves for teaming up like this and having a dirty little done deal and rushing it through the way you have. So until you actually live by your so-called values of democracy and you do your job as senators and not have closed shop committees, then we have to think about, well, why, why are you there? Why are you there? I know why I'm there. Come back here 
once you've considered why you're here, once you've considered how bad this is to the Australian people, for you all to lock out other senators to have a say and scrutinise this bill and take it through a review process, tell the Australian people that you too have joined forces and are blocking a review of a piece of legislation that's going to have an effect on ordinary Australians. So until that time, we can't support the bill because you're blocking democracy, you're not acting in good faith, you're not representing the people, and your PJCIS little fiefdom is wrong. And we shouldn't be operating like that as elected officials in a place where we're meant to be scrutinising legislation that affects the Australian population. So I think you need to have a good, hard look at yourselves, dig deep, and allow us to properly review this legislation to ensure free, prior and informed consent. Don't rant about free, prior and informed consent when you don't allow it to happen in this place. So open it up, let us review it and let's do the right thing. And I call on all senators with any integrity to do the same. Thank you. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make a contribution on the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do so on the legislation itself, as when the committee tabled its report into the bill last night, uh, I didn't have the opportunity to contribute, given the um, other disruptions to the program. Uh, I'm going to confine my contribution to a couple of key areas. Um, firstly, I want to discuss the conduct of the inquiry by the Intelligence and Security Committee, um, particularly in light of the comments made by Senator Thorpe. Uh, I'll do my best not to take the personal reflections too personally. Um, I also want to discuss the threat environment that Australia is operating in, which illustrates the need for this legislation. I will then um, speak about the key provisions of the bill, uh, the safeguards, uh, and if I have time, I'll talk about some of the case studies that are relevant to this bill, uh, and I'll also canvass the committee's recommendations. Um, firstly, to address the comments made by Senator Thorpe about the PJCIS um, conduct of this inquiry, um, it's certainly not the preference of the PJCIS to complete its inquiries in private, nor to do so quickly. Um, and it is rare for us to do so, although not without precedent for, do so, for us to do so. Uh, in 2018, when considering uh, ACES amendment bills, uh, we, we conducted a similarly um, swift inquiry. Uh, it, is all, it is usually the preference of the committee to conduct our inquiries in public and over a lengthy period of time, and indeed some of our inquiries are so lengthy that they go for many months, if not years. Um, however, there were unique circumstances in this bill which required the committee to do this, and why, after careful consideration, uh, the committee unanimously and on a bipartisan basis agreed to do so. Um, those unique circumstances firstly related to the sensitive nature of the legislation and the capability uh, concerned by the legislation, and secondly, the unusual operating environment that we're all in, um, which really should be self-evident uh, as a result of the COVID outbreak, uh, not just in New South Wales and Victoria, but also here in the ACT. Um, it is not possible to be absolutely certain about the sitting calendar going forward, and it would be unfortunate if the uh, parliament begun consideration of a sensitive bill like this but was not able to conclude our consideration of this bill due to a COVID outbreak. And so that necessitated a quick and private inquiry. I want to assure uh, all senators and indeed all members of parliament that despite the um, constrained circumstances the committee was operating under in the conduct of this review, uh, we nonetheless fulfilled all of our responsibilities to the parliament and through the parliament to the Australian people to re robustly test the rationale for this bill, the need for this bill, also to test the individual provisions of the bill, uh, to test the safeguards of the bill and ultimately to make uh, a number of recommendations about the bill, um, which I will briefly explain uh, now. 
the, the committee has made three recommendations, one of which is that the bill be passed. But um, prior to the bill being passed, we've also recommended that the mandatory procedure, um, as inserted by section 11C6, um, were it to be issued varied um, uh, by the Attorney-General, that the committee be notified of that um, immediately and then briefed on it. Um, I will come in a moment when I talk about the provisions of the bill as to why the mandatory um, procedures are important and why it's important that there is parliamentary scrutiny of those procedures. Uh, and I'm pleased that the government has accepted that amendment to ensure that the committee will be able to have uh, fulfil that scrutiny function on behalf of the parliament. The second recommendation that we made was that uh, the bill be uh, reviewed by the committee uh, not less than five years from when the bill uh, receives royal assent. Um, that does not mean that the committee has to wait for five years to commence the bill. It means that um, before the end of five years, the committee must consider uh, its uh, right to do a our inquiry. It is not uncommon for the committee to occasionally launch inquiries prior to that time. For example, the committee has two uh, statutory uh, reviews. It's currently undertaking into one of them is the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme that was due to commence later this year, but the committee decided to bring that forward and open it up now so that we could conduct our statutory responsibilities. And the same would apply uh, to this bill. It is uh, the wording is that not less than five years from when the bill receives royal assent, the committee may. Uh, conduct an inquiry, and I'm pleased the government has also accepted that recommendation. Uh, it's important that, with all uh, national security legislation, uh, including legislation of this nature, and it amends the um, surveillance, uh, the Tola Act, uh, that the Parliament have it it's not be a set and forget, that it not be passed and left on the books and never examined again in the future. And that's why the committee makes that recommendation, and it's why a significant workload of the committee is reviewing existing legislation that has been previously passed. Um, sometimes I reflect that. Uh, legislation in other areas of government which is not subject to that kind of robust re-examination and review would benefit from it. Frankly, uh, some of the economic regulation that this parliament agrees to is passed and then very rarely ever reviewed again, at least in a parliamentary sense. Uh, and frankly, I think it would benefit from it. Um, but it's quite often the case with national security legislation, as is appropriate, that it has a higher degree of scrutiny. Um, I want to turn now to the threat environment that we're operating in, which is indeed a very serious one. Uh, and it illustrates the need for legislation like this to ensure that our foreign intelligence collection capabilities are up to date, uh, that they keep pace with modern technology and that they're not unduly limited by technological change or legislative loopholes that are not functioning as intended. Uh, the Director General of ASIO, Mike Burgess, in his annual threat assessment earlier this year, spoke about the range of challenges that ASIO faces, including uh, and especially terrorism, which has been a very strong focus of ASIO since September 11. Uh, but in that uh, threat assessment, he also forecast that it won't be too far in the future, given current trends, that foreign interference, espionage and, and related offences will, will soon become uh, one of the largest uh, focuses of ASIO's work. And that is because we are operating in a very different security environment from the one we were operating in just five years ago. Uh, foreign interference uh, and espionage is at unprecedented levels, uh, higher than it has ever been, uh, including at the height of the Cold War. And Mr Burgess's predecessors, such as Duncan Lewis, have publicly confirmed um, that the overwhelming driver of that uh, is activity from and on behalf of China. Uh, in this environment, it's vital that all of our intelligence agencies, our intelligence community, are well equipped to counter those threats, and the collection of foreign intelligence helps them to do so in that task. It helps them to identify potential threats to uh, not just uh, Australia's lives, but also our way of life and, and the way in which foreign governments may, attempting, may attempt to intervene uh, in our democratic systems. Uh, it, it also enables them to keep uh, tabs, appropriate tabs, on Australians uh, who may be involved with foreign terrorist organisations. So it's really crucial, um, given that serious threat environment and given the rapid change in that threat environment, that uh, those powers be adequate and uh, for their intended purpose. And turning now to the um, schedules of the bill, I want to comment on the two key schedules of the bill and why they are necessary and why the committee in its examination of it agreed with the government's proposition that they were necessary. Um, 
from the committee's report, Schedule 1 is designed to restore the foreign communications warrant to its original scope and function. Uh, the removal of the strict prohibition is accompanied by robust safeguards to protect domestic communications in the same way that the original prohibition intended, and I'll come to more detail of that in a moment. Uh, secondly, Schedule 2 of the bill enables the Attorney General to issue foreign intelligence warrants to collect foreign intelligence on Australians in Australia who are acting for or on behalf of a foreign power, currently requesting a warrant for the purpose of collecting information concerning Australian citizen or permanent residence is prohibited. Um, Schedule 1, uh, which relates to Section 11C uh, of the Foreign Communications Warrant Amendment, um, currently authorises the interception of foreign communications for the purposes of obtaining foreign intelligence uh, about the matter specified in the warrant. The challenge that arises here is that the existing foreign communications warrant is that if uh, an agency inadvertently intercepts domestic communications, that is a communication that both starts and ends within Australia, um, that that is prohibited and a breach of the law, even when that in interception is entirely inadvertent or unavoidable. Um, now, that make, made sense in an uh, earlier technological era, era where it was very easy to identify where communications originated and where they concluded, and where it was very obvious uh, that they originated and concluded completely outside Australia and was captured within the scope of the legislation. Uh, because we had things such as reliable geographic uh, identifiers and indicators, such as a country code, a city code or an exchange code, uh, a foreign uh, telephone uh, number was readily identifiable as a foreign te a telephone number and was therefore permitted for this type of collection activity. Um, that's obviously radically changed due to uh, advances in technology and particularly internet-based communications and mobile applications. That means that it's extremely difficult at the point of interception for that communication to be clearly identified as being either foreign or domestic uh, because of the way in which uh, some of our technology companies choose to route the communications uh, of uh, their applications. And now, for our intelligence agencies to avoid breaching the TIA Act, um, they do not um, want to take any risks, understandably, breaching the law because they take compliance with the law very seriously uh, and therefore have to constrain uh, their collection of foreign intelligence to avoid even that inadvertent attempt. And that means essentially that the picture that Australia is getting of the world is severely constrained and does not have the full benefit of uh, what would be lawful, permitted collection if we're able to overcome this technical issue. So what the changes to the legislation uh, will do is allow intelligence agencies to intercept communications, including where the geographic location of the sender and recipients is unclear prior to its being intercepted, um, but that there will be robust safeguards to ensure that if there is any inadvertently collected uh, domestic communications, that they are quickly screened and quickly uh, destroyed. And that relates to the mandatory written procedure under section 11C6, where the Attorney General will mandate a procedure for the intelligence agencies for what to do when they uh, may inadvertently collect uh, Australian sourced communications and how they must treat that uh, and destroy it. And it's for that reason that's a very important mandatory procedure that the committee has asked that it have the opportunity to be notified and be briefed on that to consider it. Um, so that if we have any concerns, we have an opportunity to address it, and that's why it's important the government has agreed to that. The second schedule in the bill relates to Australians and permanent residents acting on or, or behalf of a foreign power. Um, currently, it's lawful for our intelligence agencies to uh, monitor uh, these people when they're operating overseas. If an Australian citizen is in the employ of a foreign government and acting on their behalf, it is lawful to intercept uh, their communications overseas. It's not lawful uh, for that purpose for them to be continue to be collected upon when they enter Australia. And that is a really arbitrary distinction. If you are an agent of a foreign government uh, and you're operating either in Australia or overseas, you pose uh, an equally serious threat to our national security. Arguably, someone operating on behalf of a foreign power within Australia may in fact pose a greater threat to Australia's national security because of their potential access to information here on shore. Um, but currently, legislation prevents our intelligence agencies from adequately collecting on those uh, Australians when they're on shore. Um, the legislation proposes that they should be able to do so. This responds to a recommendation from Dennis Richardson in his comprehensive uh, review of the intelligence community, and it is a sensible change that deals with a, a loophole. It is really an arbitrary distinction. Uh, if someone acts on behalf of a foreign power wherever they are in the world, it is of legitimate interest to Australia that they be able uh, to be um, uh, surveilled uh, appropriately. Um, 
the safeguards are, are very robust. Um, they include all the usual uh, oversights uh, that you would expect of intelligence powers, including the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, and through the IGES, ultimately the committee and ultimately the parliament. Uh, and uh, we intend to fulfil our responsibilities robustly in relation to that. I think it's worth drawing attention of senators and members uh, to an, an appendix in the committee's report that includes a table of comparative powers in Five Eyes countries and comparative uh, protections and safeguards. What that table illustrates is that the proposed uh, protections included in this legislation are equal to or greater than every one of our five eyes partners. Uh, Australia will have, in fact, much more robust uh, protections than, for example, uh, Canada will uh, or New Zealand will. And I think Australians can take comfort from the fact that, although we are permitting our agencies to engage in this important collection activity, that we will do so with really robust uh, safeguards uh, and adequate safeguards to ensure that the privacy, um, freedom and rights of Australians are protected as they should be by our intelligence uh, agencies. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to go into the case studies. Um, perhaps other senators will have the opportunity to do that. I just wanted to conclude by thanking all members of the PJCIS for the very collegiate way in which they engage in this in inquiry. As I alluded to in my opening remarks, it was challenging to complete the inquiry under the conditions uh, that uh, we were subject to, um, but committee members very diligently applied themselves to that task. I'd particularly like to recognise the deputy chair uh, of the committee, uh, Mr Anthony Byrne, and the two Labor shadow ministers uh, on the committee, Senator Keneally and Mr Dreyfus. Uh, they very diligently considered uh, this legislation in a bipartisan way and in a constructive way in the national interest. And I want to thank the government for anticipating the constraints that would be imposed upon the committee in its conduct of this inquiry uh, and, and its early engagement with the committee and with members of the committee to ensure that we were adequately informed, that we were comprehensively briefed so that we could form an informed opinion about this legislation and report in the required time frame for the parliament. Uh, this is an exemplar model of if we have to engage in, in, in inquiries in this way about how it should be engaged, and I commend the government from, for doing so, and I encourage them in future, if we ever face these circumstances again, to replicate the way in which this inquiry was conducted. We'll now go to Senator Patrick remotely. Senator Patrick, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting, Acting Deputy President. Um, I, I rise to uh, speak on this uh, bill. and. Uh, I just want to comment initially on the short notice that we've been dealing with here. So we basically have seen this uh, bill introduced into the House yesterday. Uh, at the same time, a PJCIS, a very short PJCIS uh, committee report has been handed down, and we find it in the Senate today. Uh, and in the Senate today, um, uh, we are also seeing a, <clears throat> a gag motion applied to it. <clears throat> and my uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my my great fear is we'll get to the committee stage, uh, or the fact that we won't get to the committee stage. And I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered uh, in relation to this bill. Now, I do want to point out something uh, that everyone who is watching ought to note, and that is that uh, when this was introduced in the House in the second reader, um, the minister basically said it's not possible to identify uh, why it's so urgent. Uh, now, I'm going to presume that there's an operation going on at the moment that requires uh, some some of these uh, restrictions to be to be overcome. Uh, an important national security uh, operation, no doubt. Uh, but to all of those who've been watching for this morning, you'll note that this really important national security bill was so important that it got put behind the electoral bills. Okay, so just understand where. The uh, coalition and the and the opposition sit on this. Uh, electoral reform bills must uh, go through the parliament uh, before the national urgent national security bills. I think that ought to be noted by everyone who's uh, watching. Look, I have uh, some concerns about this the, this bill. Um, you know, people will know I come from a defence background, um, and uh, you know, we're very supportive of our intelligence services, but. Um, you know, we know that they make mistakes. Uh, we look at uh, the IGES reporting every um, every year and see that mistakes are made. Uh, we, we've seen some shockers from the intelligence services in the past. Uh, you know, the, the spying on on the East Timorese. We've seen um, hotel uh, 
uh, raids for training purposes going going wrong, a whole range of different um, matters, uh, where the intelligence services haven't done as well as they uh, as they might, um, and that's the reason why we always need to have the right the right checks and balances in place. And I'll come to my amendment uh, that I uh, intend to move if we get to the committee stage. Um, otherwise, of course, I won't get to to, to speak to to it. Um, but I just want, where I want to go just uh, immediately, and maybe the, the minister will be able to address this um, uh, in her um, response uh, to uh, the, 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 the other second readers. Uh, Schedule 2 allows an, the intelligence services to spy on uh, an Australian. And uh, the circumstances or the, thresh the threshold for doing that, I'll just read from the bill. The Auditor General must not issue a warrant unless the Attorney General is satisfied that the person is or is reasonably suspected by the Director General of acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. Now, where we've seen those words used before is in relation to that, our foreign um, influence transparency scheme. And uh, if we uh, were to look at that scheme, I have just went and had a quick look through it and had a look at some of the people on that list who would meet the criteria, in my view, uh, uh, for a um, warrant to be issued. Uh, one of the persons on that list is one Tony Abbott. From, he's uh, registered from the 6th of, uh, of uh, October 2020 as an unpaid advisor to the UK Board of Trade. So I wonder, I wonder whether or not the uh, 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 the minister, perhaps at some stage, could answer whether or not whether or not uh, Mr. Abbott's going to be spied on by our intelligence services just because he's uh, 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 meets the criteria as being an unpaid advisor for the UK Board of Trade. Another name on that list is Kevin Rudd. I wonder if Senator Keneally has rung Mr. Rudd because if you go on the Foreign Transparency Register and have a look. There's quite a scathing letter that he's uh, uh, put on the register. Uh, he's a very, very unhappy person in relation to the requirement to be put on that list. I reckon he's going to be even more unhappy now that he understands that under this bill, he can also be spied upon by our intelligence services. I wonder if Senator Keneally has actually rung Mr Rudd and said, do you know this is happening? Uh, we're going to let this happen. We haven't really... Um, uh, dealt with this sort of issue because it's just been rushed through the parliament. The best one, this one I actually like, this is a good one. Um, there's another person on the list, Mr Alexander Downer. Okay, he's been on the list on the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme since the 27th of August 2020 as he supports the government of Gibraltar. Now, I think this is the one exception to this rule. I think there would be great irony in, the, in our intelligence services spying on... Uh, Alexander Downer, uh, and I'm, uh, after I finish this second read, I'm going to ring up Mr Bernard Caleri and just let him know, because that might actually make him feel just a little bit better as he's being persecuted for what happened um, or for allegedly revealing what Mr Downer did uh, back in 2004. So, uh, look, there are some genuine questions to be answered about that, because in my view, uh, these uh, gentlemen, these former prime ministers and foreign ministers actually fit the criteria uh, that would allow a warrant to be issued and spying and interception to occur. So uh, I'll leave uh, my commentary on the bill uh, uh, at that. I'll go now to the amendment that I uh, would uh, normally talk about in the committee stage, uh, and that is an amendment to the Intelligence Services Act. Every time we increase the powers of our intelligence services. And again, I don't necessarily uh, begrudge the, the, the intelligence services. I want our intelligence services to have the right tools available. But whenever you give anyone a, a power to be exercised in secret, you have to put the right checks and balances in place. Now, I just listened to Senator Patterson talking about the comparison between our five eyes colleagues. And I've I uh, looked at the PJCIS report um, and at the back of it uh, there's a table that talks about all of the um, 
current laws uh, used in all of the different Five Eyes jurisdictions. What Senator Patterson didn't indicate was that these other jurisdictions have parliamentary oversight of their intelligence services. That is a, a fundamental difference between us and the rest of our Five Eyes partners. And uh, so I invite um, uh, the, the government and indeed the opposition to support my amendment, which I've moved on several occasions, but particularly the Labor Party noting that their own party uh, uh, position is to have the PJCIS be able to, to uh, examine the operations of our intelligence services. That's in a, a private member's bill. Um, uh, by, uh, I think it's uh, Senator Wong has carriage, or it might actually be Senator McAllister, I'm not, uh, I can't recall, but um, that is the position of the Labor Party. And uh, uh, I find it mind boggling that every time I bring this particular amendment to uh, the chamber uh, to uh, effectively um, attach Labor policy to a government bill, the Labor Party reject it. So um, look, I'm gonna have another crack today and I'll have another crack on every intelligence bill that comes through. Uh, this is about making sure that whenever we give these powers, again, powers exercised in secret, that we have the right checks and balances in place. Um, uh, I think a, a few phone calls need to be made. Uh, perhaps uh, Senator Cash might ring uh, Tony Abbott and give him the bad news, and uh, Senator Keneally can ring uh, uh, Kevin Rudd, and, uh, uh, and I... I, I I don't care if anyone rings Alex da Alexander Downer or not, but I'll be ringing Bernard Killeary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Fawcett, remotely. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, to uh, want to speak to the foreign interference legislation, sorry, foreign intelligence legislation, Bill 2021. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the scope of the bill. I'd like to talk a bit about some of the comments from Senator Patrick and Thorpe about uh, the role of parliamentary oversight in the Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, which I'm a member of. I think it's important, given the comments that have been made about these being new powers, to actually look at the history of these powers and the role of our agencies in protecting Australians and our national interests um, have a look at what the schedules are actually outlining, uh, the problems that they're seeking to solve and what they are proposing, uh, the safeguards that are in place, uh, as well as some of the case studies uh, that are there. And lastly, I'll say a few words about Senator Patrick's uh, proposed amendments, which, as he points out, he brings up on a, a regular basis. Uh, I have time to be happy to address those. <clears throat> so as Colleagues indicated this bill uh, does amend the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act of 1979 and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act of 1979, and it's looking to address gaps that have arisen uh, in our foreign intelligence warrant framework. Uh, foreign intelligence uh, means the intelligence about the capabilities, the intentions or capabilities of people or organisations outside of Australia, and that can include uh, terrorist organisations, or it can include state actors. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, at this point in time uh, concerns that have been raised by the Director General of ASIO, who points out that uh, foreign activities, foreign state activities in Australia are uh, at a level that we haven't seen since the Cold War. So this is not some hypothetical threat uh, that Australia is facing. Uh, it's a threat that is very real, and he's spoken in his annual threat assessments uh, to that, as well as publicly through the uh, PJCIS committee hearings process on several occasions. Likewise, uh, we see terror groups uh, that continue to be active. Uh, we all hoped that after actions, after the Bali bombings and some of the other things that uh, those global networks reaching out that impacted Australians, that we had seen those wind down to the point where they would not be a risk to Australia. But what we do see in the plots that are uncovered by our intelligence agencies and our law enforcement agencies is that Australians, often young Australians, are influenced 
by communications from people overseas uh, to motivate them to be engaged in acts of terror. Uh, and so the ability to intercept those communications uh, is an important part of protecting Australia uh, and Australia's national interests. So <clears throat> it's important to understand when people talk about the fact that these are new bill or new powers, that in actual fact, the powers have been around for some time. The powers uh, actually go back uh, to um, earlier uh, acts and particularly to the Hope Royal Commission, uh, where the need for these powers was identified. And so what's changed is not the need for the powers, the fact that we are seeking to give our agencies the ability under appropriate supervision to monitor, uh, intercept and understand what has been communicated by a foreign entity uh, that affects Australians and Australia's interests. But it's the technology that has changed. Um, many people may know my, my background professionally before this place was as an experimental test pilot for the military. And so I've seen that frequently the mission doesn't change, the principles don't change, but as technology changes, both the platforms we use and the regulations and rules around their use have to adapt, have to be modified uh, to make sure that we are on at least an even footing, if not having an edge over our adversaries. And so what this bill is seeking to do is to recognise the fact that since those powers were first introduced, we have moved from the days of landlines and faxes where it was very easy to trace and identify uh, whether a call or a communication was coming from overseas or whether it was purely between two domestic players to the days of smartphones and the internet, where particularly the overtop applications mean that it is possible for people, uh, both organised crime, as we've seen recently with the, the large sting that Australia was involved with of organised crime around the world using encrypted devices. Uh, and if organised crime can do it, then it's very clear that state actors uh, representing foreign governments as well as terrorist groups have access to and in fact often develop some of the same technology and capabilities. And so it's important that our laws and regulations keep up with the changing technology so that the agencies can keep doing the role that they have had legally and done effectively uh, for some time. So it's important to go back and understand that uh, in 1986, or the Intelligence and Security Act of 1986, uh, was amended in response to a recommendation of the Royal Commission onto Australia's Security and Intelligence Agencies, and that was known as the Hope, uh, the Second Hope Royal Commission. And he said that he's satisfied that Australia has a need to collect foreign intelligence, which relates to its national security and other national interests. Considerations of the national interests, national independence, costs and practical difficulties have led me to conclude it would be highly advantageous for Australia to be able to collect foreign intelligence within its own territory where this is possible. And so what Justice Hope, after his review, highlighted, uh, has been backed up again by Mr Dennis Richardson in his more recent review uh, around the powers that our agencies have, is that that is a valid need for our agencies. It's a valid power. And so our laws and regulations need to change with technology so that those capabilities are not reduced as technology changes. So. My last comment before I go to the details of the actual bill um, <clears throat> is to talk about the role of the Parliament in the PJCIS. Uh, Senator Thorpe before was calling for this to be referred uh, for a broader review. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've noted in my time in this place is that there are many issues uh, dealing with national security where transparency is possible and it should be there. And I note Senator Patrick's uh, long campaign around FOIs and transparency, and, and uh, I think in principle he is absolutely correct that where it is possible, there should be transparency. That's the very essence of a plural democracy where government is accountable to the people. But as Senator Patrick and others who've been involved in our defence forces and law enforcement and intelligence agencies know, 
There are also areas where it's appropriate for the government uh, and its agencies to have information which is not made public. And so one of the ways that a balance has been struck uh, through the Intelligence Services Act to have oversight by the Australian people through its parliament uh, is to create a committee within the parliament where the members are able to be briefed with classified information and as people have recognised and as I've stated previously, uh, it does have some limitations. But those limitations don't prevent agencies being able to brief the committee with classified information that go to uh, past operations, go to the nature of current threats and examples of the kind of harm that would come to Australia if these uh, provisions weren't updated so that the powers that were envisaged by the Hope Royal Commission uh, could continue. And so I think it's important to understand that having a bipartisan committee such as the PJCIS that is able to work on behalf of the parliament and by extension on behalf of the Australian people, it gives us the ability to hear information that can't be made public, but to then balance that against the, the rights of Australians uh, to have their freedom of expression, freedom of association, all the things that characterise an open and plural society, but at the same time giving the agencies the powers that they need. So the committee uh, has itself raised various issues with the government in terms of how we could improve the work of the committee, uh, but tacking amendments onto another piece of legislation I don't believe is the appropriate way uh, to raise those issues, although I commend Senator Patrick for his uh, tenacity in continuing to look to uh, bring about some of those reforms, but this is not the appropriate method. So this bill, as uh, former speakers have highlighted, uh, is all about highlighting the fact that at the moment uh, the law prohibits our agencies from intercepting domestic communications. So they're communications that start and end within Australia. Uh, previous speakers have outlined the problem. As technology has moved on, it has become incredibly difficult, in fact, impossible in, in many cases, to identify where the originator or receiver of information physically are. Because the agencies are governed by the rule of law, as opposed to some totalitarian regimes where they, they operate under the rule of law, so they, they rule uh, by law and impose law on people, uh, our agencies are diligent, uh, overseen by the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and the PJCIS to make sure they follow the law and where they don't inadvertently, uh, then investigations and corrective measures are put in place. But here, a Section 11 warrant uh, means that they can't use one of those when there's a possibility that it could be two domestic parties. And so that has a problem that we don't know. Uh, in the example of a terrorist group, uh, we don't know whether uh, communication is coming from overseas to people to incite, to equip, to enable, uh, to give them technical details as to how to conduct a terrorist activity, uh, or indeed from a foreign power. Uh, soliciting information or seeking to influence, blackmail, extract uh, information from an Australian citizen. And so where it's reasonably suspected, uh, these changes give the ability for the agencies uh, to seek a warrant uh, with a set of guidelines that will actually demonstrate how they will protect Australian citizens and where communication is legitimately domestic to domestic, uh, how they will not be able to use those. It also addresses a gap in the area where an Australian citizen who is overseas, uh, who agencies can monitor in terms of their engagement with a foreign power, if that person comes back to Australia, it seems nonsensical that all of a sudden the ability for uh, the agencies to do their job and protect Australians and Australia's interests should cease because the person has changed location. Uh, and so it changes uh, the laws to provide an ability for that uh, to occur. The things that don't change, though, uh, ASIO is still responsible for obtaining foreign intelligence inside Australia, and it's the only agency that can apply for or obtain foreign intelligence warrants, including 
Section 11C warrants. Section 11C warrants don't allow for the bulk collection of foreign communications. They don't now and they won't into the future. And the law requires that the collection of foreign intelligence under 11C warrants has to be highly targeted, and this will not change. The Act and these amendments do not permit indiscriminate collection. I think it's an important point for people to know. As I said, the history of these foreign communication warrants have been a critical part of our foreign intelligence framework for more than 20 years, originally enacted uh, in 2000. The warrants have to be issued by the Attorney General at the request of the Director General of Security and on the advice of the Minister for Defence or the Minister for Foreign Affairs. So the circumstances in which these warrants can be exercised, the conditions that apply to them are approved by the Attorney General and they remain under the stringent oversight of IGES. The only time that the agencies could actually use a domestic domestic um, if, if they covered a piece of communication turned out to be between two Australian citizens, is in the example where somebody's life is at risk, they can report that to IGES, but in all other circumstances, any inadvertent collection that's not foreign intelligence related does need to be destroyed. Importantly, the Section 11C warrants are only available where service or device-based warrants under Sections 11A or 11B would be ineffective. So these are a warrant of last resort. In concluding my remarks, Madam Acting Deputy President, I just want to highlight these are not new powers. They're adapting the law so that powers remain effective in the light of new technology. The balance that is provided by oversight, by the authorisation process, will continue to be effective, and it is in Australia's national interest for this legislation to pass. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator McKim. Well, thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. And uh, here we go again. The major parties jamming legislation through this place without adequate scrutiny, which fundamentally erodes rights and freedoms from Australian citizens and other people who live in and visit our country. And I want to be clear about how we find ourselves here yet again today. Australia's intelligence and security apparatus decides that it wants more powers. Now, let's be frank, they always want more powers. It's in their very nature to want more powers. For more insight into this, just read two speeches from probably Australia's most powerful and influential public servant, the Secretary of the Home Affairs Department, Mr Michael Pizzullo. Check out his Hobbit speech from 2017 and check out what I call his Pizzullo's Panopticon speech from last year. They'll tell you everything you need to know about the eternal grasping for yet more surveillance and control powers that our security and intelligence agencies engage in. So they decide they want more powers and they go to the government. And the government says, yes, of course, you can have any more powers you want, because it plays well for us politically. We'll use the threat of terrorists to scare voters and will help us win the next election, because frightened people don't want to change government. So then the legislation comes to Cabinet, it's tabled in the Parliament, and off it goes into the closed shop of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on intelligence and security, where only the two major party groups in this place are represented. The crossbench, except in exceptional circumstances, is locked out of any inquiry the PJCIS conducts. The inquiry, as usual, gets out the rasp and rasps off a couple of the absolutely roughest edges of the legislation leaving the bulk of the new powers and functions completely intact. The legislation then passes the other place with both government and opposition support and then comes up to the Senate. The crossbench attempts to refer the legislation for a proper public thorough Senate inquiry. This is refused, of course, by the major party duopoly. 
The bill is then passed through the Senate with only the Australian Greens and sometimes other crossbench senators opposing. Rinse and repeat, and off we go again. The intelligence agencies think they deserve more powers, and the cycle begins over. Colleagues, this is how fascism starts. A relentless, creeping frog march down the dark path to a police state, a surveillance state, towards authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and ultimately to fascism. Don't say you weren't warned, because you have been warned repeatedly. Now, we hear a lot, and we've heard a lot in this debate, about how there are all these safeguards around warrants that are actually ultimately issued by the Attorney General. Well, given the Attorney General's decision, or I should say the former Attorney General's decision, to prosecute Bernard Caleri and Witness K, Australian patriots who we should be thanking rather than prosecuting, to authorise those prosecutions, it can hardly be said to comfort Australians that the Attorney General ultimately has signed off powers on the relevant warrants. Now, let's not forget that of the hundreds of pieces of uh, counter-terror and anti-terror legislation that have passed through state, territory and Commonwealth parliaments in this country in the last two decades, and I do mean hundreds of pieces, they are sold to the Australian people as necessary to protect us from the scourge of terrorism. Then those legislation, those pieces of legislation pass, and what happens? That's right. They are used for other purposes than which they were sold to us. For, for example, the metadata retention laws opposed and campaigned against strongly by the Australian Greens, sold to the Australian people as necessary to protect us from terrorists. Those laws now enable local governments in Australia without a warrant to use people's metadata to prosecute them for having unregistered dogs. I mean, I've heard of scope creep, but that is on another level. These laws effectively allow some of Australia's intelligence and security agencies in some circumstances to spy on Australians in ways that are currently unlawful. They should not be jammed through this Senate without a proper, thorough, rigorous and public inquiry. Yet here we find ourselves today with the major party duopoly, the Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics, once again coming together to remove fundamental rights and freedoms from the Australian people. That is why we need a Charter of Rights in this country. Australia is the only liberal democracy in the world that does not have some form of Charter or Bill of Rights, whether that be legislatively enshrined or constitutionally enshrined. Now, such a Charter or Bill of Rights would not mean that bills like this could not pass, and it would not mean that intelligence agencies and security agencies could not have the powers that they need to a reasonable level to keep people safe. But what it would mean is that there would be extra scrutiny, extra accountability, and perhaps a check on this relentless creeping frog march that we are engaged in as a country. As a country. This is a dangerous, dangerous path that we are on. And at some stage, we are going to need to pause, we're going to need to take breath, and we're going to need to reevaluate this direction. Because if we don't, the danger is that we will end up in 
an authoritarian, totalitarian, and horrendously and potentially a fascist state. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Abetz, remotely. Time stands still for no one, nor does technological advancement. In each of our lives, we've witnessed technological advancements people would not have dreamt of a generation ago. We are all the beneficiaries of these advances. They have been of untold good, from communications to farming to medical procedures, all aspects of our lives are impacted and for the good. Just as with everything us humans have developed, we can use our advances for good or for bad, which brings us to this bill, which rejoices in the name of the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill, which amends the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979 and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act of 19. 79, just in case people were wondering. The simple fact is our legislative framework has not kept pace, allowing those who would seek to do Australia harm a potential advantage which needs to be closed as a matter of urgency. I therefore would urge all honourable senators to pass this bill as soon as possible. This bill addresses two critical gaps in our foreign intelligence collection framework, gaps that need to be removed. First of all, the reforms will update the foreign communications warrant provisions in the Telecommunications Interception Access Act to reflect changes in communications technologies. Intelligence agencies will be able to intercept a communication to determine whether the communication is a foreign communication. Secondly, the bill allows the collection of foreign intelligence on Australians in Australia who are acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. These amendments will close the current legislative gap where foreign intelligence can be collected on an Australian working for a foreign power offshore, but the same intelligence cannot be collected under a warrant on that Australian onshore. An Australian serving the interests of a foreign government remains an agent of a foreign power, whether they are onshore or offshore. The reforms include robust oversight and safeguards, which I note our Green friends studiously avoid mentioning. The reforms will help intelligence agencies protect Australians, they will make it easier to uncover terrorist plots and other serious threats to Australia's national interests. Without the proposed changes, gaps in foreign intelligence collection will continue to grow and Australia will not have visibility of possible threats creating such risks. These amendments are required urgently. Each day they are not in place risks our agencies missing critical foreign intelligence about threats to Australia and Australians. The plugging of these gaps is urgent and is necessary to be done now. While the work continues on the more substantial reforms which have also been identified. In an ideal world, legislation of this nature would, of course, not be necessary. There would be no attempts at sabotaging our national interest or terrorism or cyber attacks. But we live in a flawed world where elements with malevolence seek to do us harm. It Order, is one Senator of the... Senator Abetz, you will be in continuation when debate resumes at being 1.30 p.m. I will move to two-minute statements. Senator Billick, remotely. Thank you very much. Morrison's government's growing list of scandals highlights the need for a powerful national anti-corruption commission. So far, we've had robo-debt, sports rorts, car park rorts, water rorts, the Paladin contract, the au pair scandal, forgery of documents, the Leppington Triangle deal, the AWU raid, tip-off and cover-up, and the list just goes on and on. 
Mr Morrison was dragged kicking and screaming to announcing the, the establishment of an anti-corruption commission, and almost 1,000 days later, he's yet to deliver on his promise. And even if he does deliver, the proposed body will be so weak as to be ineffective. The Morrison government's proposed anti-corruption watchdog cannot initiate its own inquiries and cannot hold public meetings. Its threshold for an investigation, suspicion of a criminal offence, is way, way too high. And the body won't be able to investigate the government's numerous past scandals. Legal experts have described it as a body designed not to expose scandals, but to cover them up. The government's foot dragging on establishing even a weak and ineffective body begs the question, what have they got to hide? The answer, of course, is in the long list of scandals I mentioned earlier, and for all we know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Every state and territory in Australia has an anti-corruption commission. That just leaves the Commonwealth Government as the only jurisdiction without a body dedicated to uncovering and stamping out corruption by public officials. Australians' trust in government is at an all-time low, and Labor intends to restore that trust. Establishing a powerful National Anti-Corruption Commission, a tough cop on the beat, is an important first step, and that's what an Albanese Labor government will do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Macdonald, remotely. I rise to highlight the successful collaboration between the agricultural industry and the Morrison government to implement the new agricultural visa announced with much fanfare this week. This visa has been welcomed by every major agricultural body in the country, but for some reason, Labor has still managed to criticise it. They don't understand agriculture and they only make a token nod to the sector when there's an election coming. This negativity only serves to distract from the lack of urgency shown by the Queensland Labor government in speeding up its processing of some of the 25,000 Pacific Islanders with visas pre-approved by the federal government. Growcom reports that Queensland is still 9,000 workers short and the painfully slow processing of Pacific Islanders resulted in $42 million worth of crops, Queensland crops, being left to rot. In Queensland, only six properties are permitted to facilitate on-farm quarantining at any time. Even then, other farmers have gone to some great expense to set up on-farm quarantine, and the Queensland government has knocked them back. Farmers have been crying out for Anastasia Palaszczuk to speed things up and investigate a regional quarantine centre in North Queensland, which would be especially helpful for smaller producers are much needed considering hotel quarantine places in Brisbane and Cairns are at capacity. State LNP member for Burdekin, Dale Lars, must be congratulated for being especially active in this endeavour, and he's identified a mining camp southwest of Mackay that's fully capable of taking scores quarantining workers at this time. The new visa expands the scope of workers to be included, to include skilled and qualified people to undertake more technical jobs. This means we can bring in not only labourers, but also people qualified in heavy machinery operation, animal husbandry, logistics management of stock works. I congratulate Agricultural Minister David Littleproud. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Steelejohn, remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Our 20-year war on Afghanistan is coming to a close, and the reality on the ground is that the country is now at the mercy of the Taliban. Australia ended this war at the behest of the United States, not at the result, as a result of any decision made by the Australian Parliament. The Australian Greens call on the government to apologise to the people of Afghanistan for contributing to the destabilisation of their country. The government also bears responsibility for putting and keeping Australian service personnel in harm's way without any clearly defined mission goals. We thank Australian service personnel for their service and call on the government to apologise to them for continuing a war without clear objectives. We must also note that there are credible allegations of war crimes committed by Australian Special Forces that have caused immeasurable grief to families and communities, uh, uh, as well as to the victims themselves. There is significant damage to the integrity and reputation of our Defence Forces because of this. 
The Australian Greens call on the government to rethink our alliance with the United States, a pave an independent foreign policy and a defence policy for Australia that does not bind us to taking military action alongside powerful and aggressive states. This parliament must now pass war powers legislation, laws which will require each member of parliament to vote uh, before any commitment uh, to send Australian forces to war is taken. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator McCarthy remotely. Madam Acting Deputy President, as the Chair of the First Nations Caucus Committee, I'd like to bring to the Senate our concerns for the First Nations communities in Western New South Wales who are facing a COVID nightmare. Deputy Premier John Barillaro this morning said regional New South Wales was sitting on a knife edge, a tinder box waiting to explode. In December, Scott Morrison stood up and said First Nations people were clearly defined as a vulnerable community. The Prime Minister said this is a key issue to be addressed in the strategy and in the rollout plans. Well, what empty rhetoric that's turned out to be. Unsurprisingly, as of Wednesday, there have been 448 confirmed COVID-19 infections in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in New South Wales since mid-June. Just 6.3% of the Aboriginal population in Western New South Wales is fully vaccinated, compared to 26% of the non-Indigenous population in the region. There is fear, anger and confusion. In Wilcannia, where as of yesterday, 44 people had tested positive, community members are now facing a food crisis. The snap closure of the town's only grocery store due to COVID deep cleaning is seeing people go hungry. About 200 kilometres away from the nearest big community, Broken Hill, and are relying on food donations to get fed. I would certainly like to acknowledge the work of First Nations journalists, particularly NITV, for keeping us informed, the whole of the country informed, about the people in Western New South Wales. Later's First Nations Caucus Committee has been trying to get answers from the Morrison-Joyce government on this crisis for months. The Commonwealth and New South Wales governments are not managing the challenges of rising infections and hospitalisations. This needs to change, change urgently. Last week, Labor outlined the need for a nationally consistent plan to address the unfolding First Nations COVID crisis. Order, Senator McCarthy. Senator Roberts, remotely. Senator Roberts is not online at the moment. We'll move to Senator Bragg. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to make some remarks about the 50th anniversary of the election uh, to this place of Neville Bonner, who was the first Indigenous person to be, become uh, a federal parliamentarian. Um, Bonner became involved uh, with politics from the 1967 referendum, which Harold Holt uh, conducted and successfully, uh, and he was handing out how to vote cards uh, on referendum day uh, when he was asked uh, by Bill Hayden uh, why he was helping out with the Liberals. And I think that annoyed him, and so he subsequently decided that he would become a Liberal parliamentarian. Uh, good on him. Uh, he was a great historical figure, and he served in the Senate for 12 years. Now, he said in his first speech that uh, less than 200 years ago came the white man. My people were shot, poisoned, hanged, broken in spirit. They became refugees in their own land. But it is a history, and we take care now of the present and look to the future. I think that is a very fine sentiment as we reflect upon the 50th anniversary of Bonner's contribution. Um, I think to their great credit, an organisation called Uphold and Recognise worked with Bonner's family to produce a video they released last week, which was funded by uh, Mr Greg O'Neill of the La Trobe uh, Financial Foundation, which is a very good uh, summary of uh, Bonner's political contributions. Uh, finally, I wanted to uh, thank uh, everyone involved, I think Ben Morton, Noel Marino and some other people in the government for putting in place a statue of Bonner that will be unveiled next year, which is very overdue. Uh, the journalist from the City Morning Herald, Rob Harris, has been running a campaign on this since it emerged that there were more statues of dogs than there are of women and Indigenous people in Canberra. So uh, we look forward to seeing uh, the statue of Bonner, and I hope that in the future we can also see people like Charles Perkins and Eddie Marbo recognised here in Canberra. Thank you, Senator Bragg. I'm going to go back to Senator Roberts remotely. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Morrison-Joyce government has yet again dragged Australia into the misguided and dangerous UN parallel universe. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has signed Australia up to a communique from the UN Human Rights Council that endorses radical intersectional gender theory. This is the theory that gender is a social construct and one's decision about gender is not based on biology, it's based on feelings. There is no agreement in Australia that gender is a social construct. There is no agreement that minors should be able to nominate their gender based on self-identification alone. Worldwide, the momentum is shifting back the other way, towards greater caution, especially on the use of experimental treatments and irreversible surgeries. The youngest child in Australia to undergo transition surgery, in this case, a double mastectomy, was 15 years old. How can a child of 15 know their mind? The vast majority of minors sort out their gender identities by adolescence. Gender fluidity is easily dispensed as nonsense. If gender is fluid, then no one can be trapped in the wrong body because fluidity dictates that person's views of their gender could change with their next mood. One Nation agrees that pink and blue do not define gender and biology need not con confine us to traditional gender norms. Nonetheless, children growing up must have certainties to hang on to. Telling children there is a plethora of genders they can pick from exacerbates confusion and anxiety and weakens their, self, their sense of self. I was surprised to learn that Australia has an international ambassador for gender equality employed to advance these agendas. The decision by Minister Payne was not an aberration. It was deliberate government policy. Our supposedly Christian Prime Minister and this entire parliament is out of touch with everyday Australians. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and we want our child, our children, protected from UN lunatics. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Griff from Whiteley. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. My office recently met with Professor Helena Teed, the Director of Monash University's Centre for Health Research and Implementation. Professor Teed has an impressive resume in women's health research. She currently leads a team of 150 staff and students which focus on women's and children's health, and her passion is translating evidence in order to produce better health income outcomes. There is a lot of alignment between the work of Professor Teague and the health issues I have sought to advance during my time in the Senate. Issues such as IVF, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and alcohol labelling, improved access to cancer clinical trials, data transparency and using data better to improve health outcomes. So I take great interest in what she is now proposing, a National Institute of Women's Public Health and Wellbeing. This institute would harness existing funding and existing data and leverage the knowledge and expertise across researchers, health services, the community and women themselves. It would deliver a holistic approach to women's health and wellbeing across all life stages. Now the aim is to work in partnership to deliver co-designed research training and healthcare improvement. The National Institute would be led by women, working for women and delivered by women. The proposal aligns very much with the 10-year National Preventative Health Strategy the Federal Government is currently developing also perfectly fits with the stated aims of the National Women's Health Strategy 2020 to 2030. Now that strategy also recognises the importance of collaboration and cooperation between governments, the health sector, community and industry organisations, communities and women themselves. If we want to improve health outcomes, we need to move with this proposal. Now, I understand government is currently looking at this, and I sincerely hope it will give it serious consideration. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Green remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, over the last couple of uh, days, we've seen a concerted effort from Scott Morrison uh, to push off blame for this um, uh, vaccine, back, bungled vaccine rollout. Over the last couple of days, we've seen an attempt from Scott Morrison to blame Queenslanders for his slow rollout, and it's just not on. Queenslanders have done everything that has been asked of them, and because of Scott Morrison's failures, we now have a slow vaccine rollout that is not keeping up with the lockdowns created by the lack of national quarantine facilities. This is absolutely unacceptable from our Prime Minister. He is trying to blame Queenslanders when in fact he is the one to blame himself. But this is very on brand for our Prime Minister. 
Uh, he doesn't hold a hose. It's a state's issue. Um, it's not his job. These are the things that he has told people throughout this crisis. What we've learned throughout this crisis is that we have a prime minister who is a mediocre middle management marketing man who doesn't care about Queensland, but only cares about himself. Now, today we've seen the stark difference in two leaders of Queensland. We've got Scott Morrison, who refuses to do his job and has uh, refused to build national quarantine facilities. And on the other hand, we've got Anastasia Palaszczuk, who is building a quarantine facility, who is going ahead to build the well camp facility in Toowoomba because Scott Morrison refused to do his job. That's what Queenslanders want to see. They want to see leaders that get stuff done. Instead, we've got a Prime Minister who just keeps stuffing up. It is time for Queenslanders to see this man for who he is, an absolute imposter who has led us down a path of being behind the rest of the world. We should be opening up already, but we're not because Scott Morrison didn't do his job. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. All of you who know me know that I'm not sure about the reality that sometimes Australia has to go to war. Sometimes we have to take hard measures to protect our country and put our national security first. I understand that, and I understand that that was the thinking when we first declared war on Afghanistan. But just because I stand by those values doesn't mean I won't ask questions about what happened in those 20 years Australian soldiers spent in Afghanistan. It doesn't mean we shouldn't look at our political and military leadership and ask them why they made the decisions they did and whether they got the results that they promised that they would deliver. That's what my motion, which passed the Senate today, will do. This is a chance for the Senate to take a good hard look at what Australia was doing in Afghanistan, what we could have done better and what we did well. Because while there's a lot, a lot, of us, a lot for us to be proud of, it's clear that we didn't get an outcome that any of us wanted in Afghanistan. No one wanted to see the Taliban come rushing back into Kabul. No one wanted to see thousands of people flee the country with a draw of coalition troops. And the people who are most disappointed are the people who fought in that war. If those soldiers who gave everything to protect a country that's now crumbling to pieces minutes after they left, they deserve a chance to say their piece. Look at what's gone on and tell us what we need to do better in the future. I'd like to thank everyone, Labor, the government, the Greens and the Crossbench for supporting my motion today. And I look very, very forward to working with you all to give these soldiers and the millions of Australians and Afghanis that want answers to these many questions that have come and come forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Betts remotely. The Victorian parliamentary inquiry into the iCook affair has revealed more disturbing evidence inviting a conclusion that the food processing firm iCook was illegally closed by the Victorian government in a conspiracy with Dandenong City Council. The purpose being to remove iCook as a commercial competitor to Community Chef, a heavily loss-making business set up by the Victorian government and owned by local councils. Significantly, Community Chef's establishment in 2009 relied heavily on a $9 million grant from the Federal Department of Infrastructure, a bizarre way for the Commonwealth to provide such funding. The relevant ministers at the time were Mr Albanese and Mr Andrews. Recently, I asked the Department of Infrastructure for all documents relevant to this $9 million grant. The department replied that the relevant documentation held by the department cannot be disclosed to any other party without prior consent in writing. Why this secrecy? Who is this unnamed party or parties? I call on him or them to urgently provide this consent. Today I'm writing to Mr Albanese in the event that he is one of these unnamed parties, asking him to consent to the release of these documents. Given the serious criminal and corruption implications of the evidence emerging in Victoria, it is imperative that full transparency exists. I call on the Labor leader to support my request so that the people of Australia can be confident that the Commonwealth was not involved in this apparent conspiracy. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Patrick, remotely. 
Thank you, Madam um, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to talk about parliamentary process, bad parliamentary process. The Foreign Intelligence Legislative Amendment Bill 2021 was introduced to the House of Representatives only yesterday, 25 August. Five days earlier, on 20th of August, the draft bill had been referred by the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, Karen Andrews MP, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. The Minister made no public statement. The PJCIS issued no media release. That committee of Coalition and Labor MPs conducted a secret, pro forma inquiry that lasted just five days. No submissions were sought and just one meeting was held, a secret briefing with the intelligence agencies. Yesterday, the PJCIS rubber, uh, tabled its rubber stamp report and the Coalition and Labor opposition voted the bill through the House of Representatives with the briefest of debates. The explanatory memorandum was only tabled after the debate. It's worth noting the subsequent comments of the independent member for Indi, Dr Haynes, who yesterday evening said, and I quote, this bill was introduced this morning. It has just gone through the House this evening. Members of the crossbench were not given any information about this bill. We did not get an explanatory memorandum. We've had no opportunity to consider this. Clearly the opposition uh, has. This is an urgent bill, according to the speeches that I've just heard late into the evening, just now. And I want to make it very clear that as a member of parliament, I've had no opportunity to consider it at all. The bill is now uh, before the Senate, rushed in, and it will be rushed out. National security is no reason for the Senate to abandon its responsibilities. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to shed a little light on what's been described as, in the AFR as the worst IPO of the decade. The Newix IPO released rivers of gold to those in the know, namely Macquarie Bank, $565 million. Uh, Newix founder Tony Castagna, $80 million, and Rod Vaudry, the former Newix CEO, $28 million. But it devastated many retail investors as $3 billion was wiped off the market capitalisation. Now Newix is under ASIC, AFP and criminal investigations. Newix CFO Stephen Doyle is facing insider trading charges, as well as alleged breaches of the corporation's law in relation to financial disclosures in the prospectus. Several senior staff have left in the midst of chaos and confusion. This coming Monday, Newick's preliminary, not final, results will be released on the last day of the reporting season. And I'm advised that on the same day, next Monday, the 30th of August 2021, the current escrow arrangement surrounding 37.9 per cent of Newick's shares will end. It's 120 million shares, currently worth over $320 million. That event will allow the transfer of millions of dollars in shares to those who are currently under investigation for this catastrophe. I recommend, in the strongest term possible, that ASIC act to freeze this transfer of shares. It's only prudent to wait until the investigations reach their natural conclusion before allowing Macquarie Bank Tony Castagna, sacked CFO Stephen Doyle and the Newick CEO to cash out their shares. The choice by ASIC to act or roll over sends an important message to others who would model Newick's IPO behaviours. ASIC must be proactive and use its considerable powers, such as those it holds under uh, Section 1323 of the Act, to protect investors in Newix. They cannot surely let those with serious questions walk away from this scandal with the loot. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Waters remotely. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy uh, President. Today I'd like to pay tribute to Rosalind Anderson long-term chair of the National Women's Alliance Economic Security for Women, who sadly passed away suddenly on the 15th of August 2021. I had the pleasure and honour of working with Rosalind for many years in my role as co-convener of the Parliamentary Friends of Women. Yeah, yes, that's quite the oh, look, Senator Abetz keeps so, objecting on my two-minute statement. I'll let them know that I... Um, the um, button, order, Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Abetz, we'll the clock may stopped, not be on please. mute. Uh, Senator Waters, please continue. Thank you. Impeccable timing. Um, for two decades, Rosalind championed women's economic security and leadership through collaborations with frontline researchers and key decision makers. As an educator, Rosalind was a passionate advocate 
uh, for education as a key factor in girls achieving long-term financial confidence. She appeared before countless Senate inquiries, contributed to papers and mentored many young women. Throughout it all, Rosalind remained kind, enthusiastic and encouraging, a truly buoyant force for change. She lifted and supported others, she listened eagerly to new ideas and she never backed away from a challenge. Rosalind's work helped to highlight persistent and significant the gender pay gap, skewed superannuation levels, the workforce participation impacts of unaffordable childcare and inflexible working hours, low wages in female-dominated industries, lack of women in leadership roles and society's failure to properly value unpaid care work. The rigorous analysis done by ES4W has picked those issues on the agenda. Last week, the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency confirmed that the gender pay gap in Australia has gone backwards over the past six months. Closing that gap is unfinished business, and as Rosalind would, uh, I will keep working until we get it done. My condolences go out to Rosalind's husband, Trevor, and daughter, Nikki, and to all of her colleagues at Economic Security for Women. Rosalind will be greatly missed, but never forgotten. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I rise today to speak about the recently announced, this week in fact, by my uh, colleague, Minister David Littleproud, the agriculture visa. And uh, I congratulate him and everyone who has worked on this. Uh, and this is to be in place by the 30th of September. Now, this visa is something that has been a long-held CLP policy and something that I have advocated for since coming to this place. Uh, we in the Northern Territory rely heavily on seasonal workers and struggle to get agricultural workers. We have, uh, have used the Pacific Labor Solution and will continue to do so. It is a very, very important part of our seasonal workforce. But this visa will give us much more flexibility for our farmers and producers who cannot get the skilled Australian labour that they need. Because we, on this side, we care about agriculture. We look after our farmers and our producers and those in the regions. While those on the other side and their cronies in the Northern Territory Labor government do not care about agriculture at all. What have they done for agriculture? I'll tell you, Mr President, they have done absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing for agriculture. Now, why do we need this visa? Because we have a lot of unique agricultural enterprises in the Northern Territory, such as crocodile farming. This occurs in the Northern Territory and nowhere else in Australia. So we have no access to labourers that are used to working with crocodiles. And let me tell you, Mr President, if you're not used to working with crocodiles and you suddenly start to try and farm them, accidents will happen and digits will be lost. Order, thank Senator you. McMahon. <laughs> Senator Watt, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr President. As we have so often said in this chamber, this Prime Minister has had two jobs this year. Get the vaccine rollout working and build purpose-built quarantine stations. Now, we've talked a lot about his failures on vaccine. Let's have a talk about his failure on quarantine. Order. This is a federal responsibility. It is in the Constitution, if you care to take a look at it. But throughout this pandemic, this Prime Minister has not taken responsibility for quarantine. He has had 18 months to build one quarantine station. And how many has he built? Not one. Zero. 18 months in, yet again, we see this Prime Minister slow to act to protect Australians. And the result of that is 27 leaks from hotel quarantine, causing lockdowns and putting Australians at risk. The Queensland government has been pleading with the Prime Minister to build a quarantine station since January this year. They've got a proposed site at Wellcamp Airport at Toowoomba, and they've got a willing owner prepared to do it as well. But all the Prime Minister will do is put up excuse after excuse about why it can't be done. Thankfully today, the Palaszczuk government is actually taking responsibility. They're going it alone. They're doing your job while you do nothing, while you're slow to act, while Order, you put the Senator country into Watt. lockdown. 2 p.m. Time for questions. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday in question time, the Minister was unable to answer what advice the Morrison-Joyce government had received about the prevalence and impact of long COVID, including in relation to children and infants. 
Last night he sought advice and clarified that, and I quote, longer term impacts of COVID-19 to children under 16 years is emerging. Will the minister admit to Australian parents that the Morrison-Joyce government can't tell them what the impacts of long COVID are on their children? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I have to say I, it is really very disturbing. It is really very disturbing that the Labor Party continue to try and frighten Australians with respect Order, to the impact of this virus. Mr. President, this virus has been with us for a little over 18 months. We are still Order, learning Senators about Pratt and Watt. this virus, Mr. President. We are still learning about this virus. Senator Pratt, and Mr. President, as we learn about that virus, as that advice comes to us, Mr. President, we are very comfortable in providing that information to the Australian people so that they can understand it too. But it, it is changing all the time, and as information emerges, we work with with health agencies around the world to better understand the impacts of the virus. And of course, Mr. President, of course, Mr. President, as different variants of the virus emerge, they also have different impacts, Mr. President. And so, Mr. President, uh, I did reply, respond to uh, the chamber, as I said I would in question time Order. yesterday, Mr. President, uh, and indicated that it is still uh, that we are all still learning about the syndrome. Uh, but it also, Mr. President, it also indicates, Mr. President, the importance of the other measures that we have in place to support Australians uh, in dealing with the virus, including the process of vaccination of the broader population, Mr. President, because we know that when we vaccinate the broader population and we get those rates up, that protects everyone because it limits the transmission of the virus through the community, Mr. President. So we will. Um, uh, 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 continue to work uh, to understand the virus, working with the health professionals. Uh, there are some, some symptoms of this that will continue Order. to emerge. Senator, Mr. Colbeck, Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Israel, which has fully vaccinated 78 per cent of people aged 12 years and over, has predicted that by September half of new COVID cases will be in children. How many Australian children are, protected, are projected to contract COVID when Australia reaches the 70 and 80 per cent vaccination targets for those aged over 16? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, um, those figures will depend on the amount of virus trans being transmitted through the community, Mr President. Uh, well, Senator, Senator, I think it's a ridiculous thing for you to state across the chamber because the, the, uh, the information will be Order. dependent on the amount of virus being transmitted through the community. Uh, it will depend on the various variants of the virus uh, that might be being transmitted at that point in time, Mr President. And we know uh, the Delta variant, for example, is much more transmissible than the Alpha one was. Uh, the virus continues to mutate, uh, and the effects of that uh, are being felt and learnt in respect of the way uh, that the virus moves through the community. But we do know one thing. Uh, Order. We do know one thing, Mr. President. There are a range of principles that we can do to protect ourselves. Social distancing, Order. Uh, processes that we're doing with the states with respect to restriction of movement, and of course, vaccination, Mr. President. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. The Morrison Joyce government was responsible for the tragic deaths of 685 older Australians in residential aged care last year and has failed First Nations children in Western New South Wales who account for more than 40 per cent of new cases. How can Australian parents possibly trust that this government will protect their kids? If we could stop the interjections before the minister started answering the question, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I reject entirely the characterisation. Reject entirely the characterisation that Senator McAllister puts on the. Reject entirely the characterisation that Senator McAllister puts on her question, Mr. President. 
Uh, and it's quite clear, Mr. President, that despite some Order. members, despite some Order. members, Mr. President, of the Labor Party Order. indicating that so they, Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Across the chamber, I can't hear the minister. Don't interject and don't take the bait is the easiest way to remain silent. I wouldn't laugh too loudly, Senator Watt. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you. And it's quite clear, Mr. President quite clear, that despite some members of the opposition indicating that they support the national plan to emerge from COVID, that there's quite a few on that side that don't. And it's about time Order. they got on board, Mr President, because I, can, I can tell you the Australian people are on board. They want to take up Order. their vaccinations. They want their Senator freedoms McAllister back. And, and it's about Polly. time the Labor Party did, did other than undermine the national plan for us to recover from COVID and get on board with the rest of us. Order. Well, I'll, I'll call Senator Dean Smith when there's silence. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on the evacuation operation in Kabul? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and may I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, so far uh, we have evacuated approximately 4,000 people, Australian citizens, permanent residents, visa holders and others, on 29 flights over the past eight days. I offer my profound thanks to the many Australian officials who have worked and are working on this operation, particularly my own Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Home Affairs and Defence. Our cooperation with other countries, including New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States, has been vital in achieving this outcome, and we thank our partners for that important cooperation. Last night and this morning, we evacuated around 1,200 people from Kabul on six ADF flights and one NZDF flight. I can also confirm that since the 18th of August, we have brought 639 evacuees back to Australia, following flight into Brisbane early this morning, carrying 220 people. This has followed previous flights to Perth, Melbourne and Adelaide. To those Afghans who have already arrived in Australia, we say welcome back to the Australians and the permanent residents, and welcome to your new home, to our visa holders. To those soon to travel here, we look forward to your arrival. We can only imagine the challenges that you have been dealing with in recent times. We thank the states and territories for their support in this important evacuation. As I said, we understand this is an extremely distressing time for, Afghanistan's in, for Australians in Kabul and others such as visa holders and visa applicants. For those in Australia who still have family and friends in Afghanistan, we do understand that distress. We are fully aligned with our international partners uh, to insist the Taliban holds to international standards of human rights and protections. We do remain focused on, the, focused on the safe evacuation from Afghanistan of as many Australians and visa holders as possible for as long as possible, Mr. Mr. President. Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the changes to Australia's travel advice to Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, security situation in Kabul was already dangerous and volatile and has deteriorated further. Early this morning, we changed our travel advice. For Australians and Australian visa holders in Afghanistan, the new advice is do not travel to Hamid Karzai International Airport. It is not safe to do so. If you are in the immediate area of the airport, leave now, move to a safe location and await further advice. There is the potential for violence and security threats with large crowds. There is an ongoing and very high threat of terrorist attack. Our partners, including New Zealand and the UK, have taken similar steps to our own, and others, including the US and Canada, have amended their uh, travel advice equivalents. The government's priority throughout this operation has been the safety of Australians and their families and visa holders, and that remains the case. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's continued support for Australians and visa holders in Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Mr President, the Australian government notes the Taliban has made undertakings about foreign nationals seeking to leave Afghanistan. Uh, we continue to seek that they observe those undertakings, uh, including to uphold human rights and to allow our citizens and Australian visa holders to depart safely if they wish to do so. 
For Australians who remain in Afghanistan, please register with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade if you have not done so already. The Department of Home Affairs will proactively contact those who have been granted temporary safe haven subclass 449 visas but remain in Afghanistan with advice about what they should do when it is safe. We will continue to process visa applications from Afghans seeking protection. The government will work with the International Organisation for Migration, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Afghan community leaders in Australia and leading refugee advocates and service providers to welcome people from yeah. Afghanistan. Yeah. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Reports says, suggest around 30 per cent of COVID-19 cases in New South Wales and 40 per cent of cases in Victoria are in those 19 and younger. How many children have contracted COVID-19 in New South Wales and how many in Victoria during the current Delta outbreak? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senate and I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, I don't have those statistics to hand, but I will see if I can get them and reply to you uh, as soon as I can. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. The Minister taking on notice. Um, as of last week, 40 per cent of COVID-19 cases in Western New South Wales were in First Nations children. How many First Nations children have contracted COVID-19 in the current Delta outbreaks in New South Wales and how many in Victoria? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much and I thank the Senator for that question. Uh, I will also have to take that on notice. Uh, given that this is a health question, I'll take it on notice and get back to you. Order. 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 Senator Watt, Ministers treating the Senate with courtesy. Minister answering should be allowed to take it on notice in order. Senator O'Neill. So, um, again, in your capacity representing the Minister for Education and Youth, how many children across Australia are currently battling COVID 19? And does the Prime Minister still believe it's not a race? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I will also have to take that one on notice again because Order. it's the Department of Health uh, that keeps those statistics, and I am the minister for the NDIS. Mm. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Minister. The world has witnessed and experienced extreme weather in the last few months. We've had flooding, bushfires, heat waves across Europe, the US, China and India. We've, of course, had our own climate fires here in Australia as well. We are facing code red when it comes to our climate and the health of our planet. So why, in this climate crisis, is the Morrison government and the Labor Party spending millions of public dollars propping up and opening up new gas fields like in the Beetaloo Basin that will only increase emissions by 6 per cent and make climate change worse. The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson-Young for the question. Uh, in terms of part of the question uh, as to why the Labor Party supported the government. I can't answer for the Labor Party, except to perhaps say uh, they had a temporary dose of common sense uh, in supporting uh, the coalition government when it comes to energy policy. But when it comes to our support for unlocking gas in the Beetaloo Basin, uh, this is about uh, a gas-led recovery and about our strategy to make sure uh, that we have reliable and affordable energy uh, as we embark uh, on a process of ensuring our economy continues to reduce its emissions uh, but we are able to, and we are able to play our part uh, in an international uh, effort uh, to reduce emissions uh, without killing our economy. Uh, and so when we support, when we support gas, uh, what we are doing 
is we are actually supporting a whole range of energy sources because uh, if you want to see the massive uptake in renewables uh, that we have seen in this country at a record rate, uh, you need to make sure that you have the firming power, the, the um, uh, base load energy uh, that enables our economy to continue. Now, uh, the question, of course, therefore needs to be asked of the Greens. Uh, which base load energy source do they support? Because I've never actually heard the Greens ever indicate uh, which base load energy they support. They don't support gas, they don't support coal, they don't support hydro. Uh, which, which particular source of base load energy that would support renewables, that would support um, uh, uh, solar energy, that would support wind? Uh, do the Greens support? Well, this government supports renewable energy, but we also support affordable and reliable energy for our economy. Uh, that's what we're doing, Order. and Senator that's why Selger, we're supporting the Metaloo Basin and the opening expired. up. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, what an example of the bumbling fools on this side, really. I mean, honestly, your latest coal and gas subsidy announced today will force householders and businesses to pay more for their power bills. You talk about not wanting to. Uh, not wanting to kill the economy. Well, this whack and attack on the renewable energy in industry announced today is foolish. How much are Australians going to have to pay on their power bills because of your coal keeper plan? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson Young uh, for the question because what she has demonstrated again with that question is that she wants to bring uh, the former Labor government in South Australia's experiment in that state national. That is what the Greens would like to see. They would like to see the Australian people not having the energy they need to support jobs, to support the economy and to support their ability to live their lives uh, in the kind of comfort that many of us have come to expect and, in, in fact, the Greens, of course, have come to expect. Because I always am interested in the lecturing tone from the Greens, who never lead by example. Uh, you know, I, I once, I'm reminded of a local Green who said, you know, we, we want to take you back to the caves, but just not yet. Just not yet. Well, the Greens aren't prepared to go there. They're not prepared to go there. They're prepared to enjoy uh, all of the abundant energy sources we have. We're bringing down energy prices. That's what we've been doing. Right. We're not going to take advice Order, from the Senator Greens, Selger, which would time destroy for the answer our economy. Has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. The intellectual prowess represented on the front bench here. Energy market analysts have estimated that your coal keeper plan is going to cost householders from $180 to $430. Can you confirm? Will the government tell us how much, your power, how much householders' power bills are going to be because of your dodgy plan to prop coal up today? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you very much, and I, I reject the premise of the question from Senator Hanson Young. Uh, what we have seen uh, under this government. Uh, is that our policies have seen energy prices coming down. And this is how you get energy prices down in this country. You get investment in new technologies. You get investment in renewables, which we've seen order. at record Senator rates. Senator Hanson Young on a point of order. Thank you. Relevance. I asked whether the government could confirm how much householders' power bills would okay, cost Hanson under Young, this plan. Senator Hanson Young, your question had a great deal of commentary, commenced with what I assume was a sarcastic barb. And quite frankly, if questions are phrased in that way, then ministers have a great deal of discretion in how they can answer them. Um, it wasn't just as simple as you outlined. Senator Seselja. Thank you. And clearly, Sarah Hanson Young is in a very bad mood uh, this afternoon. And uh, I don't know what's you, caused use that. Use people's correct uh, titles, please, uh, Senator. Uh, 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 Senator Hanson Young, did I say? No, sorry. Is clearly is clearly got some of the angry pills today. But what I would what I would say in response to Senator Hanson Young is that our policies have been bringing energy prices down. And and what we are what we are not going to do is not what we are not going to do is take advice from the Greens about getting rid of baseload energy, not investing in gas. We will continue to invest in that because it is an, a critically important part of our energy mix that will support the economy and support Order, our Senator efforts Seselja. to reduce now, emissions. I didn't quite catch everything said there due to some interjections, but I remind senators not to make reflections that are personal or directed at other individual senators when they are addressing the chamber. Senator Patrick, remotely. I saw Senator Patrick there before. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
My question is to the Minister for Government Services. In the three weeks, weeks since I, <clears throat> I highlighted the impending utilisation of vaccine certificates and pointed out the flaws in the government's own solutions in respect of forgery, <coughs> excuse me, we've had Western Australia and Queensland announce access to their, uh, to their states will require uh, a vaccination status check. And we've had employers announce vaccinations will, will soon become What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Senator Patrick to log on, then log off. I'm going to go... Uh, Senator Patrick, um, the system, when it's running all day, does tend to come under strain. Can you log on, log off? And what I'll do is I'll come to you for the next question. So I'll now go to Senator Askew, and then I'll come back to Senator Patrick. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Sen Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is delivering its economic recovery plan and supporting Australians to chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic, including through the National Plan agreed by the National Cabinet? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Askew for her question, a very important question uh, about indeed Australia's performance through this once-in-a-century global pandemic uh, and our pathway through to the other side of it. And Mr President, Australians have much to be proud of in the way they've responded to this pandemic. The responses of Australians with the work of their governments, business and others have seen an estimated 30,000 lives saved around Australia and compared with the type of devastation that we've seen in so many other countries. And although parts of the country are doing it tough right now, we should never underestimate the success we've had as a nation in responding in world leading ways, saving those 30,000 lives saving as well, Mr President, uh, an estimated close to one million jobs during the course of this pandemic as a result of effective policy measures. Right from the start of the pandemic, the closure of our international borders uh, that managed to keep so successfully right through the pandemic in so many different ways, what would have been a flood and a wave of COVID cases from coming into the country and spreading throughout the country. Equally, Mr President, the economic supports from JobKeeper, through to the coronavirus supplement, cash flow boosts, temporary full expensing measures, supports to targeted sectors like aviation, tourism, business payments now being delivered directly with the states and disaster assistance payments directly to affected individuals. Our economy has demonstrated resilience again and again, and we should have confidence that it will do so once more when current lockdowns and restrictions ease, particularly growing confidence as we see vaccination numbers hit new records, more than 335,000 achieved yesterday, helping Australia surge towards the scientifically based uh, targets of the Doherty Institute of 70 and 80 per cent full vaccination rates that can give confidence and hope and safety to Australians that we will be able to achieve a greater sense of normality in the future and through that Order. help to get our Senator country Birmingham. to the Senator other side. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, despite the COVID-19 challenges Australia is currently facing, what does recent data demonstrate about the resilience of our economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, there's continued to be significant support in terms of our economy and from that support, significant strength in our economy. The jobs market has shown great resilience, coming back strongly from different lockdowns and shutdowns and holding up very strongly. Just last week, we saw real wages data continuing to remain above pre-pandemic levels. These things are a contrast to so much of the rest of the world. And indeed today, the Future Fund, an important, hugely important asset for our nation, has delivered its strongest ever investment earnings through the 2020-21 year, where earnings have grown by 22.2%, up some $35.7 billion, tripling, Mr President, the initial investments that have been made in the Future Fund, ensuring that nest egg for our nation's future is as strong as possible. These all demonstrate resilience, strength and capability across the Australian economy and should give people confidence for the future. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you for that answer. Minister, what can all Australians do to help deliver the national plan and build further confidence in our recovery from COVID-19 for all Australian households and businesses? 
Senator Birmingham. The national plan is about giving Australians confidence in the safety of themselves and their families, as well as confidence in the reopening of our economy, that they will be able to get their businesses back on a stable footing, their jobs even more secure, and that we can resume the type of growth that our country has seen in recent years, strong growth in jobs numbers, providing strong opportunities for all Australians. To support this plan, Australians need to do as they currently are, turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. Over 70s have now had, uh, some 86% plus of over 70s have now had the first dose of vaccine. 59.9% of them have had their second dose. Across the whole population of 16 plus, 55.2% have now had their first dose. As we see the Otago advice being received in relation to children, continued increase in supply, growth in the more than 8,900 centres to get a vaccine, Order. all should have Senator confidence Birmingham. that Time we can deliver this plan. Senator Patrick is back, I believe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Government Services. In the three weeks since I highlighted the impending utilisation of vaccination certificates and the fact that the government solution is easily forged, we've had uh, the West Australian and Queensland governments announce access to their states will rely on vaccination status, and we've had employees announce that vaccination will become compulsory. In the same time, vaccination, the vaccination program has delivered over 4.4 million doses and adds almost uh, 290,000 doses a day. The value in proof of vaccination is climbing. The problem is getting bigger. The system is flawed, relying on, one, uh, relying on a solution that, uh, that could possibly undermine attempts to stop the virus spreading. Can the minister explain what the uh, solution uh, to this mess is? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And first of all, I would totally reject the premise of all well, the assertions from Senator Patrick that is simply not the case, and let me explain why. The national plan our government has developed and agreed to is our pathway to living with this virus. That is our goal to live with this virus, not to live in fear of it. The government, and in fact all ministers in this place, are working in our various areas with states and territories, including on this matter and we are looking for a pathway forward. Vaccination is clearly the key to keeping Australians safe and how we get our lives back in a COVID world. Medicare's long-standing and reliable system underpins the Australian Immunisation Register, or otherwise called AIR, which plays a central role today in recording COVID-19 vaccinations. Uh, the AIR itself was established in 1996 and has a long-standing and very trusted uh, reputation and history. Many parents are familiar with its record keeping and also proof of childhood immunisations. And it's only logical that this database is used to capture COVID-19 vaccinations in a secure, reliable and trusted way. Privacy and security considerations are, of course, among the top priorities for any digital solution the government develops, uh, and this digital certificate is absolutely no exception. Contemporary cybersecurity is in place to protect people's personal information, and COVID-19 digital certificates do have features to safeguard against fraudulent activity consistent with all other official government documents, such as birth certificates and citizenship certificates. We are, however, continually evolving our security technology to meet uh, contemporary and emerging threats, and we are very confident in the robust monitoring and fraud detection mechanisms in place to protect Medicare details. And since mandating the recording of COVID-19 vaccinations on the air, the Commonwealth has further boosted proof of vaccination certificates, security measures, Order. and the government Senator continues Reynolds, to do time so. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, respectfully, Minister, we don't have a system where someone can present easily to a, to a cinema operator or to an airline operator and uh, do so with the uh, confidence required uh, for the verification. Uh, we need to have a simple solution. What is the schedule uh, to get a robust working solution? When are we going to see a solution, a forge-proof solution, easy to use, that can be deployed? Order. Senator Patrick. Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, well, thank you very much. And again, I thank Senator Patrick for the question. Uh, as I said in response to the first answer, the federal government, and including Services Australia, continues to work on evolving uh, these certificates for a variety of purposes. The digital vaccination certificate is now available through MyGov. The Commonwealth has provided Australians with an initial quick and reliable way to access their proof of COVID-19 vaccination when they need, may need it, including in response to public health settings imposed by states and territories when proof of vaccination may be required. More than 2.5 million people have now accessed their digital vaccination certificate. It has been and it will continue to be an individual's responsibility to provide proof of vaccination should it be required by states and territories. The Commonwealth and state and territory governments are currently in consideration of a number of options for how to, to, how to uh, progress and evolve the proof of vaccination and possibly how it could be integrated into state and territory Order. their Senator own COVID-19. The answer expired. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. The Inspector General of Biosecurity found that officials from the Federal Department of Agriculture made crucial errors in relation to the Ruby Princess. Federal officials did not administer traveller with, with illness uh, checklists, did not, re did not review the ship's medical log, and therefore did not contact New South Wales Health to raise concerns about six pa sick oh, passengers oh, yeah, and crew. The Inspector General told ABC no, that, and I quote, if the department had done what it agreed to do, then the chances of a Ruby Princess incident happening were significantly reduced, end quote. Does the Morrison-Joyce government accept this finding? Now, I must apologise to the chamber at this point and to Senator Patrick, because my um, scribble meant that I had missed his second supplementary. I'm sorry, Senator Patrick. Um, please accept my sincere apologies. Um, my intention is to move on with Senator Brown's question, because Senator Patrick just texted me then, but I'll own up to that. I think it's the first time I've done that in my time in the chair. Um, I owe you one, Senator Patrick. I'll give you an extra one sometime. Um, <laughs> Senator, the minister representing the Minister for um, Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, my advice from the Minister for Agriculture on this uh, particular issue is the Australian government is committed to protecting the lives and livelihoods of Australians from COVID-19 and takes the matter of the Ruby Princess incident very seriously. The New South Wales Special Commission into the Ruby Princess found the incident was primarily a failing of New South Wales Health. Uh, at uh, Minister Little Proud's request, the Inspector General of Biosecurity reviewed matters relating to the arrival of the Ruby Princess uh, and made 42 recommendations. Minister Little Proud asked the department to implement all recommendations from both the Inspector General's review and the Walker inquiry as a matter of priority, and significant progress has been made. In the article published by the ABC on 24 August 2021, the Inspector General of Biosecurity said many other improvements were also being made. And I quote, uh, I am draft dramatically more positive about the ability of the department to deal with these things today than I would have been at the same time last year. Uh, Minister Littleproud has said that the department could improve, but it is not, ultimate, it is ul not ultimately responsible for the human health assessment. In response to the New South Wales Commission and the review of the by the Inspector General, a series of actions have already been taken to improve the department's capability to respond to human biosecurity risks. New arrangements for communicating with human biosecurity officers and port stakeholders about human health issues are working well. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The New South Wales Special Commissioner Brett Walker SC told the ABC, and I quote, there must be a real chance, a sensible possibility, that if the Commonwealth had done a better job on the Ruby Princess, that, state that the state officers may not have made the mistakes they did, end quote. The Morrison-Joyce government did not permit federal officials to appear as witnesses before Mr Walker in the New South Wales Commission of Inquiry. Why? Why? Senator Mackenzie. Oh, I heard you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, in 
part of the new arrangements, commercial vessels continue to arrive in Australia, uh, and where COVID-19 is confirmed or suspected in the crew, state health authorities have been effectively managing the risk Senator, in consultation Senator with Senator the Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I, I do realise the minister's relevance, and I do realise the minister has only been speaking for 15 seconds, but her answer seems to be in no way relevant to the question whatsoever. The question is why weren't federal agriculture officials allowed to appear before the New South Wales Special but, Commissioner inquiry? This answer seems to be Senator completely Keneally, as I've said before, irrelevant. there was a, a quotation and a preamble to it. A minister is entitled to address that part of a question, not just the part at the end. Short, specific questions give much less discretion to those answering them. But the minister is entitled to address the quotation that was made that was that before the part of the question you mentioned. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so legislation with changes that were recommended by both the New South Wales Commission and the Inspector General's review will be introduced to Parliament. And since the Ruby Princess incident, the government has also invested a further $400 million in biosecurity in the 21-22 budget, on top of record spending in 2021. This will, among other matters, see a funding boost for staff at the front line and to help modernise uh, some of those border systems. It, the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment Order. continues to work with state and territories and port uh, stakeholders to further adjust systems and processes to better manage human health and biosecurity. They've established Order, formal Senator protocols. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Ru Ruby Princess resulted in 600 cases of COVID-19 and 28 deaths in Australia. Will the Morrison Joyce government now apologise for failing to stop the one boat that mattered? Senator Order, Senator Rennick, Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, to answer and respond to the Senator's question, of course, every single live loss through this global pandemic here at home is a tragedy. And there has been an inquiry by the New South Wales Commission, and there has been an, in Order. an inquiry commissioned by Order, our Keneally. own Minister for Agriculture, David Littleproud, through the Inspector General of Biosecurity. And those recommendations have been handed down, and our government is committed to actually progressing and addressing those issues, Order. every single matter. The minister has also sought additional funding to ensure that those who are at the front line of our biosecurity Order. here in this country, whether it is at ports uh, like uh, the one mentioned or whether it is at airports, that our biosecurity officers have the very, very best technology and processes available Order. to keep Senator Australia McKenzie, safe. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister advise the Senate why the national plan agreed by National Cabinet is critical to charting our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for our most vulnerable Australians? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I'd like to thank Senator Hughes for her question and for her tireless advocacy uh, in this area. Thank you. Uh, all First Ministers through the National Cabinet have agreed in principle to our national plan to chart our path out of COVID-19 and the targets we need to reach to get there. It is built on a very clear premise. If you get vaccinated, we can make lockdowns, border closures and restrictions a thing of the past. Millions of Australians are playing their part to get to the next step on this pathway to living with the virus. There is no better example than that than our wonderful disability support workers who are working so hard uh, throughout this pandemic to protect those they care for. And uh, as a measure of that, since early July, more than 60,000 that's 60,000 uh, disability workers have voluntarily been vaccinated and can I thank each and every one of them for putting themselves forward to receive the vaccination. A total of 95,500, or just under 60 per cent, of uh, disability workers have now received a first dose, and 40 per cent have received two doses. And I would encourage all disability workers to step forward to protect themselves and also to protect those that they support and they care for. 
So, on behalf of all Australians, and I'm sure all in this chamber, I thank and extend my appreciation to our wonderful disability care and support workers who are doing such a magnificent job in a very difficult time. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has Australia compared to other nations, such as the United Kingdom, in protecting people with disability from COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, and again, thank you very much, uh, Senator Hughes, for that. And I note her comments in the chamber yesterday on this very subject, which is close uh, to her heart. Australia's experience in relation to COVID-19 pandemic has varied significantly to the rest of the world, including, as Senator Hughes asked, the United King Kingdom. And can I say I find it in almost unbelievably irresponsible to unnecessarily alarm Australians with disabilities and those who love them with alarmist and totally and utterly irrelevant Order. assumptions and international comparisons. The facts matter in this, and they matter a great deal. Those opposite are fond of quoting the UK statistics, so let's have a look at the facts. To date, the UK has reported 6.5 million COVID infections, while Australia, with 40 per cent of the population, has less than 50,000. Uh, and 132 in the UK of these cases have been amongst those with disability, and in Australia it is 250 cases. So again, using Order. alarmist Senator information Reynolds, from overseas is irresponsible and expired. In Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Order. You finished? You finished? Order on my left. Senator Hughes. Mr. President. Having secured my gorgeous 12 year old's appointment this morning for his first and second Pfizer shot, thank you for opening it up to all of our 12 plus NDIS participants. So, Minister, why is the acceleration in the vaccine rollout so important to ensuring the delivery of the national plan and Australia's recovery from COVID 19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and that is indeed good news, Senator Hughes. Uh, nationally, we have seen a significant acceleration of the vaccine rollout, now with more than 17.7 million doses being administered. We're vaccinating just under 2 million each week and 1 million in the last three days alone. And there has been a concerted effort across government and the disability sector to communicate the importance of vaccination and to provide information on the over 8,000 uh, channels now available. The rates of NDIS participants, like the national rollout, has accelerated significantly over the last few months. Uh, of NDIS participants, more than 95,000 have been vaccinated since early June. Nearly half of all participants and over 16s have now had one dose. Uh, and pleasingly, vaccination rates for NDIS participants in shared accommodation has tripled, has tripled since the beginning of June, with 68 per cent now having received their first dose. And as Senator Hughes says, uh, all participants over Order. 12 years Senator old Reynolds, are now eligible for, for vaccination. Has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, instead of taking responsibility for his slow and bungled vaccine rollout, which is causing the current COVID outbreaks, Mr. Morrison blamed Queenslanders for their vaccination numbers. Why is Mr Morrison shifting blame to Queenslanders instead of taking responsibility for his failures to roll out the vaccine, which have left Queenslanders vulnerable to COVID-19? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, it must be another day ending in why, because Senator Watt is seeking to peddle mistruths in the chamber. So, Mr President, that is not at all what the Prime Minister has done or said. Indeed, I can really only think of two Queenslanders who might stand out in terms of being unhelpful to the vaccine rollout. That would be the Premier and the Chief Health Officer, both of whom seem to do their utmost to try to dent confidence in it early on. But I'm thrilled to know that Queenslanders have overcome those theatrics from their leaders, that Queenslanders are actually responding in strong numbers to the vaccine rollout, as indeed are all Australians. And that's the crucial thing, Mr President. The job is getting done. Australians are turning out in record numbers. More than 330,000 did so yesterday. It's driving our country at rates of people getting vaccinated faster on a per capita basis than the US or the UK ever achieved. And we want to encourage Australians to do so. And we completely reject the type of negativity we get from Senator Watt. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Today, the Queensland government has announced that after months of the Morrison government failing to deliver, Queensland will go it alone and build a dedicated quarantine facility at Wellcamp Airport near Toowoomba. 18 months into the COVID Order. crisis, why is the Morrison-Joyce government still failing to take responsibility for delivering safe national quarantine? Order. Senator Birmingham. Senator Rennick. Or Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're grateful for all the states and territories who have worked with us in the delivery of quarantine, which has overwhelmingly been safe and effective in the return of hundreds of thousands of people from overseas. Contrary to what Senator Watt's saying, we're also getting on with building quarantine facilities, construction underway in Melbourne, uh, commitment uh, and indeed contracting in place uh, for Western Australia. And similarly, in Brisbane, we're building a facility that is actually proximate to the airport, proximate to major hospitals, able to meet quarantine needs. If Queensland want to build Order. one that's a long way away from the international airport, that's their decision. I hope they're doing it for the right reasons, not political ones. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. This week, Mr Morrison blamed Queenslanders for his own vaccine rollout failures and left Queensland to build and fund safe Order. quarantine without federal support. Why is Mr Morrison more interested in blaming Queenslanders than taking responsibility for keeping them safe from COVID-19? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Mr President, I completely reject the premise of those questions. And the real question, of course, should be uh, why Order. does Senator Sorry, Watt Senator have Birmingham, I'm going to ask you to cease and I'm going to let you start again because Senator Watt is interjecting so loudly I can't hear your answer. Well, maybe if you ask a question, you might want to listen to the answer yourself. Senator Birmingham to continue. Mr Senator President, as I was saying, I completely reject the premise of the questions from Senator Watt. Uh, and frankly, you know, the only question really is why does Senator Watt feel the need to misrepresent any statement and to continually play politics with these matters? We're proud as a government of the fact that Australians are turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. We now have volumes coming Order. into the country of additional Senator vaccine Watt. in record numbers. We have nearly 9,000 distribution Senator points Watt. across the country. Uh, we've seen the 70 plus age group charge through more than 86 per cent of them getting their first dose. Right across the whole population, more than 55 per cent of 16 pluses have. We're soon to receive the Atagi advice in relation to 12 to 15 year olds, and we will be bringing them, along with every other eligible Australian, into this record-breaking vaccine rollout to get the job done, despite the negativity of the Labor Party. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government's record $110 billion that's a lot of money, $110 billion infrastructure investment plan is helping to connect communities, to create jobs and support our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator McMahon, for your question and your tireless efforts to represent the Territory here in this place. As you said, our government is investing more in infrastructure, a total of $110 billion, more than any other government in our nation's history. Since 2013, we've committed over $50 billion in infrastructure to our regions, because we believe in the capacity of our regions and we believe in their capacity if you just add water. That is why uh, we've committed $1.6 billion to co-fund the construction of 30 water infrastructure projects which will actually provide water into the future, unlock the economic potential for new and expanded agriculture for regional Australians. We're driving investments in infrastructure that are enabling Northern Territory industries to grow and prosper, and not just the croc industry, Senator McMahon. By doing so, we're charting a strong course to ensure the recovery of COVID-19. The Liberal and Nationals government has committed $3.2 billion to infrastructure projects in the Northern Territory since 2013, and in this budget, $323.9 million was committed to projects in the Territory that are expected to support more than 900 local jobs. 
We're upgrading vital road infrastructure with $150 million for phase two of the NT National Network highway upgrades and just over $173 million for the sixth corridor under the Roads of Strategic Importance initiative. This will support the development of the gas industry in the Beetaloo sub-basin, which I know you're incredibly passionate about. It will increase our gas supply, create more jobs and provide significant economic growth, not just for the NT, but for the whole nation. Delivering improvements to roads used by rural communities within the Beetaloo, Beetaloo will benefit the residents, workers and visitors. It's clear from the investment that it's the Liberal National Government that's committed to delivering the infrastructure our nation needs to economically Order. recover. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. <clears throat> that is indeed excellent news, Minister. Can you inform us uh, what infrastructure programs will improve safety and support growth and recovery in Northern Territory communities? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that the town of Catherine, the gateway to the region, has a strong tourism sector, schools and health facilities that will all benefit um, from the investments that we're making. And we haven't just stopped there, where I uh, mentioned earlier. We've committed $139 million to upgrades to the Outback Way. We've got upgrades to roads that tourists use uh, with one of the most spectacular parts of our beautiful nation, including the town of Alice. Together we have 26 projects under construction and with, this is in addition to the 12 completed projects that we've committed to more than $395 million to. We've also committed more than $30 million to build the Tiger Brennan Drive and Berrimah Road overpass to ensure a safer commute for the 20,000 motorists that use it. The project will see up to 155 jobs support at the peak of the works and it will take nearly two years to complete. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Great news for the Northern Territory. Uh, what investments is the government making in other critical projects, particularly in regional Australia, to uh, chart our way back from COVID-19? Senator McKenzie. Well, thank you, Senator McMahon. Since 2013, our government has committed more than $2.8 billion to support community infrastructure that promotes stable, secure and viable regional economies builds the, on the resilience of our communities as we recover from the pandemic. More than $247 million has been committed through the Regional Growth Fund for projects from construction of the Catherine Flood Mitigation and Headworts project in the NT. For projects that help grow regional economies and provide sustainable employment, we've committed $206 million to the regional jobs and investment packages and $145 million to the Stronger Community pro Program, which has funded around 12,000 projects since 2015, because we believe in a recovery from COVID that will be led by regional Australia. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A week ago, the Prime Minister promised to build a new quarantine facility at Jandicott Airport in Western Australia after the Department of Finance recommended uh, that site after a feasibility study. So why has Mr Morrison already broken that promise, announcing the quarantine station will now be moved to a new site near a contaminated RAAF base? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, if Senator Pratt bothered to look at any of the detail of what was said when the Jandicott site was announced as a preferred location uh, a little over a week ago, she would have, Mr. President, known that at the time I spoke very publicly about the fact that terms in relation to access to that site weren't settled, the contingency and backup plans looking at other sites were underway, Order. and that the government was reserving the right. Indeed, the memorandum Senator of understanding Watt. that we signed with the West Senator Australian Pratt. government, who are clearly far more mature on these issues than or the Anthony Albanese opposition, the West Australian government MOU that we signed actually acknowledged the fact uh, that there were contingency sites underway. The WA government has been engaged, involved and aware of that. Now, what we've done is uh, move to the Bullsbrook site, the defence training centre there, on the basis of it being the site that will enable us to most efficiently in terms of time and money, get the project built and delivered. That's why we're going there. It's that simple. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. The proposed quarantine facility, which still has no budget, no contractor, 
no timeline and will not take quarantine out of Perth CBD hotels. And it won't even uh, uh, open until two years after the start of this pandemic. Why is Mr Morrison so slow to act in keeping Western Australians safe? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I, I note Senator Pratt there claiming that there's no contractor. If she bothered to read her hometown newspaper, The Western Australian today, she would actually see that we announced the contractor for construction on the Bullsbrook site yesterday. I thank Multiplex for the work they're doing on that site, as they are elsewhere around the country. They're in a position where they're going and to get the designs finalised, the approvals finalised and construction underway the month after next. Senator Pratt, final supplementary question. Mr Morrison has called Western Australians cave dwellers and has now delayed construction of a new quarantine facility, all after siding with Clive Palmer against Western Australia's border restrictions. Why does Mr Morrison continually Order. show such contempt for Western Australia? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that's strike three from Senator Pratt. Three questions, three failures and three statements that are completely Senator false, Watt. incorrect or failing facts. Uh, Mr Senator President, Watt. as I made clear yesterday when Senator Pratt tried this on, the Prime Minister said no such thing. We're grateful for the fact that West Australians, like all Australians, are turning out in record numbers to get vaccinated. We're confident that West Australians Order. want us to stick to a plan that gives them back the opportunity to engage with the rest of Australia, that gives them back the opportunity to engage with the rest of the world. That's what our national plan is all about, driving the vaccination numbers for Australians to points where we can all get back those freedoms and liberties. Whether you live in Western Australia or Queensland, New South Wales or South Australia, Victoria or Tasmania or the territories, we want every single Australian to have the chance to get back those freedoms. Listening to those opposite, despite they say they back the plan, it's clear they speak with Order. forked tongue. Senator Birmingham. It's perfectly clear the time they the don't has expired. and expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, with the Tokyo Paralympics underway, can you outline how the Paralympics and our Australian para-athletes are inspiring people with disability to follow their dreams and to pursue new opportunities particularly in the face of the challenges presented by COVID-19. The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks Senator Van for his question. Well, a few weeks ago, I think Australia felt the Olympic spirit as we watched the Olympic Games. And once again this week, we feel the Olympic spirit as we watch our Paralympians compete in the Paralympic Games. And it's another opportunity for us all to celebrate and unite around our incredible sporting achievements. So good to see the Australian team leading the medal tally already after an amazing 10 medals yesterday. Resilience, determination and strength underpins our Olympic team. Uh, and we have to understand that so many of our athletes have undertaken and overcome extraordinary adversity to be in Tokyo. And it's important that this importantly reminds us that when we focus on what people's ability is instead of focusing on their disability, how much more can be achieved. This year, our team in Tokyo is the largest ever team that we've sent overseas, second only to the Sydney 2000 team, with 178 uh, athletes performing across 18 sports. Uh, the Aussies have always finished in the top five, and I can see no reason why that won't happen again this time. To the whole team, we are watching you, we are cheering you on. You are an inspiration to us all, but you are an especial inspiration to Australians who live with disability. So a big congratulations to Paige Greco and Emily Petricola for winning gold on the cycling tack track. To Rowan Crothers, to Ben Popham, to William Martin, to Lakeisha Patterson for winning gold in the pool. Just getting to the Olympic Games has been an extraordinary challenge, given the circumstances we find ourselves in and the challenges of COVID to compete on the world stage. I hope everybody in Tokyo reaches whatever goal they sought to go there for, whether it's a personal best, winning a gold, or in the case of my mate Dylan Alcott, hopefully achieving that extremely difficult golden grand slam. To our Paralympics, good luck. Australia is proudly watching you compete in our green and gold. Senator Van, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, as we work to deliver the national plan agreed by National Cabinet, how is the Liberal and Nationals government ensuring that people with disability can fully participate in the workforce and take part in our economic recovery from COVID-19? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we know that a lack of information and support can be an extraordinary barrier to participation and independence. And throughout this pandemic, especially uh, as we move through the national plan, we want to make sure that we support people to get the access to the supports that they need to look after themselves during the lockdown, but to know what's on the other side. And that's why we've invested in the National Disability Gateway to assist with people with disability, their families and their carers, to access the information and a range of supports in a range of different areas, from health and, uh, and uh, employment services, uh, and supporting to keep them connected to their communities during this really yeah. difficult time. In particular, uh, the leisure function on the Disability Gateway website can connect budding athletes with sporting centres near them and so that they can hopefully find a sporting club that suits their and, and, and is right for them. And that's why we've partnered with Get Skilled Access to develop an online platform so they can do exactly that. Order. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, how is the government also supporting people with a disability in other endeavours, including to take up sport in their local community? Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much. Well, we know how sport can be a powerful tool in breaking down barriers and eliminating stigmas, but unfortunately it's something that not everyone is able to do right now given the current COVID restrictions. But we know that sport can play an incredibly important role in helping people feel both included and to feel valued. So the Sport for All program is designed to help and work through 500 schools and local clubs uh, to provide accessibility for sport for people with disability in remote communities and also our culturally and linguistically diverse people. So it might be passing a basketball or having a rally at tennis. It's all about providing every Australian with the opportunity to participate in sport. And this program is being developed by our uh, world-class Olympian Dylan Orcott through his organisation Get Skilled Access, which has got years of experience. But most particularly, these are programs that are designed by people for people with disability. And Order. The... Senator Rustin. <laughs> Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. motions to take note of answers. Senator Watt. There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Colbeck, Reynolds and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senator Mc Senators McAllister, O'Neill, Pratt and myself. Today we saw a very important announcement by the Queensland Government, and that is that they will go it alone on the building and funding of a new purpose-built quarantine station in Queensland. There can be no doubt whatsoever that quarantine is a federal responsibility. It is crystal clear in the Australian Constitution. But, but throughout this pandemic, we have seen this Prime Minister and this government shirk their constitutional responsibility to build quarantine facilities to keep Australians safe from COVID-19. In the 18 months since this pandemic began, we have seen not one quarantine facility built by this Prime Minister, despite it being his constitutional responsibility to do so. Yet again, we have seen the Prime Minister, who is slow to act and who fails to take responsibility even when something is set out in the Constitution for all to read. Now, the result of this government's and this Prime Minister's failure to act is that we have now seen 27 leaks of COVID-19 from hotel quarantine, uh, which have caused all sorts of outbreaks across the country, including the most recent disastrous outbreak in Sydney that is now recording national record COVID infection numbers. It is that failure from this government to act and build quarantine facilities, along with its failure to deliver the vaccine rollout, that is causing the lockdowns across the country that are causing so much misery uh, and that is putting the remainder at the country of risk. 
So I congratulate the Queensland government on its announcement today that it will go it alone and build this quarantine station uh, near Toowoomba in Queensland. We cannot wait any longer for a federal government that refuses to take responsibility to do its job and that is completely slow to act to protect Australians. This proposal is something that was raised uh, first by the Queensland government in January this year. Uh, they have had a proposed site since that time and a willing owner, but throughout the process, the Prime Minister, rather than taking responsibility, has just made excuse after excuse for why he won't support this quarantine station. First of all, he said that it doesn't have a suitable hospital, but we established at Senate Estimates that the Federal Department of Health has never even assessed Toowoomba Base Hospital to, to establish whether it is suitable to support a quarantine facility. And his other excuse, of course, is that it doesn't have an international airport. That's despite the fact that Wellcamp Airport currently receives international freight flights on many, many occasions, shipping fruit vegetables and other products in and out of this country. So it does have an international airport. It does have a hospital. What it doesn't have is a Prime Minister who is actually prepared to take responsibility and build the quarantine station that Queenslanders need. In fact, the, the Prime Minister's ignorance of Queensland is so great that he also said uh, that one of the reasons he opposed building a quarantine station near Toowoomba is that we shouldn't have quarantine stations near the desert. How ignorant do you have to be of Queensland's geography to, us to be claiming that Toowoomba is near the desert? I invite the Prime Minister to get in a car and see how many hours it takes him to get from Toowoomba to the desert so that he actually has some understanding of the state of Queensland. Now, the Prime Minister has had an absolute shocker of a week bagging Queensland. First of all, he called us cave dwellers. Uh, despite the fact that we have actually managed COVID-19 better than almost any state around Australia and certainly better than his preferred state, preferred Liberal state of New South Wales, who he described as being the gold standard and who he praised for their late lockdown. But it's us in Queensland who are the cave dwellers, according to the Prime Minister. Then he went on to blame Queenslanders for our vaccination rates, despite the fact that the vaccine rollout is his job. What is it with this bloke? Every time he's got a job, he can't do it, and then he blames someone else for it. So apparently it's Queenslanders' fault for not having enough vaccine, vaccines put in their arms, even though it's his job, the Prime Minister's job, to get those vaccinations happening. And of course now we see that he's leaving it to Queensland to go it alone in building the quarantine stations that are his job, that are his responsibility under the Australian Constitution. And in fact, he's even had one of his own senators, Senator Canavan, go public today saying that in response to the Queensland government's announcement, the federal government should pull defence force troops off the Queensland borders. That's the kind of support that, this, that Queensland is getting from this government. They've got a prime minister who just wants to bag us continually and leave us to ourselves, and they've even got senators from Queensland who want to rip defence force troops off our borders. This government has a problem with Queensland, and it's about time they started delivering. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, that was a very sad contribution. Senator Watt, a sad contribution from a sad opposition. We had a moment of hope last year. We had a moment of hope 18 months ago that those opposite would actually take their responsibilities as an alternative government seriously and actually work together with the government, and we are the government, the Australian people elected us, to get through a global pandemic, a global pandemic the like of which the world has not seen for a hundred years. And instead, that moment of that moment of hope, that moment of light from the opposition, for, that the opposition would actually take this seriously and not delve into the politics of it, lasted such a brief period of time. Luckily, luckily, we still have the national cabinet, where cabinet, where states and territories are still working together to find a path out of this pandemic, and that path has been mapped by the national cabinet, led by the Morrison government, and that path is clear to people, and that path is based on an accelerating vaccine rollout. And guess what, Senator Watt? Guess what, those opposite? The vaccine rollout is accelerating. 
Did it have some issues? It absolutely did. It absolutely had some issues, Senator Polly, and we admitted those issues and confronted those issues. The medical advice on the AstraZeneca, the, the age recommendation on AstraZeneca changed, and that did cause a lot of hesitancy regards AstraZeneca. However, that has largely flowed through now, and we see that people are embracing AstraZeneca as a very good, a very effective vaccine against this pandemic, along with Pfizer, soon along with the Moderna vaccine. And we've seen it. We see it every, we see it every day. Do those opposite actually look at the numbers that are coming out every day? 335,000 335, vaccines administered yesterday. The day before, 307,000. 307,000 accelerating every day. In the last 28 days, and I'm sure Senator O'Sullivan knows the answer to this, and I'm sure Senator Askey knows the answer, how many vaccines have we seen uh, administered in the last 28 days? 6.16 million. 6 million plus vaccinations administered in the last 28 days. And now, now, under medical advice, we're starting to talk about younger Australians. The medical advice on 12 to 15-year-olds is starting to come through from ATAGI. We've had preliminary advice so far. It's going to be considered by the National Security Committee of Cabinet, and the final advice hopefully will be available very, very soon. And do we know how many people are in that category in Australia, in that 12 to 15-year age group? I suspect those on this side do. Those on that side, I bet they wouldn't have a clue. 1.2 million. 1.2 million. So Senator O'Sullivan, Senator Askew, they could do the numbers easily. If you're doing six million doses approximately every 30 days, 1.2 million. Obviously, you've got to wait the time period between administering the two doses. But this will be incorporated into what is now an accelerating and very successful vaccine rollout. And I remind those listening to this today just how quick that acceleration has been. Uh, in March, 770,000 vaccines administered. By June, that's risen to 3.5 million. July, 4.5 million. Last 28 days, 6.16 million doses. And those opposite, they want to carp, they want to criticise, they want to cast a political lens on this as we do head towards an election, and that is just very sad. And I think the Australian people will craft, cast their judgment on the Labor Party's response to this pandemic very harshly indeed. I think the Australian people will judge your response to this pandemic very harshly indeed because this was an opportunity for Australians to pull together. Australians want a, a pathway out of this. Australians are embracing a pathway out of this. We only need to look at these vaccination rates to know that Australians have embraced the Morrison government's pathway out of this Order. pandemic. They Order. want the freedoms. They want Senator the liberties Polly. that will come with a successful vaccine program, and that is what the Morrison government is delivering. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Pratt. This government takes West Australians for mugs. That's the approach this government has taken when it comes to negotiating with the state government about quarantine facilities. We have been promised a new quarantine facility at Jandicott Airport a week ago. That's what the Prime Minister promised, and yet less than a week, about a week later, that site now moves to the, uh, near the RAF air base. Now, what Minister Birmingham said in his response today, he tried to imply that the state government had some, somehow insisted about the announcement. Well, I can assure you and I can assume that, of course, Premier Mark McGowan is going to go, if you want Western Australia to sign up to some kind of pathway out of our lockdowns, then this Commonwealth government has to put take responsibility for quarantine, and it has to make public that responsibility. I'm damn sure that that's about what happened, that Mark McGowan said, yes, you've got to get out and announce this, otherwise there's no way that we're going to sign up to your um, pathway out of lockdowns. 
So what happens here is, of course, the government has to rush out and announce this because it hasn't yet done a proper assessment. It hasn't yet actually done the work. All this demonstrates it is that this government is extremely late to the party when it comes to taking responsibility for quarantine. For quarantine, and these facilities are not even going to be finished until March last year, next year. And when you look at these uh, announcements, it says, "Oh well, we're still designing them. We're still looking at how they're going to be laid out. What's going to happen?" All of that demonstrates is that this government has done two fifths of whatever to get this underway before, the, before Mark McGowan said, come on, I've been asking you about this for months and months. Last April, Mark McGowan asked about when are you going to take your quarantine facilities responsibility seriously. Last year, Mark McGowan was asking, why isn't the Commonwealth taking responsibility for quarantine? Only now, only now, when uh, the Prime Minister wants to be uh, the champion of freedom and cover up for his mistakes in New South Wales, of course, all West Australians, all Australians want to be free. They want to be out uh, from under lockdowns. But we have had a sure and true path to freedom in Western Australia, which has been to act quickly, to act quickly when we've needed to, with short, sharp lockdowns, the kinds of lockdowns that were New South Wales required and didn't deliver on, didn't deliver at all in terms of a pathway out of uh, COVID. So here we are, here we are at this point in the pandemic, 18 months after it starts, and only now does the Commonwealth government come out and say, oh yeah, we will build some quarantine facilities for you in Western Australia. It doesn't seem like the government wants to build any for Queensland. This is all about the negotiations that have happened in uh, National Cabinet, I'm quite sure, all about where Mark McGowan said, come on, you've got to live up to your quarantine responsibilities and we're not going to sign up until you, until you, until you make good on taking up your responsibilities. It's not because this government took proactive responsibility. It's not because, yes, this government said, we really understand that for Australia to open up, for Australia to open up, as the Prime Minister has said he wants it to, we have to have purpose-built quarantine facilities. We absolutely have to. And yet, it appears, we're not going to get them until March next year. Now, these are not complicated facilities. They're not all that difficult to build. The difficulty comes in in staffing them and running them and doing all of that properly. These are not all that difficult to build, and this government has barely it has finally said, yes, we'll build quarantine facilities, but they're not even going to be ready until uh, March next year, because they're still being planned, they're still being designed, and it's very, very clear that this government has done nothing Thank you, until Senator this Pratt, point in time. time. has expired, and I just remind you to refer to the Premier by his correct title. Uh, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, where do these questions come from? <laughs> The opposition are repeatedly coming in here to try and twist commentary made elsewhere to suit their political agenda or, as we've seen today, raise anxiety in parents about their children if they contract COVID-19. Taking comments out of context is misleading and raising concerns by spreading fear throughout the community is not worthy of those opposite. Madam Deputy President, it's been a very difficult week in this place. With minimal numbers in the building and here in the chamber, we've managed to ensure that the parliament of our great nation continues to function. Yet once again, those opposite choose to come in here and rehash the same questions, the same themes, attacking the vaccine rollout and trying to belittle the Prime Minister for standing up for and committing to a policy that has been agreed to by National Cabinet. The National Cabinet is not just a federal coalition policy. 
It has been agreed by every state and territory leader across the country. Mark McGowan in Western Australia, Stephen Marshall in South Australia, Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales, Anastasia Palaszczuk in Queensland, Peter Gutwin in my home state of Tasmania, Daniel Andrews in Victoria, Michael Gunner in the Northern Territory and Andrew Barr here in the ACT. They have all committed to this plan, not just once but regularly over recent weeks during their national cabinet meetings. The Australian people want their politicians to be held to account and deliver the relaxed restrictions and greater freedoms they have been promised when vaccination rates reach the agreed levels of 70 and 80 per cent. That's why so many Australians are doing the right thing and turning out in record numbers to be vaccinated. While those opposite continue to spread lies and mistruths, our government is focused on getting on with the job and keeping Australians safe. In relation to the vaccine rollout, it's exciting to see the more reluctant premiers finally engaged in the conversation, encouraging all Australians to be vaccinated. Just a few hours ago, I heard Premier Andrews urging all Victorians to go out and get vaccinated so that their latest lockdown can end, highlighting the hundreds of thousands of appointments available across Victoria. And it's good to see that their numbers are increasing, with over 52 per cent of eligible residents in Victoria having received their first dose. Similarly, in New South Wales, where their rollout continues to gain speed with record vaccinations rec being recorded daily, they now have over 61 per cent with their first dose and 33 per cent having had both doses. A massive improvement and great to see New South Wales residents coming forward to be vaccinated in their droves. Well done and thank you to each and every one who has come forward. While the opposition continues to undermine this national rollout, our government continues to deliver record numbers of vaccination daily, over 307,000 recorded in the last 24 hours. In the course of the last seven days, over 1.8 million doses have been delivered and 17.7 million doses have been delivered to date. In my home state of Tasmania, nearly 40, 420,000 doses have been administered so far with just under 57 per cent having had one dose and over 38 per cent fully vaccinated with their second dose. It's disappointing to note, however, that there are still two states where less than 50 per cent of their population aged over 16 have had, un, have had their first dose. Perhaps not surprisingly, they are Queensland, as highlighted by Senator Watt in his question to Senator Birmingham today, and Western Australia. At a federal level, we are getting on with the job. The Australian government has secured more than 280 million COVID-19 vaccines, including 125 million Pfizer BioNTech vaccines. It's time those states that are being left behind also get on with the job of delivering the vaccinations that are available to them. Furthermore, Madam Deputy President, the ramped up rollout roll is just the start. Not only will the vaccination of Australians help save lives, it will also help us to relax restrictions as we progress through the four stages of the national plan. Our government is taking a balanced approach to this plan, listening to the scientific and medical evidence and taking into consideration the economic advice and impact to set out a clear plan that will return Australia to some semblance of a normal lifestyle. By sticking to this plan, we will give hope and confidence to all Australians give businesses the confidence to turn the lights back on and reopen, perhaps borrow from their banks to do so and employ more Australians. It also gives Australians confidence in relation to their health, that the hospitals will be able to cope and doctors will be available to assist them should they contract, contract COVID-19, even if vaccinated. In relation to the plan, and as you're aware— Thank you, well, Senator Askew. Your time has expired, and I remind you to, to refer to state premiers by their correct title. Senator Polly. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, first, just to clarify, the accusations by the government senators in this debate today that it's ours on this side are out campaigning against the rollout of vaccines. There couldn't be anything further from the truth. You sit with your colleague from the back bench here in this chamber who has gone out and campaigned against the vaccine. Your own backbench in the other house have been out campaigning against the vaccine. So don't come into this chamber lecturing us 
we have been out promoting very strongly the rollout of vaccines. And in fact, it's your own Liberal uh, State Minister in Tasmania, the Minister for Health, Jeremy Rockcliffe, who has said today that the Tasmanian borders would not open until there is full vaccination. That's what he said, including children. And yet, what have we seen? What have we seen and heard in this chamber today, particularly for First Nations children in Western New South Wales? 40 per cent, 40 per cent of those children of our First Nations have not been vaccinated. We know they're the highest cohort of young people in this country that is contracting COVID-19 and Delta. Uh, variant of that. But have we had a, any minister who could actually give us any figures when we asked today? No, we haven't. Three strikes in softball and you're out. Three strikes uh, of breaking the law in some states in the US, you go to jail. But we have a minister here responsible for youth and she failed on three occasions. Strike three. She should be out. Not only should she be out of the front bench or off the front bench, but so sh too should Senator Colbeck. The Minister for Health, in any other time, the Prime Minister of the day would have sacked the Minister for Health for such a failing to be able to roll out a vaccine in a timely manner. Now, it really gets on my goat when I listen to those people on that side of the chamber. They're, they're almost bragging about the amount of vaccines that have been rolling out now. Well, I'm sorry to actually allude to this, but the fact is you're way behind the times. Then we have the Minister for Aged Care coming in here representing the Minister for Health and saying we're still learning about what the vaccine's going to do to young people. Well, I have no confidence whatsoever in that minister or in Scott Morrison because we know that internationally COVID-19 hit uh, America, the United States and Europe before it came here. Did we learn anything from that? No, we didn't. This Prime Minister was so cocky that he didn't even go out and do his first job of attack and that was to secure enough vaccine to keep safe every Australian in this country. And now they're telling us we're still waiting to learn. You need to have a plan because Australian families, I have children, I have grandchildren, and so does almost everyone else in this chamber. And I truly believe that everyone in this chamber cares about rolling out this vaccine in a timely way. But we've had a crisis that the Prime Minister has been a not able to address. He's had a job to ensure the health of all Australians. And here we are today with not one minister in this chamber can reassure us and the Australian people that they have a plan to address the crisis that is hitting young people in this country. The Delta variant is targeting our young people. And we've got a Prime Minister who is not addressing that most recent crisis. He's failed to protect the health of all Australians. He's failed to build the appropriate uh, quarantine facilities that we need in this country. And we have government senators coming in here with, a, I'd have to say, quite a lacklustre performance of trying to defend their government for the failings that they have had. Now, every death that has occurred in this country under the Prime Minister's watch, I know from what calls I'm getting and emails I'm getting into my office, as my colleagues do, is this government will be judged and they will be judged very harshly Thank along you, with Senator the Prime Polly, Minister of the day. Expired. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. You've just got a couple of minutes, um, Senator Hanson-Young.
Thank you. Well, um, I just rise to take note of uh, the answers given to me from S Senator Zizelja. Well, clearly, Senator Zizelja was not across his brief today. I asked a question about his government's energy policy. He couldn't answer it, and instead of trying his best, he turns around and decides to accuse me of being angry. Now, this sums up this government and the Morrison men in this government. Sexist, patronising and not across their brief. Look, mate, it's not my fault if you don't have the answers to the questions you're being asked. It's question time. Come here briefed. Be prepared to answer. You know, we're all sick and tired, women in this country, of the sexist, patronising dismissal of men like you in suits. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Hanson Young. So the question is: The motion is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day: uh, Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. It's one of the duties of government to protect us all from the nefarious activities those who would seek to terrorise and disrupt our society. To do so, we have established authorities and bodies to provide such protection. Bodies such as ASIO need to be properly resourced and enabled. We enable them through legislation which strictly corrals their activities in a very strict set of parameters. The legislation under which they operate dates back to 2000, the turn of the millennium. In those days, we busily used phones and faxes. Reliably informed, easier to track. I'm reliably informed that it was easier to track the source of communications in those days, domestic or overseas. Now we deal in emails, mobile phones, message apps, you name it. With these types of communications, it becomes more difficult to ascertain whether the communication is foreign or domestic. And with this comes the issue of our agencies being denied access to critical foreign intelligence, which may be vital to our national well-being. The changes proposed simply update the law and don't grant agencies new powers. Nevertheless, for those who, like me, have an instinctive wariness about Big Brother government, there are reassuring safeguards and they are robust. Allow me to deal with them. First of all, foreign communications warrants can only be issued for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence from foreign communications, example, relating to foreign terrorists or cyber threats. The warrant request must specify how the risk of the incidental interception of domestic communications will be minimised. The Attorney-General will issue a mandatory written procedure to identify domestic communications that may have been incidentally intercepted, destroy any domestic communication that is so identified unless it appears to relate to activities that present a significant risk to life. Notify the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, IGES, of any identified communication not destroyed because it appears to relate to activities that present a significant risk to life, and deal with any other matters relating to intercepted communications. A warrant cannot be issued unless the mandatory procedure is in place. Before issuing the mandatory procedure, the Attorney-General must consult the Ministers for Defence and Foreign Affairs, the IGES and the Director-General of Security, and the procedure must be reviewed at least every three years. The IGES has extensive powers akin to those of a standing Royal Commission and is an essential safeguard. The law requires that the collection of foreign intelligence under Section 11C warrants must be highly targeted, and this will not change. And so, having read all that out, uh, Madam Deputy President, one really wonders where the Australian Greens, in their contributions, can satisfy themselves that they spoke with any integrity 
in relation to these measures. We were harangued about this leading to a fascist state. Clearly not. A police state. Clearly not. The safeguards embedded in this legislation ensures that the right balance is provided in protecting the community whilst also protecting civil liberties. With these things, there is always a balanced, a moderate, sensible approach. And of course, as soon as you mention the word balance, moderate, sensible, you lose the Australian Greens in the public debate because for them, everything is perfectly black or perfectly white. There is no sense of exercising a judgment which can both protect civil liberties and our nation as much as possible from cyber attacks and from terrorism. So I would really invite the Australian Greens to reconsider their approach to matters of public security generally and especially to this bill. The comments, if I might say, of Senator Thorpe were also unfortunate and regrettable. Her contribution did defy any analysis, a lot of hyperbole, well done on that score, but when it came to fact, when it came to detail, when it came to reality, all those elements were sadly absent. So using incidentally intercepted domestic communications that relate to activities that present a significant risk for life will allow agencies to share life-saving intelligence. I would have thought that is, some, that is something anybody in a civilised society would seek for their people. That is what this government seeks for its people, for the Australian people that we seek to serve in this place, and we are seeking to get the balance right. No, it sense. is good to see that the Australian Labor Party, that is in fact potentially a party of government, unlike the Greens, understand these issues as well. To summarise, in this age of ever-increasing technologies, technological sophistication, especially in the area of communications, we need to allow our security agency to keep pace. And while some of the issues may be complex, one thing is pretty simple. An Australian who serves the interests of foreign governments is an agent of such a foreign power whether they are onshore or offshore. And Australians deserve protection from such nefarious activities, such nefarious actors. So the bill, with its safeguards, will do exactly that, which is why it enjoys my support and I trust the Chamber's support. This is a bill, Madam Deputy President, worthy of the quick resolution by the Senate, because it is important that our agency, ASIO, be clothed with the appropriate power and authority to keep us safe and to ensure that the legislation under which it uh, acts and operates is legislation that allows it and empowers it to act in this modern age of telecommunications uh, and brings it forward from the 2000 era, turn of the millennia, millennium some 20 years ago, where uh, the communications methodologies were so different than they are today. The bill is well-crafted, is well-focused, is well-moderated by the various safeguards, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The threat landscape that we as a nation are confronted with today is vastly different to that of 5, 10 or 20 years ago. It is important to note that next month marks the 20-year anniversary of the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. The events in Afghanistan this week have brought back the dark memories of that attack on the, in the US people by foreign nationals. Those attacks changed the world as, we, uh, as well as how liberal democracies 
protect their citizens. A lot has changed in those 20 years, but the need to protect Australia from the attacks and interference by foreign actors has not. Technology has changed how the world works, and the massive rise of cyber attacks have created challenges which have seen the need to significantly increase the size of our intelligence agencies. The technology and geopolitics driving these changes can have serious ramifications to the effective functioning of our democracy if not properly acknowledged and addressed. Information is now more important to world affairs than at any previous point in history. And as a result of those advances, as a result of those advances in data-driven technologies, information is now the world's most consequential and contested geopolitical resource. It is a growing source of state power where we have seen undoubtable evidence that many of our adversaries are expending more time, energy and resources to build and utilise this capability. There are a variety of reasons in which states conduct intelligence, however, the foremost of these being to increase understanding and knowledge. The timely acquisition of intelligence can improve the quality of decision-making by reducing ignorance of the situation faced and enable actions or decisions to be optimised. In order to keep Australians safe from foreign adversaries, we must be able to effectively inhibit external actors' ability to collect intelligence on Australia and our communities. This is a national security priority. As the methodologies of intelligence collection develop and change with the rapidly evolving technologies, so must our national security laws. The Richardson Review was conducted as a response to this changing threat landscape and to ensure that the legislative framework that we have in place effectively addresses the threat at hand. The Richardson Review examination of the legislative framework underpinning the national intelligence community is the first and largest since the Hope Royal Commissions considered the Australian intelligence community in the 1970s and 80s. I would like to thank Mr Richardson for the important work he did on this. His, he has been, over his career, one of Australia's best public servants. No mean feat, especially when you see the calibre of our current bureaucrats, including our Director General of Security and the Secretary of Home Affairs. The Morrison government is committed to ensuring our national security agencies have the right tools and powers to combat national security threats. The Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill of 2021 amends the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act of 1979, otherwise known as the TIA Act, and the Australian Security um, Intelligence Organisation Act, also of 1979, the ASIO Act, to address critical gaps in the foreign intelligence collection framework. Firstly, the reforms will update the foreign communications warrant provisions in the TIA Act to reflect changes in communications technologies. This means that intelligence agencies will be able to intercept a communication to determine, to determine whether a communication is a foreign communication. Foreign communication warrants have been a critical part of Australia's foreign, foreign intelligence legislative framework for more than 20 years. Currently, the TIA Act prohibits the inception of domestic communications. Now, this made sense 20 years ago when the technology available at the time was a lot simpler and was easier for our intelligence services to identify whether a type of communication was from a foreign source. However, now, due to technological advances in communication and encryption technology, the source of a communication can be impossible to find out. As a result of this, our intelligence services have been avoiding the collection of foreign communication where there may be a risk of collecting domestic communication. This means, under the current Act, we are effectively telling our intelligence services to turn a blind eye to what could be vital life or death information. The warrants enable intelligence agencies to identify threats to Australia's national security, including malicious cyber activity, targeting Australian interests and terrorist communications. Without the proposed changes, gaps in foreign intelligence collection will continue to grow and we will not have visibility of possible threats to Australia and its national security. Now, I don't know about any of you, but the thought of that vital intelligence being missed, which could lead to devastating outcomes, 
in our communities makes me extremely uncomfortable, as I'm sure it does all Australians. This is why these reforms are absolutely vital and reflects the Morrison government commitment to keep our nation safe. The reforms will allow intelligence agencies to intercept communications for the purpose of foreign intelligence where the geographic location of the sender and recipient cannot be determined prior to inception. Now, this does not mean that we are granting the intelligence agencies more power. These reforms are simply amending the current acts to properly reflect the change in how we communicate and ensure our intelligence agencies are able to effectively deal with the growing threats we face. The nature and scope of foreign communication warrants remain unchanged. ASIO will remain the responsible agency for obtaining foreign intelligence inside Australia and is the only agency that may apply for, for or obtain foreign intelligence warrants. These warrants do not allow the bulk collection of foreign communications, now or in the future. It is actually a requirement that the use of these warrants for highly, uh, for highly targeted operations only. Now, of course, of course, robust safeguards will accompany these reforms to ensure that powers are used for the right purposes. Foreign communication warrants can only be issued for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence from foreign communications such as those relating to foreign terrorists, terrorists or cyber threats. The warrant request must also specify how the risk of the incidental inception of domestic communications will be minimised. Madam Deputy President, it is important to note that ASIO's role, sole function is to protect Australia and Australians from th threats to our security. ASIO's functions include obtaining, correlating and evaluating intelligence relevant to security. This means that they are responsible for the protection of Australia from espionage, sabotage, politically motivated and communal violence, attacks on Australia's defence system and acts of foreign interference, whether directed from or committed within Australia or not, the protection of Australia's territorial and border integrity and Australia's security responsibilities to other countries. Without these amendments, ASIO would be unable to complete their duties to the best of their ability and therefore may be unable to effectively protect Australia and Australian citizens, something that I'm sure everyone here agrees we cannot let happen. The second set of reforms will close the current loophole on Australians working for a foreign power. Currently, foreign intelligence can be collected on Australian working for a foreign power offshore, but that same intelligence cannot be collected on that Australian if they are in Australia. This means that if there are people in Australia acting in a manner which could lead to the harm of other Australian citizens, however, due to a legal loophole, our intelligence agencies are unable to collect intelligence on them. So, for example, if an Australian citizen is working with a foreign power or terrorist organisation overseas and our intelligence agency are collecting intelligence on them, once they return back to Australia, our agencies must stop all activities on them. If an Australian work is working for a foreign power overseas, they are a threat to Australia and other Australians. Just because they return to our shores does not mean that this threat dissipates and our intelligence services should cease their work. It is vital that our intelligence agencies can continue to obtain information on individuals who threaten our society so that they can continue to protect and promote Australia's national security and national and economic well-being. It is also important to highlight that these amendments come with a robust set of safeguards. The law will continue to prevent the request of a foreign intelligence warrant on Australian persons who are not acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The Director-General of Security will be required to provide the Attorney-General with a detailed justification of the grounds on which the Director-General suspects the person is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The Attorney-General cannot issue a warrant unless satisfied the person is or reasonably suspected by the Director-General of acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. 
Madam Deputy President, when it comes to protecting our national security, the Morrison government is steadfast in its approach and in its commitment to ensuring that our national security framework is as robust and responsive as possible. It is of vital importance that these amendments are made without delay, and every day that we wait is a day that crucial intelligence may be missed. We have a world-class intelligence agency in Australia filled with some of our most capable men and women. It is our job to ensure that they have the right legislative framework in place so that they can continue to protect Australia and keep our communities safe from harm. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill addresses serious gaps in Australia's foreign intelligence capability. In these uncertain times, it is more important than ever that Australia's intelligence services have the capacity to detect any potential threats and are not trying to do so with one hand tied behind their back. This legislation simply brings Australian foreign intelligence interception laws in line with our five I partners as the inquiry of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security has found. It is underpinned, of course, by robust safeguards and oversight, which I'll talk to in a moment. The first of these reforms will allow intelligence agencies to intercept communications for the purpose of foreign intelligence, where the geographical location of the sender and recipient cannot be determined prior to interception. This reform itself does not grant intelligence agencies new powers. It simply updates the law to reflect the reality of modern communications and to ensure existing powers can continue to be used. That's an important point to make, and I stress it. It was easy, much easier, to determine the origin of communications 20 years ago. These days, days it's increasingly difficult to do so. But the nature and scope of foreign communications warrants remain unchanged. ASIO is responsible for obtaining foreign intelligence inside Australia and is the only agency that may apply for or obtain foreign intelligence warrants, including Section 11C warrants. Section 11C warrants do not allow bulk collection of foreign communications now or in the future. The law requires that the collection of foreign intelligence under Section 11C warrants must be highly targeted, and this will not change. The Act and the amendments do not permit indiscriminate collection. Foreign communication warrants have been a critical part of Australia's foreign intelligence legislative framework for more than 20 years. These warrants are issued by the Attorney-General at the request of the Director-General of Security and on the advice of the Minister for Defence or the Minister for Foreign Affairs. The circumstances in which the warrants may be exercised and the conditions that apply to them are approved by the Attorney-General and remain under the stringent oversight of the IGIS. These warrants authorise the interception of foreign communications for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence. The other major reform of the bill closes the loophole on those in Australia working for a foreign power. The Richardson Review recommended reforms to allow foreign intelligence to be collected on Australian citizens and permanent residents onshore who are acting for or on behalf of foreign powers. It's an illogical situation where foreign intelligence can be collected on an Australian working for a foreign power offshore, but that same intelligence cannot be collected under a warrant on that same Australian onshore. Unfortunately, there are circumstances where Australian citizens and permanent residents are of legitimate foreign intelligence interest. For example, where an Australian citizen is recruited for foreign espionage purposes. As the Richardson Review observed, an Australian serving the interests of a foreign government remains an agent of a foreign power whether they are onshore or offshore. It is important that our intelligence agencies can obtain information to protect and promote Australia's national security foreign relations. Now I would like to address some attempts made earlier in this debate to conflate the foreign intelligence reforms in this bill to the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme. There is no connection between the two. 
The Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme provides the public with visibility of the nature, level and extent of foreign influence on Australia's government and politics. The scheme is not in any way related to the legal framework governing the collection of foreign intelligence by Australia's intelligence agencies. It does not in any way suggest an individual is engaged in espionage. In contrast, this bill enables the Director-General of Security to seek a warrant to collect foreign intelligence on Australians acting for or behalf of a foreign power. There is a strenuous process and safeguards in place. The Attorney-General cannot issue a warrant unless satisfied the person is or is re reasonably suspected by the Director-General of acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The safeguards contained within the broader foreign intelligence warrant framework will continue to apply. and These include, first, the collection activities are conducted by, spe by specifically approved personnel. Second, the Attorney General may only approve a foreign intelligence warrant when satisfied on advice from either the Minister for Defence or the Minister for Foreign Affairs that the collection is in the interests of Australia's national security foreign relations or economic well-being. Third, warrants must not exceed a six-month duration. The IGES will also continue to have oversight of agencies' activities under these warrants. The IGES has extensive powers akin to those of a standing royal commission as, and is an essential safeguard. I would also point out that the term foreign intelligence defined in Section 5 of the TIA Act means intelligence about the capabilities, intentions and activities of people or organisations outside Australia. And the term foreign power is defined in Section 4 of the ASIO Act to mean a foreign government, an entity that is directed or controlled by a foreign government or governments of a foreign political organisation. It's absurd to suggest, as Senator Patrick has tried to today, that the bill would permit the Director-General of Security to seek a warrant for any Australian acting for or on behalf of a foreign power merely because they are on the Foreign Influence Transparency Register. Existing warrant thresholds must still be met in addition to the requirement to be acting for or on behalf of a foreign power before a warrant can be obtained to collect foreign intelligence. There are robust safeguards around the issuing of these warrants. To conflate this bill with the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme is irresponsible and frankly shows a lack of understanding about both the bill and our current foreign intelligence framework. In conclusion, our national security laws must continue to keep pace with the evolving operational environment and changes in technology. The comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, known as the Richardson Review, made clear that Telecommunications Interception and Access Act of 1979 has not kept up with the modern communications environment and that both targeted and substantive reforms are required. The reforms in this bill include robust oversight and safeguards, and the crucial bottom line is that this bill will help intelligence agencies protect Australians. It will make it easier to uncover terrorist plots and other serious threats that exist to Australia's national interests now and into the future. Without the proposed changes, gaps in foreign intelligence collection will continue to grow, and Australia will not have visibility of possible threats, creating serious risks. This bill is required with urgency. And I'd really caution senators who have been critical of the fact that we are working to ensure the passage of this bill this week today. Given the situation with COVID-19 and state lockdowns, we simply don't know whether, with any degree of certainty for how long the parliament will be able to sit and will be able to deliberate. The fact is that each day these reforms are not in place is a day that Australians are put at risk that our agencies miss critical foreign intelligence about threats to Australia and Australians, a day that harms our national interests. 
Our government makes no apology for putting the safety and security of every Australian first. And I do want, do want to recognise and commend the Australian Labor Party at this particular point in time for their recognition of the vital importance of this bill and the constructive work through the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security chaired ably by Senator James Patterson. The bill has had oversight by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, <laughs> and it's worth noting that the recommendations of their inquiry have been adopted in full by the government. These strengthen even further the robust safeguards and oversight that the government has provided with this bill, and it's commended Thank to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Ferravanti Wells, remotely. Oh, sorry, uh, there's been a change to the schedule. Uh, I'll let you, Senator Scar, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, it's always a delight to follow my good friend, where is he? Senator Smith, going out the door as I pay him a compliment. Um, so I'm obviously not reflecting on you leaving on the chamber. I'm reflecting on what you did in the chamber um, and uh, doing so in a complimentary fashion. Uh, I'm very pleased to rise to speak on the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill. And at the outset, I'll just pick up on one of the themes that Senator Smith brought to the debate, and that was it is pleasing. It is pleasing, Madam Acting Deputy President, that. Uh, the coalition, my party and the Labor Party are on the same page when it comes to uh, these very critical uh, policy issues with respect to national security. It is important in this country that the governing parties in our political system are on the same page when it comes to national security issues. And I think, uh, I think there's a lot of heritage and, and tradition in that regard as we look at our history. And I think it's something we should uh, always seek to uh, seek to maintain from my perspective. I'd like to make three preliminary points uh, with respect to the context in which this bill is considered. First, uh, the number one priority, the number one priority of the Commonwealth Government is to protect uh, the citizens of Australia. That has to be the number one priority of our Commonwealth Government. And that's the context in which we have this uh, discussion with respect to this bill. And that is the Commonwealth Government protecting the life and liberties of our Australian citizens and everyone who is in this country. And that is the number one priority of our government. Second, I want to pay tribute to all of those, all of those in our defence forces, our intelligence agencies, our police forces, and everyone who supports them who help achieve that objective of keeping us safe. I really want to pay tribute to them and I salute them, especially on this day when so many people are doing so much for others uh, in an international context to provide them safety. I want to really salute the people who keep us safe whilst we sleep at night. They keep us safe whilst we sleep at night and I really salute each and every one of them. And thirdly, uh, in order to keep our country safe and in order to have a, a system of governance which is appropriate to keep our citizens safe and everyone who's residing in our country, we must be adaptable. We must be adaptable and we must, ch we must be prepared to consider reasonable and proportionate legislative changes to reflect the changing environment. And the changing environment includes technology. It includes technology which, as we all know, is moving at an incredibly fast pace. And it should be recognised that the bill which is being amended in this case was first introduced in 1979. And a lot has happened. A lot has happened since 1979. I, was, I see Senator Cash um, nodding wisely, sagely, as she does. Um, Senator Cash, I was, I'm, I'm sure you weren't born at the time, but I was 10 years old um, at the time, and a lot has changed. Um, in terms of uh, telecommunications since, uh, since that point in time. And it is important. It is important that our security legislation keeps up to date with those technological changes. And that's what this bill seeks to do. That's what this bill seeks to do. Now, in relation to the, uh, the specifics of this bill, it deals with a particular gap, a particular gap in our national defences. And I must say, 
before this bill was presented. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of this gap in terms of our national defences. So this bill has been somewhat of an education with respect to my learning with respect to this area of intelligence gathering. And the gap is this, that you have situations potentially where foreign intelligence is needed to be collected with respect to particular Australians who might be thought to be acting for foreign powers but that foreign intelligence needs to be collected in a domestic context, onshore. It needs to be collected onshore. And therefore, you have a situation which evolves where there can be a mix of foreign intelligence and domestic information, telecommunications information. And one, the domestic, can taint the other, the collection of the other, the foreign. And that's an unacceptable set of circumstances. That needs to be addressed so that foreign intelligence can be gathered even with respect even well especially perhaps with respect to Australians who are uh, within our own borders acting in the interests of a foreign power and uh, whose uh, activities need to be scrutinized by our intelligence agencies and that's the gap that's the gap which this bill seeks to address and does effectively now one of the matters we need to always consider with respect to intelligence arrangements is whether or not there are effective checks and balances. And this is extraordinarily important. It goes to the heart of our Westminster system. It goes to the heart of our democratic processes. It goes to the heart of our rights and freedoms as individuals in this nation. And I'm very pleased, I'm very pleased that this bill is being proposed in the context of appropriate checks and balances to protect the rights and liberties of every Australian. Firstly, the Director General of Security is required to provide the Attorney General, the Attorney General with a detailed justification of the grounds on which the Director General suspects a person is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. Now that's an important point because the Director General before these powers can be exercised, needs to provide the Attorney General, and I'll say a bit about the context of the Attorney General, uh, with, with the case as to why the Director General suspects that these powers need to be invoked. And it's important to note, it's important to note, as Senator Cash would know very well, very well, that the Attorney General, and Senator Watt, my friend Senator Watt from Queensland, would know very well, given his background. Uh, it's important to note that the Attorney General in our system of government is not just is not just a member of the executive. The Attorney General is the first law officer of the nation, the first law officer of the nation. And with that status come special responsibilities, special responsibilities and special expectations, including an obligation to the rule of law an obligation to the rule of law, an obligation to stand up for our independent judiciary and our court system, and an obligation in terms of discharging this particular power to scrutinise, to scrutinise the request for the exercise of intelligence powers such as these. So that's the first, that's the first check and balance in terms of the Director General of Security having an obligation, a requirement to provide the Attorney General with the detailed justification of the exercise of the powers. Now, the second check and balance, when we move on to the next step in the process, is that the Attorney General has to be reasonably, reasonably satisfied that the person who is the subject of the uh, application is or is reasonably suspected by the Director General of acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. So that standard of reasonableness is extremely important. That standard of reasonableness is extremely important, and it contains an objective component. An objective component. So the obligation is there on the attorney general when the attorney is considering an application with respect to the operation of these powers to scrutinise the basis, to scrutinise the basis of the application and whether or not, in all the facts and circumstances, the application is reasonable. And the attorney general as the first law officer of the nation is responsible 
is responsible for the decision that the attorney comes to in that respect. Third, the third check and balance. So we have the first, the reference, the fact that there is a reference to the attorney general. Second, the standard which the attorney general has to satisfy, in our case herself, with respect to the power of the application. And then the third, the third element of the suite of protections, the suite of checks and balances that apply in the context of this bill, are the broader protections the broader protections which apply with respect to the exercise of powers relating to security and intelligence. And in that context, in that context, I think the first point is that these powers can only be exercised by appropriately trained personnel. They can only be exercised by appropriately trained personnel. And I want to make three points with respect to that. There are three elements of that. There are three elements to that. The first is the actual training, and that's the mechanics in terms of the process and what needs to be gone through those steps, uh, including navigating through the checks and balances before the powers can be exercised and the relevant procedures activated. That's the first element, the training. The second is the culture of the organisation in which the personnel are embedded, and that is extraordinarily important that the culture of that organisation is appropriate. They understand the serious nature of these powers and the need to protect the rights and liberties of all Australians. So you've got the training, the culture of the organisation, and third, third, the character of each individual staff member or officer who is exercising these powers. And that's the third limb. That's the third limb from my perspective. The character of the people, each and every one of them, who is exercising these powers. And I think all three, you need to get all three right, the specific training, the culture of the organisation, and thirdly, the character of the individual who is exercising those powers. And first and foremost in that regard is understanding the serious nature of the powers. We then have the situation as our second check, check and balance in terms of the overall scheme of checks and balances in the intelligence and security space in our nation. The second check and balance is that the Attorney-General only approves a foreign intelligence warrant when satisfied on advice of the Minister of Defence or the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And again, that's appropriate. That's a further check and balance within the executive, within the executive of our Westminster system of government. And third, it's satisfied that the collection is the in the interests of Australia's national security, in the interests of Australia's national security, and that is extremely important as well, that it has to be in the interests of our overall national security. And that comes back to the first point I made at the start of this contribution to this debate, that the first priority of the Commonwealth Government is to protect its citizens. We then have the next check and balance. So this is the fourth check and balance in terms of the overall security and intelligence regime, and that is the oversight from the Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security. The oversight from the Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security. And again, that is an extremely important oversight function, an extremely important oversight function. And uh, as part of that function, it should also be noted the interaction with the relevant joint parliamentary committee. And all of us in this, in this chamber uh, have the opportunity and have the duty uh, to serve on various oversight committees with respect to the exercise of powers by the executive. And in the exercise of those oversight powers, we have the benefit of independent reports from people such as the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security to provide us, inform us as to whether or not there are any issues with respect to the exercise of powers such as this. And I think that also is an important check and balance. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, I know I've taken some time in relation to talking about the checks and balances in the context of in which this bill is presented, but that should provide everyone listening to this debate comfort, comfort that there are a broad array of checks and balances. There are a lot of checks and balances in terms of the exercise of these powers. So, in summary, in summary, we have a bill which takes into account the changing circumstances from a technology point of view, 
takes into account changing circumstances from a technology point of view, from when I was a 10-year-old and working with those clunky phones um, that we all remember, or some of us remember. Um, secondly, it fills a, a definite gap in our intelligence collection regime with respect to that particular circumstance where you have uh, an Australian who's potentially acting for foreign interests within our own border. You're trying to collect foreign intelligence and potentially you can trip up, potentially you can trip up because you also uncover domestic uh, information or domestic intelligence. And it's very hard to differentiate one from the other. And thirdly, thirdly, Madam Acting Deputy President, there's a whole suite, a whole suite of appropriate checks and balances. And that provides the context in which this bill is presented. And on that basis, I'm happy, very happy to commend the bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ferravanti Wells remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. It is important that our national security laws continue to keep pace with the evolving operational environment and changes in technology. I have spoken regularly over the years about these issues and most especially regarding issues surrounding foreign interference and foreign influence in Australia. The comprehensive review of the legal framework of the national intelligence community, the Richardson Review, made clear that the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act 1979, the TIA Act, has not kept up with modern communications. Accordingly, targeted and substantive reforms are required. The bill rectifies two critical gaps in the foreign intelligence collection framework. Without the proposed changes, gaps in foreign intelligence collection will continue to grow and Australia will not have visibility of critical intelligence and possible threats, creating serious risks. Addressing urgent operational amendments ahead of more substantial reform was recommended by the review. Firstly, the reforms will update the foreign communications warrants provision in the TIA Act to reflect changes in communications technology. This bill will enable agencies to intercept a communication to determine whether communication is a foreign one. Currently, foreign intelligence can be collected uh, on an Australian working for a foreign power offshore, but that same intelligence cannot be collected under a warrant on that Australian onshore. As the review observed, an Australian serving the interests of a foreign government remains an agent of a foreign power, whether they are onshore or offshore. Hence, secondly, the bill allows the collection of foreign intelligence on Australians in Australia who are acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The bill will help intelligence agencies protect Australians. It will make it easier to uncover terrorist plots and other serious threats to Australia's national interests. Having said that, the bill does, not in does include robust oversights and safeguards. The TIA Act prohibits the interception of domestic communications, communications that both start and end within Australia, under a Section 11 warrant, even where that interception is incidental or unavoidable. When Section 11C was introduced, this makes, made sense in 2000. Um, at this time, the primary communications technology at this time, the primary communications technologies were telephone and fax, and it was simpler for agencies to determine whether a communication was foreign prior to interception based on country and area codes. With the advent of advances in technology such as mobile phones, messaging apps and the internet, it may be impossible to know at the point of interception to ascertain if communications are foreign or domestic. Currently, to avoid breaching 11C, agencies do not intercept foreign communications where there is a risk of incident incidentally intercepting domestic communications, so there's a real risk that agencies are missing critical foreign intelligence. The bill will allow intelligence agencies to intercept communications for the purposes of foreign intelligence, where the geographic location of the sender and recipient cannot be determined prior to interception. I note the bill will not grant intelligence agencies new powers. It will simply update the law to reflect the reality of modern communications and ensure existing powers can continue to be used. As I indicated earlier, robust safeguards will accompany these changes. Foreign communications warrants can only be used for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence from foreign communications, for example, relating to foreign terrorists or cyber threats. 
The warrant request must specify how the risk of the incidental interception of domestic communications will be minimised. The Attorney General will issue a mandatory written procedure pertaining to the warrant to identify domestic communications that may have incidentally intercepted to destroy any domestic communications that is so advised unless it appears to relate to activities that present a significant risk to life, to notify the IGIS, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, of any identified communications not destroyed, to deal with any other matter relating to intercepted communications. I stress a warrant cannot be issued unless the mandatory procedure is in place. Before issuing this procedure, the Attorney General must consult with Ministers for Defence and Foreign Affairs, the IGIS, the Director General of Security, and the procedure must be reviewed at least every three years. There is no doubt that using incidentally intercepted domestic communications that relate to activities that present a significant risk to life will allow agencies to share life-saving intelligence. Now, ASIO is responsible for obtaining foreign intelligence inside Australia and is the only agency that may apply for or obtain foreign intelligence warrants, including Section 11C warrants. Section 11C warrants do not allow bulk collection of foreign communications. They must be highly targeted and this will not change. The Act and these amendments do not permit indiscriminate collection. Foreign communications warrants have been a critical part of Australia's foreign intelligence legislative framework for more than 20 years. These warrants are issued by the Attorney General at the, at the request of the DG of Security and on the advice of Ministers of Defence and Foreign Affairs. The circumstances in which the warrants may be exercised and the conditions that apply to them are approved by the AG and remain under the stringent oversight of the IGIS. These warrants authorise the interception of foreign communications for the purpose of obtaining foreign intelligence, enabling agencies to identify threats to our national security, including malicious cyber activity targeting Australian interests and terrorist communications. Under the TIA Act, 11C warrants are only available where service or device-based warrants under 11A or 11B would be ineffective. So this is a warrant of last resort. In all cases, the use of foreign communications warrants is proportionate and highly targeted. One of the recommendations of the review was to allow foreign intelligence to be collected on Australian citizens and permanent residents onshore who are acting for or on behalf of foreign powers. These amendments will close the current legislative gap where foreign intelligence can be collected on an Australian working for a foreign power offshore, but that same intelligence cannot be collected under a warrant on that Australian onshore. There are circumstances where Australian citizens and permanent residents are of legitimate foreign intelligence interest, for example, where an Australian citizen is recruited for foreign espionage purposes. It is important that our agencies can obtain information to protect and promote Australia's national and economic security and our foreign relations. As I have previously mentioned in this place, we live in a society characterised by extreme activism and perhaps eco-terrorism. We have seen vocal minorities disregard the rule of law in pursuit of their objectives, sometimes in conjunction with like-minded overseas players. For example, I have used the example pointing to 2015 satellite analysis of bushfires confirming that 40% of fires were deliberately lit, 47% were accidental, and only 13% were caused by lightning strikes. Are such people lone actors or part of a sinister collective conducting international eco-terrorism? Of note, recent bushfires in the Northern Hemisphere, arson was reported in Turkey, Greece, Sicily, and Algeria. The actions of such operatives cause loss of life and property and damage to economies and economic security. Now, robust safeguards will accompany reforms to allow foreign intelligence to be collected uh, on Australians acting for on behalf of a foreign power. The law will continue to prevent the request of a foreign intelligence warrant on Australian persons who are acting, uh, who are not acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The GG of security will be required to provide the Attorney General with a detailed justification of the grounds on which there is a suspicion that the person is acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. 
the Attorney General cannot issue a warrant unless satisfied the person is or is reasonably suspected by the DG of acting for or on behalf of a foreign power. The safeguards contained within the broader foreign intelligence warrant framework will continue to apply. Collection activities are conducted by specifically approved personnel. The AG may only approve a foreign intelligence warrant when satisfied on the advice from either the Minister of Defence or Foreign Affairs that the collection is in the interests of Australia's national security, foreign relations or economic well-being. Warrants must not exceed six months duration. Now, the IGES will also continue to have oversight of agencies' activities in relation to the Act and the amendments, noting that IGES has extensive powers akin to those of a Royal Commission. IGES remains an essential safeguard. So what are some practical examples of how this legislation will be vitally important? Now, in protecting Australians from terrorist threats, intelligence agencies look for foreign terrorist groups that are inciting violence against Australians. One way that intelligence agencies can do this is by looking for foreign terrorist organisations that are sharing instructional material, such as their bomb-making videos, with their members and with other potential terrorists. Agencies can develop highly targeted techniques to collect foreign communications that match the digital fingerprint of instructional material known to be produced by foreign terrorist organisations. At present, 11C warrants cannot be relied on in these circumstances because of the possibility that intelligence agencies may inadvertently collect a domestic communication, for example, two people in Australia sharing the same bomb-making video. These amendments will enable intelligence agencies to better protect Australians by identifying these types of threats from foreign terrorist organisations. To protect Australians from terrorist threats, agencies analyse communications from offshore terrorist groups to, to find previously unknown associates. The objective is to identify offshore terrorists who are targeting Australia or Australians or who are communicating with terrorists inside Australia. There have been instances where agencies have identified that a group based overseas is using a special messaging app to communicate exclusively with its members. A technique was developed to uniquely identify these communications. A Section 11C warrant could not be relied upon again because of the risk that terrorists based in Australia could be using the same app to communicate between themselves. Amending the law will enable intelligence agencies to better protect Australians by identifying threats from foreign organisations. Agencies collect intelligence on how other countries and their agents might be acting in ways that are contrary to our interests. Sometimes agents of a foreign power are Australians, but acting in ways that are contrary to our national interest. For example, there might be a foreign citizen that also has Australian residency who is assisting a foreign government to procure military or sensitive dual-use technology or materials. Indeed, I have raised concerns about this very circumstance in speeches in this place, especially in relation to the acquisition of strategic assets, and most especially by entities under the control or associated with foreign totalitarian regimes. In this role, they are effectively conducting business on behalf of a foreign power. Agencies can collect foreign intelligence on agencies, agents of foreign powers outside of Australia. However, if the agent of a foreign power is an Australian citizen or holds Australian residency, there is no legal mechanism to collect foreign intelligence in Australia where their activities may be of greatest concern to us. This leads to an intelligence gap given that an Australian serving the interests of a foreign government is the agent of a foreign power, as I said, regardless of whether they are in Australia or overseas. Now, this bill will enable agencies to collect vital foreign intelligence that is important to secure our national interest in an increasingly competitive global environment. The techniques used by foreign cyber actors often have unique features that stand out on the telecommunications network and that can be specifically targeted for detection. For example, intelligence agencies can detect foreign hackers concealing their attacks to look like normal, harmless network communications between two computers. In reality, they contain commands to launch destructive ransomware attacks. 
but in some cases hackers, including hackers based in Australia, also hide secret communications using the same techniques. For example, two hackers might use these techniques to share ransomware victim details. As the two hackers could be based in Australia, 11C warrants cannot be used in these circumstances, given the possibility that intelligence agencies may inadvertently collect secret communications between two Australian-based hackers. Amending the law will enable intelligence agencies to better protect Australians from foreign hackers. And as, as I've said, the safeguards in the bill will require the destruction of any domestic uh, communications inadvertently collected other than those which appear to reveal a significant risk to a person's life. So, if I may, in closing, this is an important bill uh, so that our national security uh, laws can continue to keep pace with the evolving operational environment and changing uh, technology, Order, and Senator I commend the bill to the Wells. Senate. I'll call the minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I rise to sum up the debate on the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021. And I would like to thank all senators for their contributions to the bill. These urgent reforms will address critical challenges facing Australia's intelligence agencies. As a result, Australia will have greater visibility of foreign threats such as malicious cyber activity, terrorist communications, and foreign interference. And I commend the bill to the Senate. With the timing of Bradman there, Senator Cash. It being 4.30, time allotted for debate on the Foreign, Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 has expired. In accordance with the resolution agreed to this morning, I will now put the questions on the remaining stages of the bill. The question now is that the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is: Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey tell of the ayes, and Senator Seawitt tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 2. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to foreign intelligence and for related purposes. I will now deal with the amendment circulated by Senator Patrick, so I ask people to remain in the chamber. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1417 circulated by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Can you please record the Greens' support for that amendment? Yes, and Senator Patrick, I'm assuming you'd like to support your own amendment, so indicated in Hansard. The question now is that the remaining stages of the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator Seawitt, you would like to record the Greens' position? Yes, please. Uh, opposing Could you... the bill? Yes, on please. Third reading? Yes. Is anyone remotely seeking the same? No. I'll call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to foreign intelligence and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to table documents. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Rustin. I table documents relating to three orders for the production of documents due today, as well as a response to a question taken on notice during question time yesterday asked by Senator McAllister relating to the impact of COVID-19 on children and pursuant to Standing Order 139.2, details of all provisions of unproclaimed legislation. And I move that the documents be listed on the notice paper for consideration. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. With that, I thank senators for their understanding and cooperation during the unique sitting arrangements we have. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 30th of August, at 10 a.m.